Assalamu alaikum and good morning. I'm Janara Nam Khan and on behalf of the Institute of Regional Studies, I would like to welcome you all to day two of our national seminar, Kaleidoscope 75 Years of Pakistan. We would like to begin with recitation from the Holy Quran. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhaakum attakathur. حتى زرتم المقابر كلا سوف تعلمون ثم كلا سوف تعلمون كلا لو تعلمون علم اليقين لترون الجحيم ثُمَّ لَتَرَوُنَّهَا عَيْنَ الْيَقِينِ ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَئِذٍ عَنِ Um, session one for day two is Foreign Policy of Pakistan, and uh, we are very pleased to have our eminent panel with us. Uh, the chair of this panel is Ambassador Jalil Abbas Jalani, who is the former uh, Foreign Secretary of Pakistan. And now I would like to request him to please make his opening remarks and take the session forward. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, President, Institute of Regional Studies, uh, Ambassador Nadeem Riaz, uh, my very distinguished colleague, uh, former Foreign Secretary, Izaz Ahmed Chaudhary Sahab. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, my colleagues from the uh, Diplomatic Corps. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be chairing this uh, very important session to discuss the foreign policy challenges being faced by Pakistan in view of the uh, evolving geostrategic uh, environment that we are facing. Uh, we have a perfect panel to discuss these important issues. Um, as we all know that Pakistan is passing through an unprecedented uh, phase, uh, there are multiple challenges that we are faced with in view of the evolving situation. Uh, we are certainly witnessing the transformation of the global order. Uh, and the contours of uh, this uh, transformation are uh, quite visible for all of us to see. We see uh, a rising uh, China and also uh, the uh, uh, rising China and also the um, evolving or developing Indo uh, China US rivalry. We also see an assertive and aggressive India um, with the kind of action that has been taken by India um, in, on 5th August 2019. Uh, the level of tension between Pakistan and India has increased manifold. And also we see uh, a growing partnership between US and India, which also pose uh, certain uh, challenges for Pakistan in many, many areas. Afghanistan continues to remain unstable. Um, there was a hope that uh, with the um, uh, takeover of uh, uh, Taliban in Afghanistan last year, there will be um, some degree of semblance will uh, will begin to develop in Afghanistan, but unfortunately, uh, the economic situation, the uh, situation of uh, the women, women of Afghanistan, the uh, unemployment, uh, the security situation continues to worsen in Afghanistan. And as a matter of fact, uh, from my point of view, 
the situation would be much more worrying for Pakistan as was the case in, in the past. Um, Middle East is also reorienting its policies. Uh, we see uh, growing uh, uh, Middle Eastern countries' relations with, uh, uh, with uh, India. We see growing relations with Israel. And also, they are also shaping their policies in view of the uh, changing geostrategic, geo-regional environment. And um, certainly with this kind of a situation, Pakistan will have to uh, certainly uh, uh, will have to, uh, you know, we can't remain immune from these developments and we'll have to assess the implications of these developments which are taking place in our region as well as uh, beyond. Um, there are, in my view, there are six key areas which will be the main focus of Pakistan's uh, 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 policy in the uh, times to come in the next uh, uh, couple of years. One is uh, developing a strong relations with uh, the United States of America um, and China while na navigating uh, US-China rivalry. This is certainly the most important question that uh, is in the minds of our uh, stakeholders. Secondly is uh, managing tension with India while um, um, ensuring that Pakistan's vital national interests are not only preserved, but also promoted, uh, particularly in respect of uh, Kashmir and other issues which, are, uh, which have created this tension between our uh, two countries. Uh, dealing with Afghanistan's instability um, and also terrorism emanating from Afghanistan is another area that will be that will remain the main focus of our policymakers. Relations with Russia. Uh, Russia is an important country in our region. Uh, our relations uh, in the last uh, um, uh, few years have improved. Uh, we'll have to. Uh, uh, formulate our policies in order to sustain this relationship, um, this uh, tension that has developed over the Ukrainian issue has certainly uh, created enormous uh, challenges, economic challenges, security challenges for, I think, for the, uh, for the, for the whole world. And then um, relation with the transformed Middle East and terrorism, both internal and external these are the six areas in which we will be the main, we will be focused. In <clears throat> meeting these challenges, uh, we'll have to ensure that we match our objective with our diplomatic resources and capital. And also realism, you know, that is something which is of paramount importance. Secondly, um, in my view, no foreign policy will be uh, successful unless um, uh, our ends and means are aligned. It is extremely important that we align our ends and means uh, in order to uh, ensure the success of our foreign policy. This would also involve a strong economic base, political, uh, political stability, and also good governance because these are the prerequisite of a, uh, of a confident, strong country to uh, uh, to formulate uh, a, a policy which is uh, uh, of uh, uh, long-term, uh, you know, sus sustainable policy that we have. Um, I'm sure that the panel that we have uh, uh, will reflect on these issues. We need to ponder over some of the following questions. Number one, how to navigate U.S.-China rivalry, because this is an issue which is of uh, tremendous importance. And this is an issue which also impacts almost every other issue that Pakistan faces in our, in the foreign policy or the security policy realm. Uh, <clears throat> second is how to manage tension with India because uh, uh, India under Prime Minister Modi has followed a an extremely aggressive policy vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. Uh, we are all aware of the plight of the minorities in India and also plight of the Kashmiris who are 
uh, facing um, continued repression for the last almost three years. Uh, and there is absolutely no let up in this repression in the last several years. And this is something which is of serious uh, uh, concern to Pakistan. Uh, how do we um, reverse, uh, compel India to reverse the 5th August 2019 uh, illegal uh, action related to Kashmir, which from Pakistan's point of view is uh, a violation of the UN Security Council resolutions as well as the Shimla agreement. And then um, uh, how do we deal with the continued instability in Afghanistan, which has uh, uh, serious implications for Pakistan's economic, uh, political, and also security uh, areas. And also it impacts on uh, regional connectivity with Pakistan uh, would like to pursue. Um, Middle East is important. How do we uh, preserve our old bonds with the, uh, with the Arab countries uh, in a transformed Middle East? Middle Eastern, many of the Middle Eastern countries have established uh, uh, relations with Israel. We had for a very long time followed a certain policy vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Do we, have we reached a point where we need to have a relook at our uh, policy? Uh, concerning uh, these these developments. So as I mentioned, ladies and gentlemen, we have a uh, great panel today. Um, a panel today to discuss these important issues. We have uh, Ambassador uh, Nahmana Hashmi, who, is, who needs no uh, introduction. She is one of the uh, uh, most distinguished foreign service Officers that we have. She has uh, served in Brussels, um, very ably served in Brussels for a number of years, and then she served in, uh, in China. Similarly, we have Ambassador Najmo Saqib, who again needs no introduction. He, is, uh, uh, he has uh, uh, very strong, distinguished credentials as High Commissioner and as Ambassador to several countries. Um, I have uh, the great pleasure of uh, working very closely with uh, Ambassador Najmo Saqib, and he, he has uh, a very fertile mind. He, uh, uh, he is a writer. He's uh, a writer of many books. Uh, he has served in Canada, Azerbaijan, Kenya, Spain, Bangladesh. And as at the headquarters, he has been holding some very important uh, positions. And then our third uh, speaker is Mr. Uh, Tugarel Yamin, he is uh, again a founder member of the Association, Associate Dean of the Center for International Peace and Stability at the National Security of uh, University, National University of Science and Technology, Nast in Islamabad. He is also a member of the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan for framing the national criminal curriculum for peace and conflict studies. Uh, in 2013, he was a fellow of the International Program of the Cooperative Monitoring Center at the Sandia National Laboratories, uh, New Mexico. He is the author of two books, The Evolution of Nuclear Deterrence and Its Impact on South Asian Stability, Developing Confidence-Building Measures in Information Space Between India and Pakistan. So our first, um, I would invite our first panelist, Ambassador Dabash and Dabana to share. It's the other way. It's the other way? It's okay, the other way. all right, okay. So let me thank you for correcting me. So our first speaker is going to be uh, Mr. Tukuran Yami. Thank you. Aapki mercy, wherever. So you can go there. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my former student and later colleague, uh, she was the one who reached out to me. Ambassador Zaz Chaudhary Saab, the three ambassadors who are sitting here, the panel chair. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, the topic that has been given to me is uh, Pakistan's uh, geostrategic environment from and I have given this title from containment to connectivity. Uh, I think our uh, foreign policy, our security policy have, has for a very long time been a victim of uh, 
international block politics. And although it's very difficult for a relatively small country or uh, power potential wise, not to be part of any block, but uh, I think it's time that we move out of uh, this particular syndrome of being part of one block or this other block. And I think our uh, political leaders have realized this and they have been saying it on a number of forums that we should not be part of any future uh, international power arrangement. Ambassador Jelani said that we are moving out of a unipolar world and towards uh, a world which would be perhaps, uh, which would perhaps is seeing a greater rivalry between People's uh, Republic of China and the United States of America, but and we have our al alignments with both these countries, and I think still we need to be very careful in how our, we craft our future foreign policy. So, how does this move forward? So, this is uh, how uh, I look at the map of the world. Pakistan lies in the center. It's very interesting. Uh, it, it depends on, on you, how you look at the world map. Uh, I believe uh, in the Prince Academy, in the former Soviet Union, there was a map in which they showed, it was upside down and they showed the Soviet Union to be the center of the world. So I've shown you a map in which Pakistan is the center of the world. So if it's the center of the world, I think we can think of things that we can do to become the center of the world. So have a look at it and perhaps uh, some of the younger students would be our future leaders would uh, make the foreign policy of Pakistan from this from this uh, map of the world. Okay. Uh, this uh, particular uh, tract I've taken out of the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, website, and I would like to lead, read it to you. Uh, in the light of guiding principles laid down by the founding fathers and the constitution as also aspirations of the people of Pakistan, the objectives of the foreign policy can be summarized as under. Sorry for the interruption, but uh, my okay. Uh, the first point says promotion of Pakistan as a dynamic, progressive, moderate, and democratic Islamic country. So this is, uh, I think, a common aspiration. But this has been given the first point in the foreign policy objectives of Pakistan. Developing friendly relations with all countries of the world, especially major powers and immediate neighbors. Uh, I think that point was brought out by Ambassador Jilani also. Safeguarding national security and geostrategic interests. It says geostrategic interests, including Kashmir. So this is uh, the main punchline that I will be focusing on, geostrategic interests. Uh, consolidating our commercial and economic cooperation with international community. So foreign policy needs all these aspects. Uh, there are so many investors sitting over here. Uh, you cannot have a foreign policy without uh, furthering your economic interests uh, with the international community and other interests also, security interests also, education interests also. But these are interests that are part and parcel of your foreign policy. Uh, then is uh, Safeguarding the interest of Pakistani diaspora abroad. So we know that they give council access to many people. We have been hearing about giving council access to Dr. Dr. Afia Siddiqui and similarly other people who are in, in the in foreign jails. I was reading in the morning papers today that the uh, that the government of UK, Ms. Preeti Patel, has signed a document with Pakistan's Ministry of Interior in which they'll be sending back Pakistani criminals to Pakistan. It's not exactly a an extradition treaty, but uh, they will be sending people who are in 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 in, in the British jails. And uh, I was reading that uh, they are the seventh largest community incarcerated in British jails, seventh largest. So there were some 
fears that these people, when they come back to Pakistan, perhaps they will be doing similar kind of things which they had been accused of in, in, in Britain. But nonetheless, safeguarding the British uh, the Pakistani diaspora abroad is one of the uh, jobs of our diplomats, ensuring optimal utilization of national resources for regional and international cooperation. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, we all know that foreign policy is a sum total of inter our internal policies. Uh, they cannot be any foreign policy in isolation. So if we are strong within our country, we are we, we are strong in our foreign policy also. I have been abroad many times as a soldier and as a uh, as a professor, and uh, these gentlemen and lady have served abroad uh, most of their lives, uh, and I'm sure they are very good professionally. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, they look at you as a Pakistani. I was attending the German staff college course. I was very good. They said Pakistani officers come and they are very good, but the treatment that has, was, was meted out to me was as a Pakistani. Uh, so if you're strong in your country, that is how people look at you when you are abroad or uh, within the framework of your foreign policy. So uh, coming back to uh, geostrategy, uh, Arnold Toynbee, once upon a time, uh, he was a very fashionable reader his history of the world in several volumes. And in fact, uh, he was cultivated by the government of Pakistan also during the time of Ayub Khan. He was a frequent visitor to Pakistan. And he said, Toynbee, uh, there are the two roundabouts, ancient roundabouts of history. One is this area which we call now, the Americans have given the term, Afpak, Afghanistan, Pakistan. And the other, he said, was Syria. And I was just thinking, I, if we put this region in the center, Afghanistan, Pakistan, so the ancient crossroad, there was a Chinese empire on one side, there was Central Asian Khanids on the other side, there was a Russian empire, there was a Persian empire, and uh, there were several invaders ranging from uh, Alexander the Great, Macedonian, in 326 BC, he came to this area, went up to Jhelum, and then turned back. And the Arabs, they have also been coming in their sailing towers from the Arabian Sea, and then there have been the Europeans who have also used uh, ocean as a route to come to uh, this subcontinent. Although they did not land in uh, Sindh, they landed uh, in, on the eastern uh, eastern Ghats. But nonetheless, this this area lies in in, in the center of the world. Uh, if you could uh, tend to look at that that way. So uh, there has been a lot of talk recently in which they have said, and people have been arguing that Pakistan's uh, geostrategic impact, importance has lost its value. And I think this uh, uh, argument has emerged from the fact that perhaps we are no longer uh, sought uh, after uh, ally of the United States. Uh, I would say Pakistan has not lost its uh, geostrategic importance that nobody can take away from you. Pakistan is a bridge between South Asia, South East, West Asia, and Central Asia, as I point, pointed out in that graphical representation. Iran and the Central Asian republics are rich in energy, we know that. Uh, while India and China are thirsting for energy, they want, they want more energy. They are the two growing economies of the world. And the situation has become more precarious because of the war in, in Ukraine. So Jelani Sub said in his initial remarks that we are living in very intense times, or difficult times. Ever since I've been born, I, have, I was born in 1957. We have been looking. We have been living in very, very difficult times. I would say very interesting times. There have always been challenges, but Pakistan has never gone out of currency. People, the world wants you. The only thing is that we should have our own self-esteem. We should know that we are also geostrategically important, important in many ways. We are a bridge between. Uh, many regions uh, here. Afghanistan, Pakistan transit trade agreement, again, the relationship with Afghanistan was uh, mentioned, provides easier movement of goods from Afghanistan to India via Pakistan and vice versa. So this gives you leverage. And uh, India, Pakistan, the other eye is missing. India, Pakistan pipeline, gas pipeline, sorry, Iran, Pakistan, Iran pipeline can provide cheaper gas to India. And I will talk about, about it later also. If India takes the bait and it can actually become, uh, give, give us more leverage geostrategically.
So uh, Pakistan has long used its geostrategic uh, location to leverage its foreign policy objective. And sometimes we have under undersold ourselves and we have come to realize it uh, at a great cost that we have been underselling our, our great geostrategic location. During the Cold War, it was part of the Western Alliance system owing to our peculiar uh, location. We had a mutual defense agreement with the US in May 1954. We had the CETO 1954 to 1973, uh, although we moved out uh, after we lost to East Pakistan. Uh, we had we were members of the CENTO from 1955 to 1979. Uh, CENTO ended in 1979. Uh, and during the Afghan Jihad, we were again uh, the frontline ally of the United States of America from 1979 to 1989. I was then in the Pakistan Army. And then uh, during the war against terror from 2001 to its abrupt end last year, when the American uh, forces left Afghanistan in this city. Uh, so this was CETO. Uh, this might interest some of our younger uh, friends who are sitting over there. The members to begin with, with were Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, Turkey, and the UK. Uh, interestingly, the US was not part of CENTO. The UK was. And UK, you see, there's a big, big land gap between uh, the landmass, which uh, comprised the uh, CENTO countries here uh, in the in South Asia or, 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 or if you will, greater Middle East. So uh, Iraq was the country where the, the, this treaty was signed to begin with, and then it was known as the Baghdad Pact. Then, they, then uh, there was a coup in uh, Iraq, and uh, the Ba'athists came in, and uh, this uh, arrangement was uh, disrupted. And this was CETO. Uh, I think many of you were not born <laughs> at that time. Uh, CETO was a much bigger uh, alliance. And we were part of CETO because of East Pakistan. And you see that even uh, Australia was a member of CETO. Uh, Japan, Laos, uh, Malaysia, New Zealand, Pakistan, Philippines, South Korea, South Vietnam, Taiwan, Thailand, United Kingdom, United States. Australia, Burma, now Myanmar, Cambodia, Canada, France, and Indonesia. So we had a greater outreach towards Southeast Asia till uh, East Pakistan was part of our of our country. Uh, this was this I picked out from an old magazine in which this showed the strength of CETO, the uh, the the forces that CETO had, uh, com the uh, combined forces that CETO had. Uh, and I will, the next slide, I'll show you why these uh, alliances were made. Uh, this, these uh, alliances were made within the framework of the US containment policy. So you see, uh, this is what I was trying to bring across it. We were part of block politics. And although it served us well, because we thought that we would, we would be able to keep our arch enemy, India, uh, at an arm's distance, we would not uh, we would keep India in check. Uh, so this is how the U.S. saw, uh, we were the northern tier. Uh, uh, this is how they saw USSR and China uh, coming against uh, uh, the, the world at large. So you see NATO in, in Europe and a CENTO here in, in our area, and then CETO uh, uh, to contain the Chinese influence. So this is how we were part of the uh, bloc politics. And we thought that it was in our larger geostrategic interest to keep India in bay and be part of a much bigger uh, uh, power in the world at that time. And we had other regional alliances. We had started cultivating our relationship with the People's Republic of China since the late 1950s. We uh, uh, solved our uh, border disputes. Uh, India said that we gave Aksai Chin to them, but uh, anyhow, we opened up the world to China first by sending CIA and then by allowing uh, Henry Kissinger to go there. Then we had uh, regional blocks such as the Regional Cooperation for Development, RCD. It included Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey. And uh, once uh, this uh, relationship came to an end, we had another relationship with which, which, is, which is still existing. It's economic cooperation organization in which we have a number of uh, Central Asian countries. Uh, then we also had uh, this South Asian 
uh, association for regional cooperation uh, an association with great potential great regional potential but uh, it is uh, held hostage to india pakistan hostility india is totally sabotage it uh, there was a summit conference which was to be held here in pakistan india made sure that nobody attended it and with the reason that the, with the with the uh, result that this this uh, this organization, regional organization with great potential has been brought to a halt. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it was a great idea floated by President Ziaur Rahman of Bangladesh, but it's at a standstill. I wish we can come above our uh, regional rivalries and reinvigorate this great association. This, this uh, association can rival ASEAN and other regional associations. It can be a uh, harbinger for great financial uh, collaboration between India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, other countries. We are this uh, uh, economic cooperation within the regional countries is nearly non-existent. We have hardly any trade relationship with India. We have the uh, uh, we have downgraded our uh, uh, diplomatic status with them. And although Modi might might be an SOB or he might be perpetrating barbarities on the uh, Muslims and um, non-Muslim minorities, but we have to find a way around it and come up with a with greater regional cooperation if we want to leverage our position as a, as a geostrategically important country. And we are part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And interestingly, here Pakistan and India both are members, even Iran is a member. Uh, it is jointly led by China and Russia. And the interesting thing is that in October this year, we'll be holding joint drills in Mahesar in India, and Pakistani troops will be participating there. So despite our uh, great rivalry, 36 years I served in Pakistan army, and I was told, and I believe, and I still believe, that India is our worst enemy, and uh, we must protect ourselves from India, and uh, Kashmir is, uh, we have a genuine cause in Kashmir, but we have to come on reduce the, this uh, perpetual uh, standoff. You cannot live with that. You, uh, you cannot take away India as your neighbor. India is your neighbor, good or bad or ugly or you have to interact with them. You have to have, you have to have trade, commerce, security relationship, all those things. And as a soldier, I tell you, we, we cannot live in perpetual animosity. I don't want you or my grandchildren to be perpetually fighting my wars, uh, which uh, my mother still tells me, she came from across the border. She said, son, have you taken Kashmir? I said, mother, I'm so sorry, I, I have no more in the army. But you see, I, I don't want that legacy to continue with you or with, with my grandchildren. I want you to be, to have better relations with India. How do you do that? I do not know. We are, we are, we are old, pardon my saying so, windbags. We are, we are gone. <laughs> we are in our 60s. We'll soon die a phase out. You are the one. You are our future generation, future leadership. You have to do something. You'll be sitting here. You'll be leading our countries. You have to find some way uh, to find a better relationship with India. India. That is a major problem. India. It can be a problem or it can be your uh, challenge or it could be your advantage or whatever you say. But the challenge lies with you. Modi will never talk to you. Modi will not like to have a good relationship with you because he thinks uh, that you are a failed state. We are not a failed state by no stretch of imagination. We are a very strong state. We are a very resilient state. We have always, uh, and I've seen worse times. Uh, I've seen worse times. Uh, I don't, I, I did not live that uh, orgy of bloodshed uh, in 1947. That was the worst time. People switched sides and uh, my mother's narrates horror stories when she sat as a teenager on a box uh, in a train uh, when she was and her family was passing through the blood soaked plains of Punjab. And that was, I think, the worst thing that could happen to our country, our fledgling country. And there was a war in Kashmir. And again, I was not in the army, but I know what happened in 1971. It was a great trauma. Uh, but after that, I have seen Pakistan standing up to the various challenges that came its way. Pakistan has withstood great challenges and what is happening in our countries, I think is, 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 is very minor to the kind of uh, challenges that we have faced. And then we've had uh, Arab countries uh, with whom we have a good relationship. 
is pakistan still geostrategically important i think pakistan is excellent of geostrategy we are important because of a pivotal position next to india china afghanistan iran central asia and greater middle east uh, the area is important because of vast mineral resources such as oil and gas and a growing young population you are the youth bulge we have the biggest one of the biggest populations young population in the world the other one was in yemen but yemen i do not know how many young people have survived the civil war uh, how pakistan can leverage its uh, geostrategic significance by promoting good relations with all countries in the region when you enter the building of irs you see the uh, quotation from qaid azam he says we want friendliness with all countries of the world he did not say that we should not have good relationship with india Uh, resolve our outstanding conflict with India. Dilani sir also said at the beginning, "I do not have a magical formula. Perhaps you can find some, some, uh, some good solution to it without compromising on a uh, just uh, claim uh, on Kashmir and becoming the hub of education and industry. Education, ladies and gentlemen, education. We are. We have a very good education base. We can capitalize on it. I had just invited thirty Afghan professors." Uh, for capacity building in my university, and I was telling them again and again, look, Malvi Sahab, there are girls outside, and I made sure that the female professors uh, took classes, Pashtun female uh, professors, and they went very happy. They did not say that Tugul Sahab, I have called a female professor. No, not, nobody said that. So education, that is our strength. Industry, we can make a strength of our out of our industry. Uh, I am not. Uh, I have very great hopes from our country. Uh, so CPEC is the center of gravity of our should be, and I think it is a center of gravity of our foreign policy. Uh, it provides a framework of regional connectivity, not containment, but connectivity. That should be a rallying cry of our foreign policy. It will only, uh, not only benefit China, Pakistan, but will also have impact on Iran, Afghanistan, Central Asian republics, and if India wants it, they can also become part of it. and the uh, enhancement of geographic linkages have uh, uh, can be through uh, improved rail road rail and air transportation we do not fly directly to india uh, you have to go via dubai to reach india the only way to go directly to india is through wagga so there is no direct trade with india so if we have this uh, we can connect with india uh, economically via cpec it would be a great boon for our economy cpec is a journey towards economic regionalization and look we want to end so thank you very much i'll i'll be ending in five minutes uh it's founded on peace development and it's a win win model for all of us so we need to place greater faith in cpec uh it's not just a, a i will talk when we say that it's a game changer it can be a game changer if you want it it has great potential uh, and it can bring it can bring peace dividends to our country uh, afghanistan wants to become part of cpec uh, but other countries can also become part of it so this uh, uh, slide i wanted to tell you that uh, russia uh, is investing in pakistan uh, because it sees great value in it uh, this this is the north south gas pipeline which are ambassador uh, in uh, russia i think chapat saab he signed with the uh, russians so this goes from karachi up to kasur uh, this also goes to show our great regional importance uh, this is the turkmenistan afghanistan pakistan india uh, uh, pipeline and there is the india pakistan gas pipeline both have great uh, potential both pipelines could be pipelines of peace and uh, this is kasa uh, uh, 1000 that's central asia south asia uh, electricity transmission project from they have uh, abundant uh, central asian countries have got abundant hydro electricity which can pass through afghanistan and come to us and go on to uh, even india if we want so uh, this is uh, but the uh, basic requirement is there should be peace in afghanistan so peace in afghanistan hopefully taliban despite their skewed uh, world view i think they will be able to bring peace to their country uh, and if 
peace comes to Afghanistan, then this project will be a reality. And uh, this is again some uh, uh, I, uh, uh, graphical representation of uh, gas pipeline. It just needs to be connected. And I think our government needs to pick, pick up courage. I think uh, in, in India is doing business with Iran. Why shouldn't we be doing business with Iran? What is our problem with Iran? It's a friendly uh, Muslim country. We have, we have had a problem. We have, we have problems with all countries. We have good relations with all countries. So we should focus on the good relations. We should build up on that. And uh, my parting question is, is geostrategy strategy still re relevant for our policy policymakers? I think it is. It's up to you to think about it and write about it and do some practical work. I thank you very much, sir, for giving me some additional time. Thank you very much, Dr. Yamin, for a wonderful presentation. Um, you have covered all the relevant points in this presentation. Uh, about Pakistan's geostrategic location and the kind of uh, options that are available as part of this uh, uh, this region. Uh, one point of uh, clarification, this FPAC term that uh, you used in your first slide, that is uh, a term that was coined with a certain objective in mind at a particular time which Pakistan never endorsed or subscribed to, um, and uh, it has long uh, been abandoned and it stands uh, kind of, it's almost dead. So our ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is uh, Ambassador Najmo Saqib. Uh, as uh, I introduced him earlier, he has uh, a, a, a very distinguished uh, uh, career in the Foreign Service of Pakistan. And he will be discussing the, uh, the kind of challenges that Pakistan faces in the current geoeconomic, uh, ge geostrategic uh, environment that we get in. Thank you. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Bismillah rahman rahim Rabbi Shrahli Sadri Vayasirli Amri Vahlul Uktatam Milisani Yafkahu Kauli. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Foreign Secretary Jalil Abbas Jilani, President IRS Ambassador Nadim Riaz, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I think uh, we need to have a reality check here. Many things would be said that Pakistan is very important geostrategically. If uh, the foreign policy is the depiction of your internal political, social and economic situation, Imagine the challenges. But before I share with you uh, the challenges that the foreign policy of Pakistan is currently facing, uh, let me you know, just point out seven misperceptions and misunderstandings before we talk about the foreign policy of Pakistan or any policy of Pakistan at any given time. Number one is that due to its geostrategic disposition, Pakistan is still an important player in the region. It is a misperception. Why I'm saying that? Because if we have been the pivot, if, if we are the center of the world, why are we facing all these challenges and why the situation is that we are looking at right now? So maybe we need to actually know how to deal with this geostrategic importance. Second, Pakistan can play any role in bridging gaps between China-US relations. This is a misperception. The former prime minister and the current prime minister, we saw that they offered that we can do, you know, something about bridging the gaps. We are still not out of the Santo Cito mode. We are still there that, you know, we were the ones who 
you know, tried to bridge the gaps between China and US. It was a long time ago story, and we have to have, you know, see, uh, be cognizant of the fact whatever is happening right now. Third, we look at China, Russia, and the US from our own perspective. Their perspective about Pakistan is not being understood. This is a misunderstanding. This is a misperception. We think that we are very important and the world needs us. The reality is that we need the world. So we have to look at Pakistan from the American point of view. What do they, what do they want from us or from India? What is the Indian perspective about Pakistan? How does Russia view Pakistan? How does the world look at us? Fourth, that pro-China policy means anti-US policy. That we have to be with China so much, you know, more loyal than the king that we see that, okay, US is our enemy because China's enemy is US. Misunderstanding, misperception. Next. There is a conspiracy theory that the world is not letting you grow. You know, there are, there are countries who are after you. As far as India is concerned, we understand. But what about the, you know, more than 200 countries of the world? So there is this conspiracy theory, which has been, you know, uh, inculcated in your mind, you young people, girls and boys, that the world doesn't want Pakistan to grow. Who is restricting you to grow? You yourself are not trying to grow. Reality check. Next, the world will not let a nuclear state go into default. This is a misunderstanding. You were about to reach that point a month ago. So please, you know, let us clear our mind that your nuclear deterrence is to deter the enemy. It doesn't increase your GDP. It does not decrease your fiscal deficit. Your nuclear deterrent is for a specific purpose. Misunderstanding, misperception. The last one. We can talk about self-reliance. Despite facing the fat of an IMF hanging swords of Democles and the serious economic and security issues. We're talking about self-reliance. This is not the right time to talk about self-reliance. This is the time to crisis management. Conflict resolution comes later on. With your permission, sir, you made my life very easy because in your introductory uh, remarks, you actually covered the entire gamut of challenges and solutions and everything. He has been my boss all my life, and uh, it has been a privilege uh, learning from Ambassador Jalil Abbas Jilani. Now the challenges. A little bird told me a couple of years ago, aapne ghabrana nahi hai. But the document in front of me, I think mujhe ghabrane ki badi sakht zarurat hai. Because the challenges that I am facing right now as a diplomat, as a poet, as a citizen of Pakistan, since I have been given only 15 minutes, samandar se mile pyase ko shabnam, bakhili hai ye razza ki nahi hai. Madam Nagmana ko aada ghanta diya hai. Mujhe pandra minute diya hai, lihaza I have jotted down these points and I'm going to go through quickly so that we finish this uh, you know, panel discussion and be ready for your question and answer. The first challenge facing the foreign policy of Pakistan. Understanding the challenges is the biggest challenge right now. Understanding the challenges that we are faced with is to me, the biggest challenge. Number two, policy making process is still shrouded in mystery. Any idea about the fate of the recently issued national security policy? 
68 pages. Where is that? That 68 pages document had a separate chapter on foreign policy of Pakistan. It has suddenly disappeared. Political uncertainty is poisonous for any foreign policy. Political uncertainty. No collective political wisdom and will is available right now. No foreign policy can be coherent if you have mixed priorities. Right now we are seeing a government which has got its own political aims, its own vision of the foreign policy, its own vision of the domestic policies. So we see mixed priorities. A diplomat like Mr. Nadeem Riaz or Madam Nagmana Hashmi, they would like to receive clear-cut instructions. These are your talking points. This is your brief. This is how you have to portray. Now, we are getting mixed signals. Another challenge. <clears throat> the next challenge to me is how to get the world's attention to political, economic, and diplomatic concerns of Pakistan. How to get the world's attention? Nobody is bothered about us. So this is a big challenge to make the world realize that Pakistan does actually exist and it is geostrategically and actually very important country. Another challenge. After the withdrawal of US and NATO forces from Afghanistan, Pakistan, let us accept that. Pakistan has lost its relevance in the eyes of the United States and its allies. The recent past has seen Pakistan defying the US openly, saying no to the summit of democracies, going to Beijing, you know, Olympics the day it is being inaugurated, while the whole Europe and United States has boycotted that. Saying that the conspiracy theory has changed the regime. So we are actually openly, overtly, we have defied the US after the withdrawal. This was the second jolt to Park US relations. To mend ways with the US and normalization of relations, I fully agree with Ambassador Jalil Abbas Jilani, is the biggest challenge for Pakistan's foreign policy right now. How to go about Pakistan US relations? Again, the mixed signals are coming. No, 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 China. No, 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 no. We have to mend ways with the US. What, as a diplomat, what am I supposed to project and promote? Add into it the US desire to restrict relations only for counterterrorism, border security, and intelligence sharing, and not commencing normal economic and trade relations. And you have a huge challenge at hand. Multiply it with the menace of TTP, evasive Taliban, extremism, ISIS, still Al Qaeda, Al Zawahiri has just been eliminated. And the West's apprehensions and things seem getting absolutely out of hand. Mind you, I told you this is a reality check. I am ready to face all these challenges as a diplomat, as a team. But we have to actually see the situation. We don't have to, you know, uh, use those flurry words that everything is hunky-dory. We will get through this. No, we will, we will have to do something to get through this. Fallout effects of Taliban's non-recognition. I don't know why we have been associated with Taliban. There was a resolution in the U.S. Senate that whosoever has aided and abetted and uh, uh, associated with the, the Taliban, we are going to take them to task. Why Pakistan is the only country in that respect? So the fallout effects of Taliban's non-recognition by the world but the presence of over 4.2 million Afghan refugees in Pakistan. This is the brunt that I have to face. In the backdrop of the West's continued punishment mode, arms twisting through IMF and FATF, see your depleting economic indicators, rising inflation, debt burden, and you are facing a daunting task. We go a little further. 
in explaining the challenges. How to deflect and deal with India's emerging relevance in the China containment policy? Deflect. India is an enemy, accepted. 1948, 1965, 1971, East Pakistan becoming Bangladesh, 2002 standoff, Kargil, etc. India is an enemy. But why do we complain about this? If we know, if we, you know, if we, uh, we have been told that India is enemy, let's do something about it. But we, we complain about it. India has done this. India has done this. Why won't India do something, you know, uh, like this to uh, an enemy, for instance? That's why I said you have to look at yourself from others' point of view also to know the reality, to see what is happening and what needs to be done. How to respond to India's recent provocative actions, beginning with Articles 35A and 370 to Abhinandan's adventure, to violation of Pakistan's territorial waters, to Brahmo's accidental firing of that mis missile. These are all recent challenges. As Ambassador Jalil Abbas uh, you know, said uh, earlier, these are all provocative and intimidating actions uh, started by India recently. Abhinandan, this Brahmo's how can you, you know, actually conceive that a cruise missile can be fired accidentally? So it is obvious. But the world has bought the Indian argument. So you have to think why the world is buying Indian argument. To know your position vis-a-vis -vis the world. Now, starting trade. We should start trade with India. We should not start trade with India. Mixed signals. My question is, is it in your hand to start trade with India? I don't think so. Because India knows exactly the kind of predicament in the foreign policy realm that you are facing, that you, are, that, that you find yourself in. India knows that. India wanted to start trade, but not now. So you have to actually see whether starting trade with India is in our hand or in India's hand. Embarrassing India through EU disinfo lab or presenting doziers have not worked. Former PM wished India to provide a rollback map of the 5th August steps. No response from India. My question is, my comment is, if war is not an option, how to manage Park India relations, particularly with regard to Kashmir, is one of the most important challenges facing the current policy of, uh, foreign policy of Pakistan. Next, creating a diplomatic balance between China and the US, particularly in view of the emerging Cold War, the Ukraine war, Russia-US rivalry, another big challenge. Diplomatic balance. It's a huge challenge, ladies and gentlemen. Diplomatic balance between China and the US, particularly in view of the emerging Cold War, the Ukraine war, Russia-US rivalry. Next. We are seeing a sea change in the foreign policy of GCC countries, particularly Saudi Arabia and UAE. Also, the active presence of Russia, China, and India in the Middle East and re-entry of the United States with Joe Biden's recent visit. Security concerns. By the way, Turkey has also, you know, restored its entire diplomatic relations. I think it was yesterday that, uh, so these dynamics are changing and we have absolutely no idea. What are we going to do? How to bring back friends like Saudi Arabia, Iran, and UAE back to the fold. So the, those who were always there to help us, I will include China also in it. Wait a minute. The Middle East to me is Pakistan's next critical challenge. China has refused to be taken for granted. 
you must have heard about that event which was hosted by china on a very harmless subject of sustainable development pakistan was first invited at the margins of that uh, you know event they were to be a part of that uh, uh, meeting conference but at the last minute we were refused entry in that uh, and this was hosted by china and the next day we heard that some country has you know done something wrong insinuating that it might be india it was china and we have to see why apprehensions about cpac why china the oldest friend is looking at us right now and it is not doing what it has been doing for pakistan for so long secondly you have to see pakistan from chinese point of view also please understand that this is not a relationship or a friendship like in human beings or people it is not the sentiments and emotionalities and all that it is the national interest what is the national interest of china when it looks at pakistan reality check in a world of new quads occuses i2s u2s pakistan is facing a challenge in finding some space within the emerging strategic alliances it is another challenge facing the foreign policy of pakistan conversely traditional friends like iran saudi arabia uae have drifted away on the other hand eco oic sarc they seem to be i'm very sorry to say ineffective we have not heard about d8 what is happening in that with a negligible role in sco and no diplomatic space for pakistan available at the united nations you have insurmountable challenges at hand last but not least those who are supposed to face these challenges at the diplomatic front are being discouraged i repeat those who are supposed to face these challenges at the diplomatic front are being discouraged the role of the foreign office is reduced to issuing only press releases corrigenda and rebuttals secondly after the online bashing of ambassadors by foreign by former uh, prime minister 35% tax on allowances might be the penultimate nail i said penultimate not ultimate because there is one more step and your foreign service will be gone i wonder who will implement your foreign policy abroad or you know abroad with empty stomachs reality check to conclude sir with your permission just three or four board points to ponder for all of you young uh, youth the ladies and gentlemen i can oh, okay 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 no 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 ye pehle batati main pakistan's geopolitical geo strategic and geo economic compulsions are as clear as sunlight all of you know you don't have to be an expert to know what are the compulsions think about it an economically weak and dependent country should not think of having a balanced foreign policy let alone an independent foreign policy there has been a talk of pakistan should have an independent foreign policy and foreign policy should be run on the basis of honor and gharat i have in my 35 years of career after being you know after serving in five continents of the world i have never come across a country which has an independent foreign policy if the ukraine war starts and germany france and uk follow suit whatever america says does it mean that germany france and uk do not have a independent foreign policy we are mixing these ideas there is mark my words please there is no such thing 
as an independent foreign policy. It's the national interest. If your national interest requires, you follow suit. If it doesn't, you do not. You say no. And then when you say no, you do not say absolutely not. You have to be diplomatic. There is a way to say yes. There is a way to say no. There are distinguished diplomats here. Ask them how to say no, how to say yes. To have a strong foreign policy, you need to have one of the two characteristics. This is important. If you have one of these two characteristics, you can have a strong policy, strong foreign policy, not independent, strong foreign policy. What are those two characteristics? Either you have the ability to inflict harm, either you have the ability to inflict harm or you are in a position to render help. Do you see Pakistan having any one of the two, let's say, characteristics and think why we have a foreign policy, the foreign policy that we are having right now? Next, geoeconomics is a very good idea. We should focus on geoeconomics. So is putting your own house in order. It's a very good idea. But I wonder, can you, can a country put its own house in order without the outside help? I don't think so. If you need $3 billion from IMF just to run your kitchen for about, for a couple of months, how can we talk about geoeconomics? How can we, we have to, we have cut down our imports just to run our kitchen. So geoeconomics is a good idea. Putting your own house in order is an excellent idea. But my question is, how? Normalization of relations with the US is but essential. However, kindly be careful in mending ways with the US. Keep the history in mind. Your kitchen must start running, but the attached costs in geopolitical and geostrategic terms must be ascertained very, very carefully. The war on terror, the Russian invasion, and then, you know, they're going back to their barracks and the wrath is being faced by Pakistan because geography. I wish I could transfer the entire boundaries, people, everything in Pakistan to Latin America. Geography is the basic thing. India, eastern border, Afghanistan, western border. You are in the center of the world, but for the wrong reasons. Naturally, you can't change your geography, so we have to deal with it. Last but not least, we need to realize that your nuclear prowess is for deterring the enemy. Nuclear know-how does not reduce your fiscal deficits or increase your GDP. Last comment. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, there are many, many challenges that the foreign policy of Pakistan is facing right now. But somehow, I know we can face this. We can wriggle out of it we can face these challenges appropriately, aptly. The only thing is that we need to go back to the drawing board, go to the basics and see. And then have at least one voice how to go about these challenges, how to address these challenges, and to begin with how many challenges Pakistan's foreign policy is facing right now. Thank you so much. One thing, one thing, sir, with your permission, one thing, Pakistan is here to stay. Pakistan is here to stay. Nahi na umeed Iqbal apni kishte veera se. Zara nam ho to ye mitti badi zarkhez hai saati.
बहुत शुक्रिया थैंक यू सो मच अम्बेसडर नजम साकिब फॉर योर वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग रिमार्क्स एंड ऑब्जर्वेशन एज आई मैं अम्बेसडर नजम साकिब स्पेंट ए लॉट ऑफ टाइम विद मी we worked together for a very long time in the ministry of foreign affairs and uh, he is somebody who is known for his provocative observations and recommendations even while he was part of the foreign service uh, some of the observations and uh, recommendations that he has made require serious consideration by the policy makers but some of the observations um uh, require further discussions um with ambassador sakib um i as the chair of this session um, will probably use this prerogative to respond to some of his observations during the concluding session that uh, we will come for at a later stage uh, but then now our next speaker is uh, ambassador nagmana hashmi uh, she as i mentioned earlier she has uh, had a distinguished 38 years of uh, uh, serving in the ministry of foreign affairs she served in denmark france indonesia china and brussels um, as uh, as a and uh, she is also credited with a lot of uh, uh, good work in the ministry of foreign affairs including the promotion of art and culture and pakistan's soft image in um, uh, in uh, uh, various countries that she has been posted to she will be focused on um, uh, on a very important aspect as to what is the solution to the challenges what is the the recommended course of action that we can take in order to overcome some of the challenges that are faced by pakistan so floor is your uh, ambassador uh, thank you or proposed by the previous speakers secondly uh, you know between putting pakistan in the center of the world to relegating pakistan to the dustbin of history there has to be a, there has to be a middle path and uh, so i will really because a lot of things have already been said and uh, uh, the chair uh, today ambassador jalil abaz ilani has in his introduction um, very clearly um, pointed out uh, the future direction of uh, the foreign policy of which foreign policy of pakistan should take in the six points that he elaborated so to begin with i would say that i agree uh, with everything that uh, ambassador jalil abaz ilani said in his introductory remarks um i agree with the some of the points that uh, mr najmo sakit has also uh, made in his uh, presentation and uh, of course the entire uh, sort of framework of uh, in which we are discussing has already been done very ably by mr tohra so i will actually restrict myself to very short few points to begin with uh the world politics geopolitics geo economics geo strategic uh, situation has always been in a flux if you look at the history of the world there is not a single period where you do not see uh things changing uh, yes sometimes these changes are monumental uh, you know like the collapse of the uh, soviet uh, union or uh, the invasion of afghanistan uh, and uh, now this very uh, open confrontation between china and uh, the us but changes are happening all the time nowadays in the modern world in the 21st century with technology and uh, uh, with the uh, with the media and all we get to know about these challenges and about these um changes very quickly and the nations are required to equally quickly respond to those challenges in order to be uh, relevant and uh, and you have to modulate your uh, foreign policy all the time so uh, all the countries do that 
all the countries um, make adjustment uh, to their vision, to their strategy, to how to deal with different policies. Um, they change their tactics in some monumental, uh, when they're monumental uh, um, uh, changes, then of course you also need to relook at your long-term strategy and your long-term um, uh, objectives in your foreign uh, policy. But all the countries uh, adapt and change their foreign policy in accordance with the changes of the world. So Pakistan is actually no exception. We also have to, uh, with the passage of time, with new challenges, new opportunities, you have to adjust your foreign policy in order to be relevant. Because if you are sort of too rigid, then uh, you will become irrelevant anyway. Having said that, uh, you know, when we joined the Foreign Service of Pakistan, we were told there are four pillars of uh, Pakistan foreign policy. Relations with China, strong relations with China, good relations with the US, EU and the Muslim world. Am I right, sir? So if you look at where we are today, I feel that if those pillars are not shattering, they are certainly shaking, um, especially because of the populist um, attitude of some of our politicians. We have ensured uh, that our Arab brothers are a little upset with us. Uh, even China is upset with us for X number of reasons and uh, the EU and the, the US. Now, how do we re-strengthen those pillars if these are the pillars of our foreign policy? How do we re-strengthen them? And without re-strengthening them, uh, we cannot reposition ourselves. So it is very important that we see uh, how we have transitioned and we, where we are going. We started as, uh, you know, we've always been a uh, security-centered state. We still are a security-centered uh, state. Uh, it is very recently that we had started talking of uh, geo-shifting from geopolitics to geoeconomics, which is very fancy, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, in fact, in the national security strategy, I think it was first the prime minister, but also uh, our army chief, Mr. Bajwa, uh, made a very interesting uh, remark uh, in his speech. And he said, we should let bygones be bygones and past be past, something to that effect. And then we should uh, move uh, forward and have uh, towards geoeconomics and uh, connectivity and uh, regional, regional connectivity. Now, um, for me, that is some kind of a tacit uh, uh, indication that we need to maybe um, find a way to move away from that confrontational and Kashmir-centric approach of uh, Pakistan towards uh, maybe finding other ways of engaging with India in order to ultimately you know, resolve our fundamental issues. And in that, uh, anybody uh, uh, would say that first and foremost, our national interest and if we can preserve our national interest then we go uh, towards uh, other things now i would i tend to agree with mr najmu sakib that it is very nice to talk of um, geoeconomics but can you uh, deal in geoeconomics with your politics no it is not possible so how can you turn towards a geoeconomics firstly with the current strength that you have and the current uh, kind of relationship that you have with the uh, with the rest of the world so is it is it geoeconomic delusion that we are uh, trying to you know inculcate or we are suffering from uh, because geoeconomics uh, alone by itself means nothing uh, I would not like to go into details. Nehru Sakib has very uh, ably sort of talked about the challenges that we have in trying to, uh, you know, um, increase our uh, economic uh, and our trade potential. I mean, we can talk all day sitting here why we cannot really um, 
overnight as is it there's no aladdin ka chirag that will rub and all of a sudden will shift from geopolitics into geo economics and uh, the entire world will be open to us for trade and to uh, it doesn't happen that way so we need to seriously first and foremost look at ourselves and try to understand the challenges that we have because without understanding the challenges remaining in that mental frame of mind where we think that uh, uh, because we have nuclear weapons and because we have a strategic uh, position uh, uh, we can deal with everybody no uh, nowadays unfortunately the repetition that we have uh, um sort of earned for ourselves uh, sir is a, a state that has nuisance value you know so <laughs> we have to make ourselves relevant again and in order to make ourselves relative uh, 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 relevant again we have to first have clarity uh, in our own minds and for clarity i mean in in for certain you know uh, certain states certain regions certain relationships there has to be clarity and the first and foremost thing in my mind that comes to my mind is clarity about our relationship with the with the afghans because right now everything is sort of rotating around uh, around afghanistan and i feel that there is a serious mindset change that we need to have um, towards afghanistan are we going to continue to harbor that uh, intention of having an afghanistan uh, which is free and which is prosper prosperous and which is uh, uh, you know developed but not as an independent equal state with parity with pakistan but as a vassal state something more like a compliant state uh, if you are looking towards that then you are looking at the wrong people a history has shown that it is not going to be that way i am very glad that we have finally abandoned that very wrong theory of uh, considering afghanistan as our uh, you know uh, strategic backyard uh, or yet the concept of strategic depth but we need to change our attitude towards afghanistan unless we change that i think afghanistan will never be a peaceful prosperous developed state and our dream of our dream of geo economics is also connected with afghanistan uh, if afghanistan is not friendly and we don't have that kind of understanding of uh, parity and equality with them and that that relationship of respect and keep your durand line issue at the back burner for the moment and truly accept them as an independent sovereign state we will never be able to reach to the central stage uh, asian states which we have actually lost uh, over the last uh, 40 uh, 20 years 20 25 years now uh, because the indian ingress ingress there is quite evident uh, so and the second thing is so there's a lot of ambiguity about our uh, about our policy in afghanistan so all the stakeholders in pakistan foreign policy is never made in a vacuum by the foreign um, office people sitting in shahza that's also a misperception in no country is the foreign policy made just by the uh, by the foreign office all stakeholders have to uh, give their uh, their input and then you make a foreign policy so all the stakeholders have to agree and come on the same page and sort of clear this ambiguity in our uh, foreign policy about afghanistan secondly um, we talk a lot about india but to this day all political parties have a different recipe uh, to deal uh, uh, with india uh, similarly the other stakeholders have their own recipe to of dealing with uh, india the fact is it is a major power it is they played their card very very well they were in the opposing camp to the uh, uh, to the us and the during the cold war they were very you know ably and very comfortably settled with the the soviet union and now they are very comfortably 
comfortably settled with the with the Americans, which of course, as uh, the previous um, uh, speakers have said, uh, sort of present tremendous challenges for us. And now with the China, um, uh, the controversy and the competition, I strongly believe in the uh, in the Indian Ocean and Pacific and around our region is not about uh, India China. Uh, conflict or rivalry. It is a, a competition between China and uh, and the US because uh, I think China is very clear in its mind that India has no competition, uh, which is also true. So the real confrontation now is between uh, two major powers. With both, you have traditionally good relations. Um, now, recently, what uh, we have done to our relationship uh, uh, with the US, I actually don't agree with it. Uh, because I think we are delusional if we think that we can um, progress or we can uh, protect our national interests by creating animosity and calling them an enemy and refusing, you know, saying that we, you know, we are not your slaves, so why should we listen to you? I think that's a very, very wrong approach towards uh, uh, towards reality and towards the uh, U.S. We we have uh, we must give credit to to Pakistan for maintaining uh, quite a balanced uh, foreign policy and uh, our, the the balance in the relationship between China and uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, for almost seventy years, and I think we can still maintain that balance because at no stage uh, does China ever tell you to go and not be friendly with India or to go and uh, fight with the Americans because uh, you're strategic partners of China. They themselves want to have good relations with the, uh, with the US and uh, uh, with India. So uh, to think that we can, uh, we can have a foreign policy, a very populist foreign policy where the entire public is, you know, in the 60s, uh, we used to hear all sorts of anti-American slogans, uh, but can we afford to do that now? I really don't think so. So we need to be very mature and very sober and very calculating in how we deal uh, with the Americans, particularly when there is uh, no hard pressure from the Chinese to have any adversarial relations with the rest of the world, uh, because they themselves do not want to have adversarial relations with the rest of the world. As far as uh, China is concerned, I strongly believe that we should keep our strategic compass very uh, you know, focused towards uh, uh, the Chinese. We have invested 70 years in this relationship and it has served us well. It has served China well, it has served us well. But I also very strongly believe having you know, followed China for 20 years and having two postings there, I still feel that the crunch time is now. The next 30 years is what, is what this relationship is about. The real test of this relationship is from now to 30 years. Why do I say so? Because the Chinese have two centennial goals. One was the eradication of complete uh, uh, abject poverty. Uh, by the time the Communist Party of China becomes 100 years old, which they have achieved. The second is the rejuvenation of uh, the motherland of, of, uh, of the Chinese nation. Which means what? Which means that all the territories which are historically China, China's including Taiwan and the South Pacific Islands to return to, uh, to China so that, they, which is 2049. This is when China becomes 100 years old. And from now to, to that point, and that is why we see this heightened tension between the, between the US and the, and the Chinese. Because rise of China is no, uh, it's no brainer. You know, for 250 years, people have been talking about the rise of China. So it's not, it, it hasn't come as a surprise. But what has come as a surprise is the strength and the speed of rise of China and the way they have uh, sort of revamped their uh, defense capabilities. And I think that has come as a, as a as a real surprise and uh, 
when uh, US has woken up to the reality of China while they were you know, busy fighting all their wars in the rest of the world has shaken them. So for us, for our relationship with China, this is the most difficult period. Do we now want to give up on China uh, and waste the 70 years that we have invested in it and leave the space open to people when it really becomes the most important power of the world. We'd like to be on the right side of China. So this is the, this is the I th in my opinion, this is the biggest challenge. Where do we want to see ourselves 30 years from now? That is why, and it's lying with the foreign office, the last four years, I drafted that uh, uh, vision 2050, in which we have described in detail, what are the difficulties, what we're going to have, uh, uh, with the West and with other uh, challenges and what is the direction that we should take to ensure that beach mein, you know, this arc that we have to cross for the next 30 years and this confrontation between the two, we come out unharmed and we are on the right side of the power that will be uh, in, that will emerge in uh, 2050. So I think we have to be very careful. We have already, as I said, we, our pillars are shaking. Uh, I wouldn't, I'm not, I'm totally apolitical, so I really wouldn't want to name people, but in the last three or four years, it is a reality uh, that first we shook our, uh, the pillar, which was the relationship with the, with the Arab world, and I don't want to go into details, then we went and uh, uh, from the beginning tried to shake the pillar of friendship with, uh, with China, and all, I mean, all of you are researchers, all of you read, you know the controversies um, that are now surrounding CPAC and, uh, and uh, BRI and also that is being seen as a, in very bad light by the Chinese. Then we went and shook the pillar of our foreign policy uh, with the European Union. Um, again, how do you move forward without having uh, good relations with the, with, the, with the countries in Europe because the bulk of your trade goes to Europe. So where is the geoeconomics if, we, if we, we have bad relations with the US and we have bad relations with the, uh, with the European Union? It doesn't work uh, because those are the two destinations for your trade. Uh, so how will you progress? How will your geostrategic vision work? Afghanistan is not letting the, you know, move to the Central Asian state. India is not letting you move uh, uh, eastward uh, with Chabahar and with the three uh, ports, uh, which started at the same time as Gawadar at Noman and now fully functional or operational. Uh, and with the love and hate relationship that you have with, uh, with Iran now, how do you move your trade uh, through Africa? And then again, what is the destination? Not Africa, it's Europe. So we need to take those things into consideration and go back to our traditional uh, policy of friendship and cooperation and engagement uh, with the uh, European Union. Um, lastly, I think it would be very, very important to have extreme clarity of where we want to see ourselves in the Muslim uh, world. Uh, as uh, the previous speakers have said, the Muslim world itself is divided. Uh, a lot of the major important Muslim countries are now, uh, now going and opening up to Israel. Uh, so if the majority of the Muslim countries that matter recognize Israel, what are you going to do? Are you going to then just stand with Iran against the Israelis? So you have to have clarity about that. I'm not saying you should or you should not. I'm saying we need to have a clarity at the national level on what this direction has to be. And there has to be debate and understanding and a conscious decision taken, uh, you know, taking into consideration all the pros and cons of such an action. But it, this thing is facing you in, you know, staring you in the face. So you, not, you can't really brush it uh, under the carpet. So I still feel that, uh, as Najwa Saqib also said, that you need to be strong from within. Now, if you want to have this populist and uh, you know, antagonist policy towards everybody, uh, your Arab friends, the Americans, the European Union, and even with China, then how are you going to strengthen yourself? Not in a vacuum, not in a silo, 
you need to develop with other people around you. You can't, you know, gone are the days when uh, they were self-sufficient nation, uh, nation state, even then they were not self-sufficient. They had to interact with other people. So in today's world, how will you go forward? So even strengthening yourself from within, you need friends. So I think um, sooner rather than later, we should abandon this attitude of hostility and, uh, uh, and populist uh, sloganeering, because that's not reality. That's just misleading yourself and misleading your, uh, uh, your people. Uh, so your foreign policy will only work if you have clarity on some of these major issues. Otherwise, as Najim said, that it's not uh, uh, having a nuclear bomb being at a very good strategic location. You have really not been able to uh, uh, extract any advantage uh, of either the two positions um, in the last 70 years. Uh, so I think it's time to rethink uh, psychologically and intellectually uh, and in a very realistic manner. What is our weight? We are used to punching above our weight, but do the challenges and the ch very fast changing environment, geopolitical, geoeconomic around you, is it continuously allowing you to uh, punch above your weight? No. Uh, so I think a real, uh, a little bit of perception uh, correction is, is very important and a little bit of sobriety and serious thought needs to go uh, into, into where we need to take uh, our foreign policy. So uh, with these words, I'll leave and you can then... Uh, and conclude. Thank you, um, um, Ambassador Nakmana Hashmi, for presenting a set of solutions to the challenges that we face um, in the foreign policy domain in view of the geostrategic uh, challenges faced by Pakistan. Um, we now uh, open the floor for questions and answers. Uh, my request would be that uh, while asking the uh, question from the panelists, if you could also introduce yourselves. Uh, what we'll do is that we'll have uh, this question answer session for about 20 minutes, and then we we'll leave uh, the last five minutes for uh, some of the uh, concluding remarks uh, for this session. Thank you. No, 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 please, please, please. I'm so comprehensive. All the panelists, there is no question. Brilliant. Yes, please. Oh, yes, we have. Thank you very much. It really was very comprehensive. And uh, thank you very much for uh, letting me have this session. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, Ma'am, my question to you is that uh, what policies looking to relationship with European Union trade, although we have so many issues with them. So what do you suggest? What should be the policies? What should be the guidelines? Uh, look, the European Union, uh, you are already a plus partner. And so they're giving excess to over 70% of your products. After Brexit, the same facility has been provided by the uh, by UK also to you. So uh, at least uh, fully utilize the advantage that you have. The, the fear is not how to further open the markets. The problem is, please don't do things that they stop your GSP plus, which is now finishing in uh, the, you know, this uh, GSP plus will finish in 2023 next year. 
So you have to ensure that the facility continues for the next 10 years or whatever, uh, because if that is gone, it's 12 billion will be deducted right away, because then you're, uh, uh, you know, the, whatever little you are exporting will be taxed and will you'll have to pay duties on that. So the challenge is not how to further, uh, uh, you know, for Europe to give you more uh, facilities, because the only other category is the least developed countries, which, you know, when they have this system of everything but arms, you can send the uh, tax free, which is for countries like Bangladesh and all. Um, although Bangladesh is now much uh, far richer than us. So I think the problem lies at home. Okay, uh, the last question is, sir, uh, from all of uh, the worthy uh, speakers, sir. My question is that, uh, you know, we are living in, in the world of complex interdependence. So do you think, don't you think that we are too late for the, for the alliances and for the, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, being the part of BRICS or another, any other, uh, you know, the complex interdependence, key. there are a lot of organization and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, work going on and we are too late for that, I mean, the alliances are done and you know the states they are working on it now to be part of the alliances but we need to because you know the, the BRICS is there and then don't, don't you think they are part smart mm -hmm. size pakistan's kind of uh, um, Yes, you, we, you need to sort of uh, maintain a degree of uh, balance in your relationship with various power centers. So I think that's the, uh, we do, obviously, uh, we don't have the kind of convergences that we used to have during the Cold War with, uh, the, with the United States of America. But at the same time, the challenge for Pakistan is to maintain, to retain the goodwill of the United States of America, as well as the other power centers for the promotion and preservation of our respective interests. Um, so yeah, there was, and, you know, that is why the Chinese never use the word alliance. Uh, they say partnerships, and this is what we also believe in. We need to have partnerships, not alliances. You wanted to ask? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Product of Pakistan. The people, you are the best product of Pakistan. No, no, he's right. You see, uh, what we fail to understand, uh, Madam Ambassador was saying that we don't have markets in Europe. We have markets. I tell you, uh, the Germans are employing Pakistanis straight away from NAS. I know that. I know uh, my friend's children have gone to Estonia, Latvia, UK as IT specialists. So I think we need to have a very aggressive education policy because you, you are the best product of Pakistan. You speak English, you are good with computers, and you have acceptability in Europe. That is where we can make inroads, not just uh, cotton or uh, rice or mangoes. It's you, madam. Thank you very much. Uh, um, as my name is Aisha Zafar. I am intern at the IRS Institute. So uh, thank you very much for the very clear and uh, clear session. But I want you uh, to be particular about the Kashmir issue. We repetitively talk about uh, the revocation of uh, 370 and 35A and the demographic changes associated with these. So now we know that uh, the, the issue of the permanent residence in the Kashmir is under the direct control of central government of India. So in the future, we expect that uh, there'll be, the Kashmiris will be in minority and there'll be the replacement of Hindu, uh, non-Kashmiri Hindus in Kashmir. So Kashmir is an, a very important foreign policy issue for Pakistan. We haven't been able to solve this issue for like past 70 to 75 years. And we expect that with these demographic changes and uh, they'll be very prominent in the next 30 to 35 years. So 
how will this issue be relevant if in next 30 to 35 years the kashmiris will be in minorities and there will be no one to uh, raise their voice in that disputed area uh, thank you very much uh, we have uh, been completely like a disical about kashmir we have never had a firm policy about kashmir what do we do want to do with kashmir do we want to fight a war? We have fought three wars, no, no, no result. Do we want to fan insurgencies? Do we want to, uh, General Musharraf came up with a formula that make the line of control uh, uh, irrelevant and there should be intra-Kashmir uh, intra trade, etc. That was one formula. What do we want? Uh, I don't know because uh, none of our governments uh, have had a clear-cut Kashmir policy. If you want to take Kashmir by force, please tell us. We will prepare the army to fight a war. If you want to do any other policy, I don't know. But this is a very relevant question. We have a genuine issue with about Kashmir, but we have no policy. We want to put it on the back burner. We want to forget it. Then let's forget about it. Let the Kashmiris die. Don't raise any voice about them. But we must have a clear-cut policy. There should be clarity for the nation, for the national inst uh, institutions. What do we want to do with uh, Kashmir? I don't know. Beta, as far as the legal and historical uh, uh, argument is concerned, Pakistan has got all the credentials to talk about Kashmir, the plebiscite, United Nations Security Council resolution, and etc. I would like you to think about the argument. Why India doesn't say that Mumbai is its integral part? Why India doesn't say that Bihar, Uttar Pradesh is India's integral part? Why it has to reiterate time and again that Kashmir is India's integral part? So think about it and you will know that there is, you know, some devil is there in the detail. Secondly, issues like Kashmir, Palestine, or Gibraltar between Spain and the UK, or Nagorno-Karabakh, such issues don't, you know, you can't open the Supreme Court at the middle of the night and decide. You need to wait. And the good thing about this is that even after, you know, what you have mentioned, 35 and 370 and all that uh, uh, nonsense, uh, the foreign office, the stakeholders in Pakistan, the relevant stakeholders, they have been able to keep this issue alive. And that is a diplomatic success for you. Number two, that this issue is still on the agenda of the United Nations Security Council. The only problem is that it is India, which is wanted and desired more than Pakistan in the eyes of the world. So we just have to wait. And we come back to this, that. Get yourself economically strong and you don't have to talk. You wouldn't have to talk about Kashmir better. So all these things, just stay put and wait, but don't wait just, you know, aimlessly. We have to do and we have been able to internationalize this issue, which is a diplomatic success for Pakistan. Would you like to quickly respond or? Okay, thank you so much. Um, I would just like to tell them. Uh, yes, you were the next. The gentleman at the back. Like on the right, and then you are next. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Murad Khan. I am from Department of BSS, Tejaz University, Islamabad. Um, as uh, Ambassador Najmus Saket and Ma'am mentioned, all the challenges we are facing and the importance of Middle East. Uh, you know, and Muslim Ummah, Muslim word for Pakistan, what should be your stance on recognition of Israel? And my question is, uh, anyone can answer it. The, um, basically his question, I, as we have been able to, our position vis-a-vis -vis Israel in view of the changing uh, Middle East position uh, on towards Israel. Yes, uh, recognition of Israel. As Madam uh, Nagmana Hashmi has said that uh, diplomats don't take sides. We are apolitical people. 
but we would like the government of at any given time to take a decision. Let's have clarity. What do you want to do with Israel? Secondly, uh, as the, you use the word Muslim Ummah, <clears throat> I remember in my CSS exam in 1985, the topic that I chose was Muslim Ummah at the crossroad. In 1930s, <clears throat> Iqbal prayed, Ek ho Muslim haram ki paas bani ke liye, Neel ke sahil se lekar tabakha ke kashkar, ye ek ho nahi hai, ki I'm the only one. Ek ho. To ye Muslim Ummah, my first sentence in that was that there is no such thing as Muslim Ummah. Every country has its own independent policy. So let's have clarity. Abhi UAE, ne, UAE has uh, recognized Israel. Ho gaya. Tomorrow it will be Saudi Arabia. What will you do? So we have to be, we have to take a political decision. What are we going to do with this, you know, uh, problem recognizing Israel? You do it, you don't. It's up to you. Just one thing. Jamal Abdul Nasir ke Japan Islamism ka daur tha na, wo ab khatam ho gaya beta. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Usman Ali and I'm from the Pakistan Institute of Conflict and Security Studies. So my question to Ma'am Nagmana Hashmi, that you have said we uh, have to change our attitude towards Afghanistan. Ma'am, I want to ask what kind of political leverage we have in the Taliban in Kabul. And secondly, uh, we have been waiting for the TAPI to be fulfilled uh, since the last 10 years maybe, or maybe more. Uh, when it will be uh, going to com complete? We are Iran Pakistan gas pipeline in the same. So, very well uh, about the importance of these projects. The very happy gas pipeline, even after. Okay, I, I got your question. Um, now you've actually asked three different questions in one question. So uh, as far as the attitude towards Afghanistan is concerned, um, this is exactly what I was trying to say in my talk, that you have to start looking at Afghanistan in a different light. Afghanistan as a single unit, independent, sovereign, equal uh, 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 no nation, and parity with Pakistan, and not as a country in which you can have groups that you support and groups you don't support, and to try and convert it into your backyard or a, or a vessel state or a compliant state. Un so what I said was that you need to have a very clear perception that Afghanistan is an important country and Afghanistan the people of Afghanistan have to decide what they want, how they want, and we should stop having, uh, uh, and which we have now, at least rhetorically, uh, interfering with Afghanistan and trying to, you know, have influence on this and influence on that, because at the end of the day, they're all Afghans. So when it comes to their national interest and pride, uh, Pakistan will not matter. It's Afghanistan that matters. So you have to start thinking of Afghanistan uh, as an independent sovereign state that takes its own decisions and with whom we must have good relations, uh, but not as a compliant state, as equals. So, and we have to find areas of convergence, which is development and opening up to the Central Asian states and giving them access to India and beyond. So those are the convergences on which we need to start thinking and, and working. As far as TAPI and uh, Iran, Pakistan, India pipeline is concerned, both have I at the end, which is India, and that's my answer. So unless you move uh, with some kind of uh, opening up with India or some arrangement, uh, this is not going to work. The gentleman. Uh, I think Shahidwan. Yes, the gentleman at the back. Assalamu alaikum. I am Usman Ijaz, student of international relations. 
my question is from sir najmul sakib uh, sir while talking about the challenges the first challenge is you mentioned is uh, understanding the challenges is the biggest challenge and that is really shocking ke abhi tak hame uh, challenge ka pata nahi aur understanding nahi hai so uh, i think that uh, understanding hai but hame realization nahi hai और सॉरी रियलाइजेशन भी है बट क्लियर डायरेक्शन नहीं है ड्यू टू जो भी चेंजिंग ग्लोबल डायनामिक्स हैं और उसके अलावा करंट डोमेस्टिक पॉलिटिकल इंस्टेबिलिटी है ये इस कदर बढ़ चुकी है कि डायरेक्शन नहीं है अंडरस्टैंडिंग हो भी तो बट इन तमाम जो तब्दीलियां और चेंजिंग्स है इन इस वजह से एक डायरेक्शन नहीं मिल पा रही तो आप इस पर क्या कमेंट करना चाहेंगे सर मेरा सवाल ये है कि देर इज अ डिफरेंस बिटवीन there is a difference between understanding and direction my question is that we have understanding and realization but there is no clear direction due to changing global dynamics and domestic political instability beta ye jo maine kaha na ki the biggest challenge is facing the foreign policy of pakistan that hame pata hi nahi hai ki challenges hain kitne so many of them so we have tried this panel has tried to collate all those challenges today and you are part of this important you know session jisme ke hum hamare chairman sahab jo hain wo likhenge ki ji ye humne jo hai decide kiya because we have been involved in engrossed in so many other things that we have forgotten uh, what actually is needed to be done so the time is to prioritize डायरेक्शन की जहां तक आपने बात की है जब पीपल यू नो वेन दे टॉक अबाउट दैट सेवेंटी फाइव ईयर्स तो आपने अभी तक कुछ किया ही नहीं है सेवेंटी फाइव ईयर्स इज टू लिटल अ टाइम इट टूक यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स ऑफ अमेरिका मोर देन थ्री हंड्रेड टू बिकम यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स ऑफ अमेरिका बट दैट डजेंट मीन दैट इन सेवेंटी फाइव ईयर यू कुड नॉट गिव अ डायरेक्शन टू योर नेशन एंड दैट विल यू नो देन वी विल हैव टू गो इन टू द रियल ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स कि क्यों ऐसा होता है अभी एक नेशनल सिक्योरिटी पॉलिसी आपने बनाई है मुझे नहीं पता वो मोहित यूसर साहब अपने साथ ले गए सो व्हाट इज व्हाट इज हैपनिंग सो योर क्वेश्चन इज वैलिड आई फुल्ली एग्री डायरेक्शन उस वक्त पेटा आती है जब आप में कोहिजन हो टेबल पे बैठ के आप फैसला करें कि लेट अस सॉर्ट दीज थिंग्स आउट मुझे ये है कि द मोमेंट दिस पोलिटिकल अनसर्टेनिटी एंड एंड आई विश इट एंड ये आप में थोड़ी सी सैनिटी आएगी और ये चीजें बड़ी जल्दी जल्दी हो जाएंगी इनशाला रहे शजर से उम्मीद है बाहर रहो जस्ट लास्ट वन सेंटेंस इसका जैसे दिस इज व्हाट वी बीन ट्राइंग टू से कि हम व्हाट वी नीड टू डू इज हैव अ कॉम्प्रीहेंसिव क्लियर आइडिया ऑफ वे वी वॉन्ट टू गो लॉन्ग टर्म पॉलिसी कंसेंस से हमारे पास होनी चाहिए और उसको हासिल करने के लिए आपके पास शॉर्ट टर्म क्लियर विजिबल डिलीवरेबल्स होने चाहिए जिससे आप वो आहिस्ता आहिस्ता उसकी तरफ जाए आगे ऑन द रिकमेंडेशन ऑफ माय कॉलीग्स आई वुड आल्सो लाइक टू गिव यू थर्टी सेकेंड्स वर्थ ऑफ क्वेश्चन एंड रिस्पॉन्स ऑफ थर्टी सेकेंड फ्रॉम दी माई क्वेश्चन मेनी कंट्रीज डू हैव ए वेरी कंफ्यूज पॉइंट इफ यू आर आर Five seconds. Five seconds. If you have People's Party in the Foreign Office, and if you have PMLN at in the Prime Minister Secretariat, now think about the mixed signals. Uh, thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's it has been a, a wonderful discussion that we had today. Uh, we had a wonderful panel, and uh, they made. Uh, excellent presentations and some very interesting thought provoking ideas they emerged from this discussion 
And I must also compliment all of you for uh, raising some very pertinent questions from all the panelists. I think that um, uh, based on the discussions that we have had, we can draw certain conclusions from this discussion. One, I think since 1947, Pakistan uh, has faced a number of challenges. Uh, but then in the foreign policy realm, we had to make some hard choices. And I think we uh, made some pertinent hard choices uh, in the last 75 years of our existence. Um, whether it related to our uh, nuclear policy, whether it related to our Kashmir policy, uh, you can't imagine the kind of pressure that was subjected, that Pakistan was subjected to in the last 75 years, and uh, to abandon it, to sort of uh, uh, sign on the dotted line, but Pakistan never compromised because Pakistan thought that this was certainly one of the major foreign policy priorities for Pakistan. On the nuclear issue, again, I think we were we had complete clarity of uh, thoughts. Again, you can't, I think maybe you have some idea because we have, we were also subjected to a lot of pressure from the international community not to pursue that path, but we thought that that was in the best national interest of Pakistan. And uh, because we were faced with a, with a very aggressive uh, neighbor and uh, following the Indian nuclear tests of 19, uh, 98, we were left with no option but to sort of uh, uh, come up with our own nuclear tests. And I can tell you that uh, uh, it is um, uh, certainly, it has uh, proved to be a factor of stability in Pakistan-India relations because, uh, and this is something which has also been acknowledged by the Indian leadership, not only through their verbal statements, but also in the written statements that they have made and same is the case with uh, Afghanistan or well, the Syria, Syrian issue or the uh, Yemeni issue. I think we followed a, a very prudent policy on these issues, despite all the pressures that we were subjected to. Secondly, I think uh, we discussed Pakistan-China relations, how to navigate that relationship. Both relationships are important. Um, Ambassador Najwa Saqib Khan, uh, uh, Najwa Saqib referred to uh, the uh, statements by the former prime minister or the current prime minister in um, sort of playing a role in uh, in um, uh, in bringing about in reducing the tension between the two sides, which is developing uh, at a fast pace. I think basically their uh, statements were made uh, on account of a certain confidence that Pakistan gained in the past. Uh, when Pakistan played a significant role in bringing about a rapprochement between China and the United States of America. If you read the Henry Kissinger's book, and uh, Secretary Kissinger continues to repeat uh, this uh, uh, formulation again and again, and recently in one of his interviews, when he acknowledged Pakistan's formidable role in diffusing tension between China and the United States of America, and also bringing about a Reproachma. In his book on China, he has uh, 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 devoted full one chapter to the kind of role that Pakistan played in bringing about that reproachment between the two countries. We continue to hold the same view that Pakistan can certainly play that uh, role uh, and diffusing tech tension and playing that kind of a role is uh, something which is in the best interest of uh, uh, not only Pakistan, but also the global community and for the preservation of uh, peace and stability in our uh, 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 region as well as uh, beyond. Uh, China, I think we have uh, very strong relations with China. We have time-tested relationship with China. Uh, there are always issues between friends, and I think those issues are not the ones who are in any way going to impact in any a substantive fashion on the kind of relationship that we have with China. I think uh, there is a consensus within the country that we need to not only preserve those strong relationship with China, but also at, uh, we, we need to expand on these relationship, which is of paramount importance for Pakistan. China-Pakistan economic corridor is something which is of paramount importance. It will not only, if pursued with honesty, integrity and also in according to the parameters that we had agreed upon which um, in, uh, in uh, when the agreement was signed i think probably it is something which is uh, of tremendous benefit to pakistan i 
uh, was not only involved in the negotiations of China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, but I was, I take a lot of pride that I signed China-Pakistan Economic Agreement on 22nd May 2013 in Islamabad. So, you know, that's the kind of, and, uh, and I have gone through the entire text of that agreement, and if uh, followed uh, in letter and spirit, I think we can make significant progress. And also the region can also benefit tremendously from uh, that, uh, uh, that project. Um, uh, three uh, India-Pakistan relations, I have a certain view. I think it is possible that uh, uh, Pakistan and India can resolve their disputes. Pakistan and uh, uh, India can become good neighbors um, and enter into a cooperative phase. Uh, why um, I have this confidence? I, I think there are certain provisos to this statement that I'm making. One is that uh, the leadership of India need to uh, uh, emulate the leadership uh, which was there in India when we started the peace process of 2003 and 2008. Uh, just imagine that Prime Minister Vajpayee, he goes to the Indian occupied Kashmir on 18th of April 2003. That is the time when there was a lot of tension between Pakistan and India. Uh, we had the Kargil war, we had um, uh, the uh, attack on the Indian parliament and the mobilization of Indian troops on Pakistan's border, one million Indian troops. And that is the time when, uh, and after that, I was also expelled from India uh, as the head of mission because of that tension that existed between our two countries at that time. But then Prime Minister Vajpayee went to Kashmir and he said that he would like to reduce tension with Pakistan. He offered a hand of, uh, uh, hands of friendship to, towards Pakistan. At the same time, he also made a very important statement. He said that we would like to India would like to resolve the Kashmir dispute in accordance with insaniyat, which is humanity, in accordance with jamhuriyat, which is democracy, and in accordance with Kashmiriyat, which is in accordance with the Kashmiri aspirations. So basically, that is the states, that is the kind of statesmanship that needs to be displayed at this stage. And then you know you can you all are aware, aware the kind of substantive result-oriented results we achieved during that peace process, the trade, uh, we discussed the uh, geoeconomics. I, I think geoeconomics and geopolitics are closely linked because the rapprochement, because the uh, relationship with India, they were improving. We were able to improve the volume of trade from $250 million in 2003 to almost $3 billion by 2005, 2006. And we were looking at a figure of almost $10 billion uh, in the next two, three years. But unfortunately, the process got disrupted. But I think probably in case we go back to the same uh, level where we uh, disrupted, where the process was disrupted, I think again, we can go back to, but then that would also require flexibility and statesmanship by the, and not the kind of policies which are being currently uh, 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 followed by the Modi government. I think we, um, also need to, I think the panelists have very ably covered this point that we have to reflect on our internal issues also, because unless we have um, reflection, you know, reflect on the internal issues, the fault lines, which have constrained our ability to follow a more independent uh, result oriented foreign policy, I think probably we will continue to face these problems in the days to come. But then there is always a silver lining, uh, uh, dear colleagues, Silver lining in the sense that um, despite all the problems and uh, the challenges that uh, internal challenges that were highlighted by the panelists, I think the um, today uh, we feel, I feel that there is more focus on these issues, whether it is the um, economic revival, good governance, honesty, integrity to be, and also political stability, because these are the kind of issues which have emerged as the major issues in our own uh, internal uh, political discourse, whether it's the media, whether it's the civil society, or whether the, and also at the corridor of powers, these are the kind of issues which are being discussed. And when you begin to discuss these issues, uh, I think something substantive uh, that emerges from, from the Afghanistan, I think uh, Afghanistan, in my view, 
perhaps we are facing uh, more challenges now with the uh, Taliban takeover as compared to uh, the past when there was this uh, either Karzai government or the uh, Ashraf Ghani government because uh, uh, the assumptions that we had that uh, uh, Taliban probably would be a changed entity or they will be able to uh, to provide uh, 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 education to their uh, to, to women folks they would respect human rights they would um, eliminate extremism and terrorism those expectations have not been met unfortunately the attacks which are take, taking place from afghanistan they have multiplied ever since the taliban government has taken over and i think we need to we have basically created certain um, uh, correct, you know corrections in our policy vis-a-vis -vis afghanistan and i think we need to reflect more as to how what can what can be done in order to uh, to modify the behavior of uh, the current regime in afghanistan and also to stabilize and that would also require uh, some kind of a uh, you know a regional consensus and international consensus and i be, i think we need to to ensure that Afghanistan's neutrality is maintained at all costs. And I would uh, perhaps suggest an international conference or maybe a regional conference uh, on Afghanistan to um, ensure that we uh, maintain the neutrality of uh, Afghanistan. No country should be allowed to go uh, to meddle in Afghanistan beyond a certain legitimate mandate that has been given. One last point about Pakistan-US relations. I think we have had a bad patch in the past, but then in the recent months, I would say, things have begun to change. I think the change, things have begun to change for the better. I, um, I was recent, I'm part of a Pakistan-US track too. It's a, as a matter of fact, it's a 1.5 track that we have, we have with the United States of America. We had the fourth session only last week. And I think there are some very positive developments taking place in that uh, context also. Um, the, there is a realization in the United States of America that, that, uh, that the US-Pakistan policy should not be a function of their China policy. So I think this is a very good development which has taken place. The, there is also a realization that uh, the US policy towards Pakistan should not be a function of their India policy. And I think that too is a very positive development. In the last six months, I think we have had two very important congressional delegations which visited Pakistan. One delegation chaired by the, headed by the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee and this other delegation that was the Senate Defense Delegation, which is again very important delegation. And I think we are, uh, there is uh, the extent to which this uh, stress had appeared in our relationship with the United States of America. Uh, I think it was not a, it was the kind of realization that should have been there in the United States of America that is not uh, uh, that uh, you know that has emerged in recent months, and I think probably there should be a, there is also a desire on the part of the uh, uh, of the United States of America to address those concerns which have emerged in the last six months or so in our political discourse in Pakistan. Uh, Ambassador Najma Sakib mentioned one point that there is a misperception about um, uh, uh, our relation with the US and China that if uh, uh, we, we have strong relation with uh, uh, China, then uh, we are anti-America. That's not the perception in Pakistan. That's, that is a perception, again, created by certain lobbies in the United States of America. I was posted there in Washington for almost four years and i know that there is a very strong lobbies in the united states of america one is a very strong anti-china uh, lobby which also become has become a anti-pakistan lobby uh, in uh, pro india lobby which is also um, uh, anti anti-pakistan lobby and there are so many other non-proliferation lobbies and uh, various lobbies who work against pakistan but i think uh, with the kind of uh, and i think as uh, Ambassador Nahmana Hashmi, Ambassador uh, Najma Saqib and uh, uh, Toral Sahab mentioned that I think we need to uh, have realistic expectation from any relationship, whether it's a relationship with the United States of America or for that matter, our relationship with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with China. 
I think we need to uh, follow a realistic approach. And uh, uh, at the same time, I think we need to, uh, to present ourselves as a country which is uh, forward looking, which wants to work with the international community to resolve issues which are of uh, common threat to the entire humanity. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience. And I thank um, the panelists for their excellent uh, <laughs> remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, to our esteemed chair and our panelists for joining us today and for having such a comprehensive and such an enlightening conversation. Uh, we're very grateful that you were here. We do have tokens from IRS um, um, as thanks for joining us. And uh, due to the shortage of time, and I apologize to the panelists who've been waiting, we will be moving straight into the next uh, session. Um, thank you so much. And uh, if the panel which is these Um, our next <laughs> our next session is going to be on economy of Pakistan. Um, the session chair is Dr. Mohammad Janzeb Khan, SAPM to the Prime Minister on Government Effectiveness. Unfortunately, he has been called into a meeting. We're hoping he will join us shortly. Uh, but in place of him, Ms. Nabila Jafar, research analyst at IRS, will be um, uh, conducting the session. I would request the panelists uh, to please come on stage and take their seats so that we can uh, continue with the session. I would please request everyone to take their seats and settle down. The session is just about to begin. So it is up to you. If you are comfortable, you can like uh, discuss from here. Or it will be better. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm just waiting that. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, good afternoon, uh, distinguished uh, speakers. 
um, ladies and gentlemen and worthy participant. Um, thank you for joining us for today. Um, in this, um, uh, in today's, uh, uh, in second day of uh, our in national seminar on Kaleidoscope uh, 75 years of Pakistan, um, our second session is on the economy of Pakistan. Uh, for which we have uh, invited uh, some of the distinguished uh, speakers. But before uh, introducing, uh, uh, before giving floor to uh, the speakers, uh, I would like uh, um, to um, have uh, a brief uh, on the uh, Pakistan economy. Um, over the last 75 years, Pakistan has made great strides from having no economy to the 27th largest. And it has, uh, it has been a long journey, a mix of uh, successful and chaotic uh, policies at times. And uh, we have experienced uh, capitalist system, toyed with nationalism uh, and uh, industrialization, agriculture with mixed results. And we still have low FDI, um, a small tax base and uh, reliance on foreign funding. Um, IMF, the IMF and development banks, FETF, uh, uh, these kind of like, uh, the, these, these are posing additional challenges to Pakistan. And this session will cover the economic issues and economic challenges of the country. How the country can achieve its ambition of shifting from geo strategy to geo economy. What should be the reforms, recommendations and measures that can reduce the debt accumulation gaps in policies and uh, um, to the roadmap for ensuring sustained and inclusive economic growth. Uh, and these uh, issues will be discussed in uh, today's session. And uh, in our today's session, um, we have uh, invited three uh, eminent uh, speakers. Our first speaker is uh, uh, Professor Dr. Asma Heather. Uh, and uh, our second speaker will be um, uh, Mr. Fahim Sardar, and our third speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Farooq Saleem. Um, uh, I would like to give the floor uh, to our first speaker, who is uh, Professor Dr. Asma Heather. Uh, Professor Dr. Um, Asma Heather is uh, Dean uh, uh, of uh, Economics and Social Sciences, IBA Karachi. Um, so the floor is yours, Dr. Saiba. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nabila. Um, can you hear me? Uh, yes, you are audible. Okay. Uh, so first of all, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me at this uh, very important dialogue. Um, I'm very much thankful for this. Um, so the topic that has been given uh, to me was basically about issues in economic development. Um, so uh, the the um, uh, the inclusion of the word development is very motivating for me, um, and no doubt, no doubt, development is the heart and soul of economics. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, Nabila also informed me that there is another panel on uh, with the non-security challenges, and they are going to cover many of the development issues in that session. So I will not talk about the, exactly the development issues, but, um, uh, and her advice was that I should focus more on the policy and the governance issues. So I will restrict myself on the, on, on some policy governance and planning issues that we have experienced during last uh, 75 years of the economic history in, um, in our country. So uh, there are a number of things that we can discuss, uh, and the, it's a very long story, but uh, uh, let's start from our experience of planning. Um, um, so for instance, uh, in our history, we have almost 12 five-year plans, and only one plan is a success story. And maybe we can say that maybe a couple of other uh, five-year plans were partially successful, and the rest of the plans uh, were never implemented. Uh, so this is quite alarming figure, I would say. Um, uh, there, is, there's a, there is a lot of consensus uh, that political instability is the main reason. And I agree with that. Yes, the political instability, and there is no doubt. Uh, and I think uh, we have already admitted this, but there are a number of other things. So let's talk about them. Um, so to make a plan successful, the three things are very important. As I said, I'm going to talk more about the fundamental issues and not exactly 
about one issue. So the, the, uh, for planning, the three things are quite important. Uh, one is financing. Um, second is good governance. And the third is the pol related policies and the implementation strategy. So if we start from the financing, um, considering Pakistan is a middle income or lower middle income country, uh, and we have limited resources. So let's talk about after devolution. So after devolution, every province has um, its own resources and they can spend their uh, budget uh, as they want on education, health, and all the development things. Uh, so if we look into the after devolution, uh, that what happened in terms of financing the projects and planning. So uh, so uh, I actually looked into, I was doing uh, some study and I looked into that after devolution, how much every province is spending on education and health. Uh, so it was basically, so the, the, the figure in terms of percentage is not that bad. So it's almost, it varies from one province to end it varies from 20 percent to 26 28 percent which is quite reasonable if you look into the u.s states they spend almost the same amount of their percentage on um on education and health and even we look into our neighboring countries for instance india they spend almost the same amount on their health and um economics budget the it, the amount varies from from uh from 20 percent uh 20 20 to 20 30 percent so it's 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 okay it's reasonable so that's that's another debate that we have overall the amount is low so it makes sense if we have a smaller pie definitely we have smaller size uh, slices as well uh, but the issue is that in whatever we have uh in terms of percentage the provinces allocate a reasonable amount that is 20 20 to 30 percent of their total budget of their total provincial budget for instance on health uh, on education, for instance, um, so it's almost the same for both. So, but the the concern is basically is at the next stage. So, next stage is how much is the current budget and how much is the development budget. So, if uh, so, I have some figures in front of me. So, for instance, after devolution, the first budget that came in somewhere in 2012-13, the current budget was 84 percent. Next year, it was 86%. Then next year, it was 85%. Then again, 85 And then again, 86 And same is the even in situation in Sindh is that 89% is the current budget. 88% and then 92%. So, you know, it's same. The situation is almost the same. It's between 80 to 90% of the budget is spent in the current expenditure. So, this is going to the salaries. There is no further development plans. Again, so this is one red flag that I am raising. Then the next red, red flag actually. So whatever is 10%, 12%, 15% is on the development budget, they hardly utilize those budget. So they, the, the budget is not properly utilized on the development scheme. So for instance, in Punjab, that 16% that was allocated for the development budget in 2013, only 20 27 percent was spent on that those those development schemes so that the and the same is the story so this is Punjab is actually doing the performance of the Punjab province is uh, actually the best and if we look into the rest of the provinces things are really worst so whatever so it means that it's not final we have the allocated amount whatever smaller larger but we are not even able to spend that this is a very serious concern um, and we need more and more development scheme because of the urbanization, because of the climate change, because of increasing population. Definitely we need, if we talk about the development issues we need. So the thing, so now, so this is first thing that I am raising. And then the second is the governance. So governance is such a uh, big obstacle, I would say, in our development process throughout in our history is that we are uh, somehow... Uh, we our our, our 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 bureaucracy, the red tapeism we have in our government institutions, and the system that we are following uh, are quite old fashioned. We fail to adopt the new systems, the to give contracts and otherwise. So there is the the component of efficiency is really lacking. So govern and then so it's not limited to that, but also when we perceive or you conceive certain type of projects. They are not well designed. So what we call the feasibility studies, they are not properly done based on data. Uh, uh, I would say there are hardly any studies, uh, any projects which are based on the data and the real evidence. So most of the things are conceived just on the political will or otherwise. So these are some of the, the things that we need to address uh, for effective planning. 
and finally uh, the third important thing is the is the policies and related strategies uh, so uh, uh, for instance uh, if we talk about for, let's let's say about education so in, in education in uh, only in the federal 52% of the schools are private school in punjab 40% schools are the private schools in sindh it's almost 20 23 or 24% so these are the government number and i'm sure that that they are more so the thing is what i'm trying to say that where is our policy to facilitate the so we, we first of all we must need to admit that a lot of burden and lot of responsibility is with the private sector so where is our policy to facilitate for instance two type of entrepreneur one is the civic minded those who want to invest in education and health and maybe there are certain those who want to earn profit it makes sense it's fine but where is our policy to facilitate them or to regulate them for instance in terms of teachers qualification for in, for instance in terms of uh, 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 curriculum or for instance in terms of the area where they are going to establish is it okay to have a school in one room or we need a uh, a, a, a sufficient space for for a school to be there so the thing is that we don't have the policies and for every policy we need certain instrument and then strategy to implement those policies and certain, and sadly our policies are usually very vague and the instrument which are helpful to implement those policies are usually absent so these are some of the things uh, and before i finish i would like to highlight Another very important issue that I, I would say that that is lacking overall in uh, not only the economic development, but otherwise in, in, uh, in the economic history of, uh, uh, of, uh, of our country is the lack of thinking. So thinking is a fundamental issue that is we are, I would say that most of our policies, so there are certain attempts for reform, for instance, there was First, initially, there was a privatization and some of the families, as we have heard that some of the families were more given leverage to have more investment. And we believe that there will be trickle down effect. And then there was nationalization. And again, there was an episode of privatization. So we seriously need to think about that. Where is our indigenous thinking? Are we doing all these reform because on the recommendation of Washington twins? So there are certain we have our indigenous scholars and uh, thinkers, those who are giving these recommendations based on certain evidence with based on data and everything. So unfortunately, we don't have that indigenous thinking. And I think that, uh, or if there is any, they are not utilized and not on the on the on the table of policy making. So, uh, so these are some of the fundamental things that I wanted to discuss. And maybe I will uh, back as the discussion evolves. So I stop here. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Asma, for highlighting some very pertinent uh, uh, issues and problems of our economic development. Um, without further delay, uh, I would like to uh, like uh, give the floor to our second speaker. Um, uh, our second speaker is uh, Mr. Fahim Sardar, and uh, he will be speaking on uh, Pakistan's shift uh, from geo strategy to uh, geo economy. Uh, Mr. Fahim Sardar uh, is uh, currently uh, working with the government of Pakistan uh, at uh, NSD, uh, and uh, he is a um, uh, and, and uh, he is a senior policy specialist. Um, uh, and he worked as a chief executive officer um, at uh, various uh, other organizations. Um, uh, so the floor is yours. Uh, you can continue from here if you're comfortable or you can take the... <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'll just take it from here. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon to everyone. I'll try to keep within the time slot. I'm looking at the clock over there. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. I would like to thank IRS. The president has been very kind to uh, uh, attend this discussion. And thank you all for being here. Okay, look, my background is economics and finance. So some things I'm going to say might appear a little different. Um, economics is, just to give you a, a heads up, economics is actually not what we think it is, it's a little bit, not a little bit, but much deeper than what it actually is. Why am I saying that? Because I'm a practitioner. Okay, so um, I have broken up my discussion into certain portions just to make sense of this whole thing. So I'll try to keep it uh, crisp and I'll try to keep things connected so that we can move forward. Well, there are many forms of statecraft 
And when we talk about geo strategy, so you have like you have the you have the English version, you have the German version, you have the American version. Not going to get into that. But geo strategy basically is that your strategy and your national imperatives. Uh, let's not get into the the niceties of the definitions. The geo strategy basically is your strategy is dependent upon your geography and the geographical aspects. Now, whichever way you want to take it, it's fine by me because there there can be differences of opinion everywhere. <clears throat> when you look at geoeconomics, that's like a um, it's like a newer version of geo strategy. A sub some say it's a subset, some say it's an extension. How, however, you want to define it, that's not the point here. But the critical point is that economics in geoeconomics is dependent once again on your geography and your geographical aspects. So, technically speaking, if uh, uh, let's go back, I don't know, uh, 2,000, 3,000 years, if Rome was at the center of the world, all roads led to Rome. This is a saying, I believe, which uh, sometimes is quoted that basically means to me that Rome was somewhere in the center of every of all activity and cities that rose in power, military and economic, they would be at the center of a geographical uh, cluster, so to speak. Once again, I'm not gonna get into that. It's a, it's a long discussion, so I'll stay within the time limits. Now there's a, there's a catch here. Things ended with geoeconomics, I think in my assessment, a long time ago. There's a new thing, it's called strategic economics. That's how I define it. That countries have actually developed strategic economics. What does that mean? It means basically that economics is taken to a level that it is serving your strategic, political, military, administrative, and many other purposes. And other things come with it. When we talk about um, strategic economics, you take the example of Japan, take the example of China, take the example of America. And yes, I like to quote Singapore because they deserve to be quoted. Minus Singapore, at least for a little while, these three examples, the top three uh, economies on earth are on the corners of the globe. They're not in the center. So we need to think about it. When strategic economics means you do you bring out the true economic aspect of economics? What does that mean? It's not a simple buy and sale. It has, it's supposed to have a ripple effect. It's supposed to have a strategic effect. It's supposed to have a tactical effect. It's supposed to have a, you name it, effect. Moving on, strategic economics, and I wanna be very clear about this, is always supposed to be a tool. It's not something that just happens, by the way. There are some countries on earth that are examples of strategic economics. I'm not gonna get into that right now. Economics for them is not buying and selling. That's one of the lower things. It is a tool for policy and also for many other things. So <clears throat> strategic economics is supposed to help achieve a, mul a, a multitude of objectives in different layers, perhaps different dimensions. Those countries that have done this have actually gained because it's not only it helps generate jobs, it helps create value, it helps create momentum. And by the way, you get your objective done without anything happening. Let's pause here and go to Clausewitz. Um, Clausewitz said that the ability, the ability to get somebody else's policy changed is is an art of you know that's your art of war okay so what if you can get the policy changed without war think about it for a second anyway so when we talk about uh, strategic economics and lo and behold this is not exactly something new this has been happening since time immemorial you have um you have, uh, there's also a very strange link of war with economics when we talk about strategic economics. Um, the Romans, uh, they would fight, they would trade. The English, they would fight and trade at the same time. Talk about gunboat diplomacy. 
China is is head to head with the United States, but also trading. China is head to head with uh, India, but they're trading at Doklam. They were at each other's throats, literally, and just I think a hundred kilometers away, they were trading. So the uh, oh, sorry. So uh, the concept of strategic economics is you have to raise economics to a different level. It is extremely important for us to understand because in Pakistan, I've observed that we are mutually, we think in a mutually exclusive manner. Strategic economics is, uh, is slightly more evolved in that, uh, in that aspect. When um, moving forward, <clears throat> to the relationship of economics and security, they're the same thing. They're the same, they're, they're twin brothers, they're two sides of the same coin. They're, one cannot live without the other. Um, you can take historical examples and you will see this thing happening. Trade routes used to be protected by armed ships. Still happening today. If you have good economics, you should have good, you should have a good security infrastructure. If you have a good security infrastructure, you should have good economics. Just take this uh, definition, this description, and place it on countries where it, this did not apply, where the two did not grow together. The two did not have a symbiotic relationship. So uh, it is very important for us to, for me, to speak about this, that economics and security are two sides of the same coin. Let's now come to Pakistan and I'll try to wrap up very quickly. Pakistan's journey towards uh, geoeconomics and inshallah further is uh, it's going to, we need to go back in time. Let's go to 1940 when Kaidazam Muhammad Ali Jinnah and there were so many examples I had to actually stop myself. There were so many examples in which he would consistently, persistently, categorically talk about an economically strong Pakistan. Strong economics for a strong, for a healthy Muslim minor community. He said it so many times that uh, I actually had to sort of uh, uh, choose what best I can use. In 1941, he said that nation building depended on education, economy and defense. He did not say education only. He did not say defense only. He did not say education and defense. He said these three together create a nation. In 1948, uh, as of December 1948, Pakistan was created in uh, August. As of December, uh, we didn't have any money, by the way. In, on the 14th of August, our treasuries were, I've been told, empty. On the, on the end of December 1948, we were in a trade surplus. We had exported 220 million and we had imports of 90 million. So we were in a trade surplus. So moving forward, as we see the journey, there is apparently a directive, and I have to be honest with you, I'm try still trying to trace it. Uh, I think 1956, a, a formal directive from either the president or PM, which categorically says that everything that we do, every step we take has to build the economy. Let's go even further. In the 60s, Pakistan's economic, it looks like that thing was being implemented because in the 60s, our industrial growth was at a blistering pace. Had it not been for the 1971 war and the Afghan war, which I'm about to just very briefly mention, we were on that economic strategic uh, path. So up till the 1970s, it up, to, up till 1970, it appears economics was... Uh, reasonably important. Then something happens in the 80s and 90s where we become more geostrategic. We start focusing on regional issues and we unfortunately uh, start accepting aid. Do you remember the, the terms, we want trade, not aid? They, they came at the end of the 90s because we had started to experience the problems, the economic issues. So by the, <coughs> sorry, uh, by the mid 2000s, economics had started to be discussed again. Everybody was talking about economic growth and very recently in the past, I think, uh, if I dare say, um, in the past five years, we've seen 
every branch of the government talk about economic growth. And I'll start with the military first. I won't start with the Ministry of Finance. I'll start with the military. They've been talking about hybrid warfare. They've been talking about economic growth and how it's important to have a strong... Uh, uh, moving uh, forward and coming to the tail end of my discussion. Uh, in 2020, I was involved in revisiting Pakistan's economic diplomacy, where economic diplomacy, just for, for everyone's benefit, is uh, you use economics for, for political and other purposes. And it's every country, every country that it believes in self-interest does it, so it's, it's nothing new. I believe strategic economics should be the next. The national security policy with, of, of Pakistan was started in 2014. In 2014, many aspects were taken up. And in 2022, after a two year hectic effort, this policy was created. At the center of the policy, the centers of gravity of this policy are uh, human security and economics. So I, I'm sort of thinking, uh, I think we've been talking about economics even before Pakistan was born. That's what the facts are stating to me. Yes, we sort of lost our way in between. Finally, last point. Um, when we talk about geoeconomics, that's uh, frankly speaking, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an aspect, it's a frame of mind, but the eventual aim should be strategic economics. And there are countries right now that are implementing this to the letter. And it's very important that they, uh, that they, for their own good, that they continue to do it. It's good for us as well. We need to do it. Why is it important? Economics is extremely powerful. Economics can get those results done, which through many other mechanisms, you will not be able to achieve. Secondly, if you can produce uh, for example, economic results, diplomatic results, military results, strategic results through strategic economics. And at the same time, you're creating employment, business, and other opportunities in your own country, perhaps in other countries. So it's for your benefit. If you avoid it, it's to your own detriment. This is what I'm trying to highlight. Pakistan has been thinking about this before Pakistan was born. It's nothing new. Finally, um, the true potential of Pakistan lies in weaponizing its economy, trade, and finance. And I think it's going to be a question of not much time. But just to summarize Pakistan's journey uh, towards geoeconomics, I believe uh, the journey had started before partition. I, I think that journey had started before um, even Pakistan was, you know, uh, on, a, on the international uh, Front. We lost our way somewhere in between. That's my assessment. But we're getting back on track and we want to accelerate this. I'll leave you with one thought. Pakistan's GDP right now is at a record level. I appear to be the only one who's talking about that on TV. And uh, it's something we need to celebrate. Despite the issues, despite COVID, despite many other problems, uh, our GDP is at uh, 347 billion. This is certified by the World Bank. I'm not saying this, but uh, I'm just a little sad that we, we don't even celebrate this. We never touched this number before. So with this, thank you uh, for the time and uh, I leave it to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Fahim Sardar. Um, you very rightly explained the concept of uh, uh, geoeconomics um, and uh, that geoeconomics is not something new. It is the, an extension of geo strategy are uh, originated from geo strategy. And you also very rightly mentioned that economy is central to the uh, country's overall capabilities, uh, both economics, um, defense and security and human security all are interrelated. Um, so uh, we now move to our uh, third speaker. Um, our third speaker is uh, Dr. Farooq Saleem. Uh, he will be speaking on the um, issues of uh, debt trap. Um, Dr. Farooq Saleem is a political scientist, uh, economist, analyst, and journalist. And uh, 
uh, he um, regularly appears on television as well and he is phd in commercial and industrial economy uh, and he is also a regular columnist uh, uh, from 1994 um, he he contributes he has widely contributed to the news international so with this uh, brief introduction uh, i would like to give the floor to dr farooq salim Thank you, Nabila. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. The topic that has been allocated to me is uh, Pakistan and the debt trap. If we were to plot our national borrowings over the past 75 years, this is the picture that comes up. So we started out. So we started out in 1947, almost zero debt, and went all the way to 54,000 in 75 years. Now, this two days before, the figure that the State Bank has told us is actually 54,000 has gone up to 60,000 billion now. So over a period of 75 years, started out from almost zero, went all the way to 60,000. In 75 years. If we look at it in detail, in the first 61 years, starting 1947 all the way till 2008, the total debt that we accumulated was only 6,000 billion. So, in the first 61 years, we only accumulated 11% of our total debt. And starting 2008, so first 61 years, a total of 6,000 billion and starting 2008 till 2022, an additional 48 trillion. Remember, we're talking about a debt trap. So Pichle Chauda Salome is 89% of the total debt. And over the past 61 years, it was only 11%. So 1947 all the way till 2008, it was 6,000 billion. Uh, different regimes, presidents, prime ministers, who are coming, in their time, how do they go on the debt? Now, the debt trap is the years. We went from zero to about 30,000 trillion. The past four years, from 2018 to 2022, we accumulated an additional 22 trillion rupees or 22,000 billion. So, four years, we have 42 percent of the total debt. Only in the past four years, we have So, 1947 all the way to 2018, 30 trillion, and 2018 to 2022. Uh, an additional uh, 22 trillion. So 42% uh, debt jo hai, wo pichle char saalon mein aaya. Now economists at times look, uh, want to look at debt as a percentage of GDP as opposed to uh, just nominal numbers. Um, and this situation kuch aisi rahi hai uh, in 2005, 2010 mein, we went to 60% uh, of GDP, 57% uh, of GDP. And then uh, starting 2015, uh, we went uh, back up to 84%, uh, 85% uh, of GDP. Debt per capita, okay, 1971, her uh, Pakistani bacha bura murder aurat ke upar sirf 500 rupay ka karta tha. So debt per capita back in 1971 was 500 rupees. In uh, 2008, it was 36,000, in 2013, it was 88,000, in uh, Nawaz Sharif's time, it was 144,000, uh, and the latest figure is about 222,000, so it was 2.5 lakh rupiah, every Pakistani child, the 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 child
तो 2008 से 2013 तक तकरीबन फाइव थाउजेंड बिलियन अ डे वॉज बींग टेकन एज एडिशनल डेट 2013 से 2018 तक ए वॉज एट बिलियन पर डे और 2018-2021 से वी वेंट ऑल द वे अप टू 17 बिलियन रुपीस अ डे एवरी सिंगल डे ऑफ द ईयर दिस इज हाउ द डेट इज क्लाइम छ हजार अरब था दो हजार आठ में वेन अप टू सिक्सटीन थर्टी यहाँ पे फिफ्टी फोर दिखाया जा रहा है लेकिन दो दिन पहले हमें स्टेट बैंक ने बताया कि अब ये सिक्सटी थाउजेंड बिलियन हो गया है या सिक्सटी ट्रिलियन रुपीज हो गया एनदर वे टू लुक एट डेट और डेट ट्रैप वुड बी हाउ मच ऑफ आर एफ बी आर टैक्सेस आर स्पेंट एक्चुअली ऑन डेट सर्विस तो देखिए 2018 में भी स्पेंडिंग अबाउट 39 परसेंट ऑफ आर एफ बी आर टैक्सेज ऑन ऑन सर्विसिंग आर डेट एंड देन इन अप टू 45 परसेंट फिर हम कोई दो साल पहले 74 परसेंट पर पहुंच गए थे अब कहीं हम 80 फीसद तक पहुंच चुके हुए दैट मीन्स के ऑल ऑफ द एफ बी आर रेवेन्यूज दैट आर कलेक्टेड ऑन अयरली बेसिस उसमें से अस्सी फीसद जो है वो सिर्फ डेट सर्विसिंग के लिए चला जाता है कर्जा जात वापस करने के लिए So what really is a debt trap a debt trap is a situation where a country is forced to take new loans in order to repay existing debt obligations theek hai hum naye qarze le rahe hain aur sirf isi maqsad ke liye le rahe hain ke purane qarze jo hain wo humne wapas kar rahe hain going back to the original graph aap dekhiye ki bilkul wazeh hai ki hum additional qarze liye chale ja rahe hain liye chale ja rahe hain sirf purane qarze wapas karne ke liye bhi naye qarze hame lene pad rahe hain Why is this, this happening? Why are we falling into a debt trap? ये दो बहुत बड़ी वजूहत एक तो जिसको हम कहते हैं हाई फिजिकल डेफिसिट यानी कि जो हमारा बजट का खसारा है वो इतना हाई आता है इसमें चार हजार अरब लिखा है लेकिन अभी जो गवर्नमेंट ने रिलीज किया है पिछले साल का खसारा दस फाइव थाउजेंड फाइव हंड्रेड बिलियन पांच हजार पांच सौ अरब का बजट का खसारा है यानी कि जो हकूमत आमदन है हकूमत की जो हुकूमत के अखराज हैं उनका जो फर्क है 5,500 बिलियन अब उसके लिए हमें कर्जे लेने पड़ते हैं वो जो होल है उसके लिए हम कर्जे लेते हैं और वो फिर कर्जे हमें डेट ट्रैप के अंदर ले जाते हैं दूसरी बड़ी वजह है बैलेंस ऑफ पेमेंट या ट्रेड डेफिसिट कह लें उसको कि हमारी इम्पोर्ट बहुत ज्यादा है एक्सपोर्ट कम है अभी जो फिगर सामने आई हैं उसमें कोई तीस इकतीस अरब डॉलर की हमारी एक्सपोर्ट पिछले दस बारह साल से अटकी हुई है देर स्टक देर और इम्पोर्ट्स जो हैं वो इस साल को अस्सी बिलियन पे जा रही हैं तो अभी जो दो दिन पहले हुकूमत ने बताया कि 53 बिलियन डॉलर्स का हमारा ट्रेड डेफिसिट आया है यानी कि तजारती खसारा तिरपन बिलियन डॉलर का आया है फिर उसमें से आप समझिए हमें रिमिटेंस कुछ वापस मिल जाती हैं और जो फर्क रह जाता है वो हमें कर्जा लेना पड़ता है तो एक तो हम बजट के खसारे के लिए कर्जे ले रहे हैं और दूसरा हम कर्जे ले रहे हैं अपने तजारती खसारे के लिए ये दोनों कर्जे जो हैं ये हमें ले जाते हैं डेट ट्रैप की तरफ जब बैलेंस ऑफ पेमेंट की क्राइसिस आती है डॉलर्स खत्म हो जाते हैं तो हम भागते हैं आईएमएफ की तरफ आईएमएफ की तरफ भागते हैं तो वो कहते हैं जी टैक्सेस बढ़ाए कहते हैं टैक्सेस बढ़ाते हैं टाइट मॉनिटरी पॉलिसी रखें ये दोनों चीजें होती हैं तो हमारी ग्रोथ लो हो जाती है जी नीचे चली जाती है अब इन जाना भी जरूरी है आई के पास बजटरी खसारे भी कर रहे हैं तजारती खसारे भी कर रहे हैं So naturally, it's all leading into leading us into a debt trap. So major reasons of why we are into a debt trap. I think five major reasons. One, I have said that the budget deficit is coming. Five, five thousand Arab ka deficit is coming. If you think that for four years the PTI government has been in power, then twenty thousand Arab ka, so only the budget deficit is coming. Twenty thousand Arab we have to take care of. Then the current account deficit is. There are some things that we have hidden away. कर्जे हम ले रहे हैं लेकिन वो बजट की किताबों में नहीं आते जैसे पावर सेक्टर का है अब मुझे याद है कि अगस्त 2018 द टोटल सर्कुलर डेट वाज अबाउट 1100 बिलियन जो बिजली के सेक्टर के अंदर 1100 अरब का डेट था वो अब बढ़ के पच्चीस अरब हो गया ये भी इवेंचुअली हमें उठाना पड़ेगा कर्जा उठाना पड़ेगा पब्लिक सेक्टर एंटरप्राइजेस अच्छा बजट डेफिसिट मैंने कहा साढ़े पांच हजार अरब का करंट अकाउंट डेफिसिट अठारह बिलियन का आ रहा है वो भी कर्जा उठाना पड़ेगा पावर सेक्टर कोई ढाई हजार अरब पे पहुंच गया पब्लिक सेक्टर एंटरप्राइजेज हैं कोई एक सौ पचानवे रियासती इदारे हैं जिसमें पीआईए पाकिस्तान स्टील पाकिस्तान रेलवे 
उनका खसारा कोई दो हजार अरब पे पहुंच गया ये स्टेट बैंक की किताबों में भी दिखाया जा रहा एक कमोडिटी ऑपरेशन है हुकूमत जो गन्नुम खरीदती है वो पैस्को का एक अदारा बनाया हुआ है कोई आठ मिलियन टन सालाना गन्नुम खरीदती है उसका कर्जा अलग से इकट्ठा हो गया वो कोई आठ सौ अरब का कर्जा मुझे लास्ट वीक जब मैं स्टेट बैंक को दे रहा हूँ आठ सौ अरब का कर्जा वो इकट्ठा हो गया वो गंदम खरीदती है आपको याद है कि गंदम खरीदती हैं और साल की आखिर में जब वो बोरियां खुलती हैं तो उसके अंदर से मट्टी निकलती अच्छा दो कंक्लूजन अभी तक अभी तक जो कुछ मैंने कहा द फर्स्ट कंक्लूजन इज दैट आवर करंट डेट लेवल इज रियली अनसस्टेनेबल इसी तरह हम नहीं चल सकते जिस तरह हम चलते चले जा रहे हैं तो एसेंशियली जैसे वो कहते हैं कि वी आर इन होल एंड स्टिल डिगिंग मतलब कुएं के अंदर गिर चुके हैं और खोदे चले जा रहे हैं तो और नीचे चले जाए तो दिस सिचुएशन रियली इज नॉट सस्टेनेबल नो वट रियली हैपन्स वेन अ कंट्री फेल्स टू फुलफिल एन ऑब्लिगेशन मुल्क ने वादा किया हुआ है हम ये कर्जा जात वापस करेंगे और वो कर्जा जात वापस नहीं कर पाते दैट सिचुएशन कॉल्ड इज कॉल्ड डिफॉल्ट द कंट्री गोज इन टू डिफॉल्ट सो वट हैपन्स वेन अ कंट्री फेल्स टू फुलफिल एन ऑब्लीगेशन द कंट्री गोज इन टू अ डिफॉल्ट अब जब डिफॉल्ट में जाते हैं तो क्या होता है कि डिफॉल्ट में जाते हैं हमारा ट्रेड डेफिसिट जब बहुत बढ़ जाता है एक्सटर्नल डेट सर्विसिंग बहुत बढ़ गई है करेंट अकाउंट डेफिसिट बड़ा हाई है उसके नतीजे में वी रन इन टू शॉर्टेज ऑफ डॉलर जो भी पाकिस्तान में हो रहा है डॉलर खत्म होने लगते हैं डिवेल्यूएशन करेंसी के ऊपर दबाव आ जाता है डिवेल्यूएशन होने लगती है फिर स्टेट बैंक कैपिटल कंट्रोल्स वगैरह के पैसे बाहर ना भेजें और उस किस्म की कंट्रोल्स uh, आने लगते हैं उसके नतीजे में हमने देखा फूड इन्फ्लेशन आ जाती है शॉर्टेज ऑफ फूड शॉर्टेज ऑफ डीजल शॉर्टेज ऑफ पेट्रोल फिर uh, किसी स्टेज पे फूड कोटा शुरू हो जाते हैं पेट्रोलियम कोटा शुरू हो जाते हैं लोड शेडिंग शुरू हो जाती है और देन द कंट्री गोज इन टू डिफॉल्ट What happens when a country actually goes into a default? ये हमने देखा पिछले कुछ महीनों में श्रीलंका को अगर श्रीलंका को देखें और उससे कोई सबक सीखने की कोशिश करें श्रीलंका डिक्लेयर डिफॉल्ट ऑन अप्रैल ट्वेल्थ टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी टू डिफॉल्ट के बाद वो हमने देखा कि सोशल अनरेस्ट शुरू हो जाता एंड सोशल अनरेस्ट इवेंचुअली इफ इट गोस ऑन फॉर अ लॉन्गर टाइम हॉराइजन टर्नस इन टू वायलेंट प्रोटेस्ट ये हमने देखा कि श्रीलंका में वायलेंट प्रोटेस्ट बाई मे नाइन्थ शुरू हो गए थे एंड देन द एंड रिजल्ट इज दैट ट्रूप्स आर टू टू बी कॉल्ड इन फिर फौज को बुलाना पड़ता है ये श्रीलंका में हमने पिछले एक दो महीने में होता देखा है श्रीलंका की अगर ब्रीफ टाइम लाइन वॉश करें तो दो हजार इक्कीस में वहां पर करेंसी क्राइसिस शुरू हो गया था यानी कि उसकी करेंसी uh, जो है उसकी वैल्यू बड़ी तेजी से गिरने लगी थी डिवेल्यूएशन होने लगी थी उसके नतीजे में फिर इन्फ्लेशन महंगाई शुरू हो जाती है और उसके नतीजे में फ्यूल शॉर्टेज फूड शॉर्टेज लोड शेडिंग शुरू हो जाती है मेडिसिन की, की किल्लत हो जाती है एंड ऑल ऑफ दैट टर्न इन टू वायलेंट प्रोटेस्ट फिर वायलेंट प्रोटेस्ट के नतीजे में वहाँ पर डिफॉल्ट हो गया और फिर uh, उसके बाद ट्रूप डिप्लॉयमेंट हमने देखी कि फौज को बुला लिया गया लेबनान में भी कुछ सिमिलर सिचुएशन आई है डिफॉल्ट डिक्लेयर किया है लेबनान ने उसके बाद अबाउट थ्री क्वार्टर्स ऑफ द इंटायर पॉपुलेशन 75 परसेंट द इंटायर पॉपुलेशन फेल बिलो पॉवर्टी कोई 50 फीसद का अनएम्प्लॉयमेंट रेट शुरू हो गया था डॉलर्स खत्म हो गए थे तेल नहीं खरीद रख रहा था ये लेबनान की बात कर रहा हूँ और फिर वहाँ पर कोई बीस घंटे की लोड शेडिंग शुरू हो गई Uh, उसके बाद वहां पे आर्मी ने ऐलान uh, किया कि अब उनके मैसेज में uh, गोश्त बंद कर दिया जाएगा यानी कि इतनी कमी हो गई थी गोश्त इंपोर्ट करते हैं लेबनान uh, उन्होंने कहा कि गोश्त बंद कर दिया जाएगा सारी फौजी मैसेज में वहां पे उन्होंने गोश्त बंद कर दिया uh, फ्यूल मिल्क मेडिसिन स्पेयर पार्ट सबकी शॉर्टेज शुरू हो जाती है उसके बाद फिर वो क्राइम भी सोसाइटी uh, में आना शुरू हो जाता है वर आर द सोल्यूशन पाकिस्तान के लिए हमारे पास सोल्यूशन क्या है जिस सिमत में हम जा रहे हैं देखिए पहली चीज तो ये है कि फिजिकल कंसोलिडेशन प्लान जिसको हम कहते हैं भाई अगर आप साढ़े पांच हजार अरब का सालाना बजट का खसारा कर रहे हैं यू शुड ट्राई एंड कम अप विद बैलेंस बजट विद मोर बैलेंस बजट बजट का अगर आप खसारा कर रहे हैं फिर आपको कर्जा लेना पड़ रहा है फिर कर्जे के बाद आप डेट ट्रैप में जा रहे हैं फिर हमने देखा कि डेट ट्रैप के बाद श्रीलंका में क्या हुआ है लेबनान में क्या होता है 
देन वी नीड अ प्राइवेटाइजेशन स्ट्रैटेजी इतने सारे रियासती इदारे खड़े कर रखे हैं और जिनको वाइट एलिफेंट्स कहते हैं सारे के सारे सालाना नुकसान कर रहे हैं प्राइवेटाइजेशन uh, पॉलिसी पाकिस्तान के पास है उसमें हमने एक शर्त लगा रखी है कि जितनी भी प्राइवेटाइजेशन होगी उसमें से नब्बे फीसद जो है वो पुराने करदे उतारे जाएंगे लेकिन उस पर अमल दरामद कोई नहीं होगा एंड देन एन इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ स्ट्रेटेजी वी से वी नीड टू ग्रो फास्टर इन ऑर्डर टू ग्रो आउट ऑफ डेट तो दीज आर दोल्यूशन रियली फिजिकल कंसॉलिडेशन प्लान जिसकी जरूरत है प्राइवेटाइजेशन स्ट्रेटेजी एंड एन इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ स्ट्रेटेजी ब्रीफ सा सेशन में आपके सामने रखता हूं कि हमारा इकोनॉमिक पोटेंशियल पाकिस्तान का इकोनॉमिक पोटेंशियल क्या है और जमीनी हकीकत क्या है जो पोटेंशियल क्या है और इस वक्त हम कहां पहुंच ये वर्ल्ड बैंक की एक रिपोर्ट है इसको आप नेट पे देख सकते हैं कॉल पाकिस्तान डेवलपमेंट अपडेट आर करंट एक्सपोर्ट्स अबाउट थर्टी बिलियन एंड दिस रिपोर्ट सेज दैट पाकिस्तान पोटेंशियल इज एक्चुअली एटी एट बिलियन दिस इज द वर्ल्ड बैंक से ये एक और रिपोर्ट है वर्ल्ड बैंक की इज कॉल्ड पाकिस्तान एट वन हंड्रेड पाकिस्तान एट द रेट ऑफ वन हंड्रेड इज सक्सेसिबल आप नेट पे इसको देख सकते हैं वो ये कहते हैं कि जो पाकिस्तान का सोलर पोटेंशियल है शमसी तो इस 2.9 मिलियन मेगावाट से नहीं कि खुदा ने इतना सारा सूरज दे रखा है कि हम तकरीबन 30 लाख मेगावाट दिस इज द पोटेंशियल लुक एट द प्रेजेंस अभी हम कितना जनरेट कर रहे हैं 530 30 लाख का पोटेंशियल है और हम जनरेट कर रहे हैं सिर्फ 530 मेगावाट वीट का पोटेंशियल वी करंटली प्रोड्यूस अराउंड ट्वेंटी मिलियन टन जो इस वक्त इस साल का टारगेट रखा है द पोटेंशियल इज अबाउट एटी मिलियन टन हम पोटेंशियल और प्रेजेंस uh, से uh, इसका डिफरेंस देखें कितना ज्यादा uh, चावल 7.4 मिलियन टन की करंट प्रोडक्शन आ रही है और पोटेंशियल हम कहीं 13 मिलियन पे बैठे हैं अगेन दिस इज पाकिस्तान एट 100 वर्ल्ड बैंक रिपोर्ट हमारी uh, अभी uh, कहा गया कि हमारी जो जी डी पी है इज थ्री बिलियन द बैंक द वर्ल्ड बैंक रिपोर्ट साइज That the potential is two trillion dollars. This is uh, uh, Energy Information Administration. ये अमेरिका का Department of Energy का एक इदारा है. इसने पाकिस्तान का तेल और गैस का एक सर्वे किया था. And this is the conclusion that they reached. They told us that there is nine billion barrels of oil in Pakistan. Which means uh, the current rate of consumption अभी जो हम इस्तेमाल कर रहे हैं uh, it will last us for 45 years. Exploration नहीं हो रही तकरीबन सारी तेल की कंपनी को हमने पाकिस्तान से भगा दिया जो एक्सप्लोरेशन के लिए आई गैस का पोटेंशियल अगेन एनर्जी इंफॉर्मेशन एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन वो कहती है कि पाकिस्तान में वन ओ फाइव ट्रिलियन क्यूबिक फीट ऑफ गैस एक सौ पांच ट्रिलियन क्यूबिक फीट ऑफ गैस है अभी जो हम तकरीबन चार साढ़े चार बिलियन क्यूबिक फीट ऑफ गैस रोजाना की इस्तेमाल करते हैं दिस वुड लास्ट अस फॉर 58 एट ईयर्स थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच डॉक्टर फरूख सलीम यू वेरी कॉम्प्रिहेंसिवली मेक अस अंडरस्टैंड द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ डेप ट्रैप एंड यू आल्सो एक्सप्लेन इट्स टेक्निकलिटीज um both related to the debt trap and the uh, what happens when countries default and you also mentioned the solutions and also explained the potential of pakistan um now um, we uh, open the um, floor for q and a uh, um, you can raise your hand and introduce yourself Dr Asma are you are you still there uh yeah i am here okay okay um ji assalam alaikum uh, my name is maryam aur uh, aapne bada sahi dono ne point out kiya trade deficit ka pakistan jo hai wo trade nahi kar pa raha mukhtalif mamalik ke sath um interestingly is ye soch ke aur ye sun ke hairat hoti hai ki hum 3 million dollars ke liye आईएमएफ से कर्जा मांग रहे हैं लेकिन अगर देखा जाए तो दूसरी तरफ इंडिया इराक के साथ सिर्फ टू मिलियन डॉलर्स की ट्रेड कर रहा है इराक से तो हमारी कोई लड़ाई नहीं है 
सिंगापुर से हमारी कोई लड़ाई नहीं है सिंगापुर भी बहुत ज्यादा इन्वेस्ट कर रहा है इंडिया में वाई वी आर नॉट एक्सप्लोरिंग अदर ऑप्शन सीमेंट बिलियन आई थिंक Who should you want to uh, answer your question? Okay. Give a quick. देखें मैं आपको एक फ्रेंकली बात बताऊं कि हमारा इकोनॉमिक जो सोच थी ना वो पटरी से उतर गई थी हम जिस रास्ते पे चल रहे थे आप टाइम मैगजीन उठा के देख लें मैं नहीं कह रहा कि सिक्सटीज में और थ्रू आउट दिक्सटीज पाकिस्तान के बारे में क्या लाइफ मैगजीन टाइम मैगजीन इकोनॉमी के बारे में क्या बातें की जाती थी इन ऑर्डर टू ट्रेड यू हैव टू हैव एन अग्रेसिव माइंड सेट ये जी वेन यू टॉक अबाउट सर्टन कंट्रीज लाइक सिंगापुर इट हैज इट हैज एन एक्सपोर्ट ऑफ वन हंड्रेड एंड एटी सेवन परसेंट ऑफ इट्स जी डी पी मीनिंग सौ रुपये अगर वो बनाता है तो वो तकरीबन दो सौ रुपये एक्सपोर्ट करता है इट्स जस्ट अ माइंड सेट यू नीड टू सोट ऑफ री एडजस्ट दो थिंग्स I will I've been involved in uh helping 20 of Pakistan's top sectors. With one effort we were able to start to increase our exports on certain products like pharmaceuticals ye wo to let's say Saudi Arabia ye wo to have an economics mindset I did say strategic economics. When you when you bring in a, such a concept you have to think more aggressively more deeply more in a uh, in a more uh, uh, a distant manner you cannot just say ki agar aa raha hai to theek hai nahi aa raha to it's it's your mindset there is a reason that uh, hong kong hong kong uska size kya hai hong kong also has a more than 100% export to gdp ratio is approximately 160% so what i what i'm saying is it's you have to develop a policy then you have to push it but you have to push it from the top down to all the offices that are going to implement it and at the same time you take the private sector into the discussion if you're not going to talk to the private sector the private sector is not going to talk to you the private sector let's be very obvious i'm primarily from i've spent most of my career in the private sector the private sector is literally afraid of talking to the government once you bring the two together that's where you can build things up ji please uh, dr farooq who would you like to okay. इस कंट्रोल बाय कार्टेल्स पाकिस्तान के अंदर बड़े बड़े कार्टेल बने हैं चीनी का कार्टेल है बिजली का बहुत बड़ा कार्टेल बन गया है खाद का कार्टेल है ऑटोमोबाइल मैन्युफैक्चरिंग की कंपनी का कार्टेल ये कार्टेल्स जो हैं ये पाकिस्तान की इकोनॉमी को कंपेरेटिव नहीं करते ये कार्टेल प्राइसिंग जिस सेक्टर के अंदर हुकूमत घुस जाती है ना सिर्फ पाकिस्तानी हुकूमत बट दुनिया में जो भी हुकूमत किसी सेक्टर में घुस जाती है उस सेक्टर का बेड़ा गर्क करते अब देखिए हुकूमत गंदुम के सेक्टर में घुसी हुई है वो सपोर्ट प्राइस देती है हुकूमत गन्ने के सेक्टर में घुसी हुई है वो गन्ने की सपोर्ट प्राइस देती है कौन शुगर बना सकता है उसको लाइसेंस देती है कौन मिल बना सकता है कितना कोटा हो सकता है एक सेक्टर ऐसा है जिसमें हुकूमत नहीं है वो चावल का सेक्टर है पाकिस्तान अब आप सोचिए कि हमेशा गंदुम की हमें प्रॉब्लम रहती है कीमतें चढ़ जाती हैं किल्लत हो जाती है गन्ने की चीनी की हमेशा कीमतें चढ़ जाती हैं किल्लत हो जाती है चावल की मुझे याद नहीं पिछले पंद्रह बीस साल में कभी किल्लत हुई हो या कभी हमने कंप्लेन किया जी कीमतें बहुत चढ़ गई हैं आप पंद्रह साल का रिकॉर्ड निकाल के देख लें दो ढाई बिलियन डॉलर की सालाना एक्सपोर्ट करते हैं हम चावल की तो गवर्नमेंट का काम है हुक्मरानी करना हुकूमत का काम है हुक्मरानी करना उसका काम मार्केट मेकनिज्म के अंदर या बिजनेस चलाना नहीं तो अनलेस द गवर्नमेंट गेट्स आउट ऑफ रनिंग बिजनेस और मेक दिस इकोनॉमी कंपेटेट कंपेरेटिव वर्ल्ड वाइड अभी बिजली की आप कीमत देख लें हम हम किससे कंपीट कर सकते हैं आपने सिंगापुर का नाम दिया हांगकॉन्ग का नाम दिया आधी आधी कीमत की बिजली है वहां तो हमारा एक्सपोर्टर आई थिंक आर प्राइवेट सेक्टर इज रियली वेरी कंपेरेटिव अगर उसको हम इनपुट कॉस्ट जो है 
वो चाइना के मुकाबले में उतनी की बिजली दे दें इंडिया के मुकाबले में उतनी की बिजली दे दें तो द प्राइवेट सेक्टर कैन कम्पीट लेकिन लेवल प्लेइंग फील्ड चाहिए होगी और गवर्नमेंट शुड रिस्ट्रिक्ट इट सेल्फ टू गवर्निंग एंड नॉट गेट इन्वॉल्व इन टू बिजनेस um dr uh, asma would you like to add uh, yeah i i will just add uh, one more point i completely agree with uh, both of my colleagues uh, farooq saab ne to bahut acha isko explain kar diya and so i only want to add so aap baat kar rahe hain uh, uh, hong kong aur singapore ki lekin agar hum even bangladesh ko dekhe so uh, just to share with you ke uh, 10 saal pehle jab main us mein uh, apni studies kar rahi thi to uh, us waqt i realized ke jitni bhi jo american brands hain jo ke young logon mein bade popular hote hain jo american brands hain for instance aero pastel aur is kisam ki cheeze they all were made in bangladesh और अभी मैं कुछ अर्सा पहले दोबारा यूएस गई थी देन अगेन आई रियलाइज द सेम थिंग तो मेरा ख्याल है कि अगर तो ये तो बांग्लादेश हम हांगकॉन्ग सिंगापुर चलेंगे हमसे बड़े आगे हैं लेकिन अगर इवन बांग्लादेश को हम देखें बहुत बांग्लादेश ने इस चीज को हमें उस यानी वी नीड टू लर्न लेसन फ्रॉम दैम तो मेरा ख्याल है कि एक चीज और मैं इस बात से कम्प्लीटली अग्री करती हूँ कि गवर्नमेंट के फुटप्रिंट बहुत हाई हैं गवर्नमेंट को अपना काम करना चाहिए कोई जरूरत नहीं है प्राइवेट सेक्टर में आने की और प्राइसिंग सेट करने की या जो बिल्कुल आई कम्प्लीटली अग्री एक चीज जो शायद गवर्नमेंट को करने की जरूरत है वो स्किल डेवलपमेंट मेरा ख्याल एक बहुत बड़ा इशू हमारा प्रोडक्टिविटी का है तो हमारा स्किल लेवल हमारी प्रोडक्टिविटी इंतहा लो है हम किसी से कम्पीट करना बहुत मुश्किल है यानी अब तो चाइना जिस तरीके से सारी दुनिया में छा चुका है तो हमें वाकई सीरियसली रिगरसली गवर्नमेंट को कोई पॉलिसी लेकर आनी पड़ेगी स्किल डेवलपमेंट के लिए हमें हायर एजुकेशन की जरूरत नहीं है बेसिक स्किल्स ही हम सीख जाए तो वह बहुत बड़ी बात होगी तो सो दीज आर जस्ट माई वन कॉमेंट थैंक यू थैंक यू डॉक्टर जॉब्सिंग आमना आमना आपने शायद आपका नाम आई डोंट नो आपका नाम क्या है आपने शायद बताया हो लेकिन मैं देखिए ये फरूक साहब ने जो भी बात की थी मेरा ख्याल है इन्होंने इतना कम्प्लीटली इस चीज को डिस्क्राइब कर दिया है कि गवर्नमेंट के का फुटप्रिंट इतना हाई है अब बहुत से लोग हैं इवन अब मैं कराची में हूँ फॉर इंस्टेंस एंड आई रियलाइज देर आर लॉट ऑफ मनी दैट फ्लोट अराउंड अस फ्लोट अराउंड अस यानी बहुत से लोग हैं जो इन्वेस्ट करना चाहते हैं बहुत से मेरे इर्द जानने वाले हैं जो इन्वेस्ट करना चाहते हैं हमारे बहुत से स्टूडेंट्स हैं जो इन्वेस्ट करना चाहते हैं लेकिन और वो बहुत से तो ऐसे लोग हैं जिसका मैंने पहले भी बताया था कि एजुकेशन और हेल्थ में कराची में तो बहुत बड़ी तादाद है जो जाते हैं हम स्कूल खोलें हम इस तरह का स्कूल लेकर आए जिसमें ऐसी एजुकेशन हो हेल्थ सेक्टर में इन्वेस्ट करना चाहते हैं लेकिन अब आप ये देखें कि गवर्नमेंट के इसमें आप लोग इस्लामाबाद में बैठे हुए हैं और पाइट की इसके ऊपर बहुत सी स्टडीज हैं कि गवर्नमेंट का फुटप्रिंट कितना हाई है मैं उनको जरूर आपको रेफर करूंगी कि यानी इतने एन आपको लेने हैं एंड पीपल आर सो मच अफ्रेड ऑफ दो एन ओ सीज के लोग सोचते हैं कि हम वेदर वी शुड गो फॉर इन्वेस्टमेंट और नॉट तो गवर्नमेंट का हमें इसमें अगर आप फॉर इंस्टेंस अपने स्टूडेंट्स को भी पढ़ाती होंगी तो इस्टोनिया का मॉडल हमारे लिए बहुत एक मेरा ख्याल है कि मैं हमेशा उसकी केयर स्टडीज जरूर कराती हूँ क्योंकि उनका उनका जो टैक्स सिस्टम है वो इतना यानी इतना फैसिनेटिंग है और जिस तरीके से उन्होंने आंटरप्रीनरशिप को फैसिलिटेट किया है अपने मुल्क में इट्स एन एग्जाम्पल फॉर ऑल ऑफ अस तो बहुत सारी चीजें हो सकती हैं इसके लिए हमारा टैक्स सिस्टम इसको किया जा सकता है इस तरह का फैसिलिटेट कि अगर आप अपने प्रॉफिट के इतना परसेंट कर लें और शुरू में इवन टैक्स क्रेडिट की कोई स्कीम्स हो चल सकती हैं तो अनफॉर्चुनेटली हम लोगों ने शायद अभी इस बारे में वही बात है कि हमारी इंडिजिनस थिंकिंग नहीं है हमने सोचा नहीं है कि कोई एक पॉलिसी इस तरह की लाई जाए सो सो आई स्टॉप हेयर के आई वुड से गवर्नमेंट ने इतना इस चीज़ों को डिस्करेज किया हुआ है कि लोग सामने नहीं आते अदरवाइज पीपल हैव मनी दे हैव आइडियाज Uh, thank you, Dr. Asma. Uh, Ambassador Shah Jamal. Hello, Assalamualaikum. Your very good presentation, thi, as always. Uh, would you agree with me that some of the problems 
uh, in our economic situation is created by our economic experts because they're constantly harping on the mantra of doomsday scenario. I see this uh, 74.4 to 80% debt to GDP ratio, not a big deal. So many other countries if we compare with that, but constantly when we create this hype and from your presentation, I get the impression that it's loaded against the PTI government performance, whereas the economic survey of 2021 painted a completely different picture, which was otherwise being portrayed by everybody as we were going in the sinkhole, but 6% growth and other, but I'm not going on to that. You very rightly pointed out that we have cartels. 80% um, of the sugar is controlled by the political families. They decide everything. Similarly, the power sector, who brought this curse of power sector on us in these conditions that they are dictating the terms. So we have a problem and I think if our experts, instead of having the Waterloo on TV channels, they should have some positive thing to say about. Uh, that is my, I don't know whether you agree with that or not. Thank you. Take in order for countries to move uh, ahead, the uh, so saal se economists ko study kar rahe hain ko itna complex mamla nahi reh gaya all that is needed is three things aapko uh, talent chahiye mulk ke andar mulk ke andar wasail resources honi chahiye and political stability ye formula hai ye teenon cheeze aapko milenge ab dekhiye ki pakistan ke andar kis cheez ki kami reh gayi pakistan mein talent beshumar hai pakistan ka talent duniya bhar mein jata hai to aap dekhiye kitne kamal dikhata resources maine aapke samne rakh di resources kitne I think the only thing lacking here is political stability. Siyasi uh, adam esta kaam is. Ab aap sochiye ke Italy me ko mein dekh raha tha ke 1945 se aaj tak 70 saal ho gaye kabhi. 69 governments tab deal hui hain wahan pe. 70 saalon mein ausatan har saal ek hukumat change hoti hai but unki jo economic policy hai wo apne track pe rehti hai. जापान को आप देख लें पिछले कोई 30 सालों में दो दर्जन وزیر اعظم گزرا ہے اعظم ائے لیکن اکنامک پالیسی ائی تھنک وٹ وی نیڈ ٹو ڈو از ٹو کریٹ ٹو ڈیفرنٹ سفیئرز ایک پولیٹیکل سفیئر اینڈ ایک اکنامک سفیئر ایک فائر وال کریٹ کریں وی میک اے ڈسٹنکشن بٹوین پالیٹکس اینڈ اکنامکس لیٹ پالیٹیشنز ڈو وٹ ایور دے وانٹ ٹو ڈو بٹ اٹ شوڈ ناٹ ہیو این امپیکٹ آن اور اکنامک پالیسی یہ بہت سارے ملکوں نے کیا ہے دو ملک میں نے آپ کے سامنے رکھے ہیں کہ آپ تو الگ سے سفیئرز آف انفلوئنس کریٹ کر لیں پالیٹیشنز اپنی سیاست کرتے رہیں بے شک ہر سال حکومت بدلتے رہیں اور ایک اکنامک سفیئر ہو جو کہ اکنامک پالیسی بنائے اور وہ اسٹیگنٹ رہے اس کے اوپر سیاسی طور پہ بھی بات ہو رہی ہے چارٹر آف اکانومی کی بہت دفعہ بات ہوتی ہے تو دیر از اے نیڈ ٹو ٹو میک اے ڈسٹنکشن بٹوین دا پولیٹیکل سفیئر اینڈ دا اکنامک سفیئر Uh, just to add to what uh, was being discussed and to the question, aapke jo <coughs> experts honge, if they are going to just think symmetrically about something, why don't we think asymmetrically? Why don't we think both ways? Pakistan needs an asymmetric solution. It's there, by the way. Uh, anyway, point number two, which uh, I didn't want to bring up, but I think now I have to, given the direction of this uh, conversation, 5,000 bombs were blown up in Pakistan's economic centers, 5,000. This is a rough estimate, could be more, could be less. There are two colors of bombs, black and white. White is more destructive. You can do your own math, you can do your own statistics. Those bombs were blown up to bring your economy down, to slow down your economy. And if we take the, if we, uh, take the presentation of uh, Farooq Saab and the debt uh, the rise in debt, absolutely accurate. And I would just want it to spray the bombs starting 2003, how they intensified. And it's the, the correlation between the debt and the bomb, bomb uh, uh, blasts is almost 100%. So we, uh, we, we need to, uh, uh, the solutions are there, but we also need to understand what exactly happened to the country that, uh, Acha, by the way, when we talk about any country and uh, 
it's amazing. Those countries have not faced any violence in economic areas. You can, you can do your own researches. Check Hanoi, bomb blast, nothing. Dhaka, bomb blast, nothing. Check Shanghai, uh, terrorist attack, nothing. In 2021, the Pakistan Stock Exchange was attacked physically. This is just one example that I'm giving you. To what, this is all based, uh, it has a huge economic impact. I didn't want to talk about right now, by the way, according to my estimates, and, and I'd be happy to discuss that if those bomb blasts did not happen, do you know what our GDP would be right now? 450 billion at the very least per year. So that means you've lost more than, we've lost more than a hundred billion dollars per year. So we need to get the, uh, certain things, you know, in the proper. Uh... Sir, I would say one thing. Farooq Saab, how do you see this run on our rupee, which was artificially created? And we paid the price. Now it's coming back. How all this happened? Is your opinion on that? Uh, May I request you that you should be very brief because we are like short of time. Yeah. <laughs> they give fundamentally um, currency is like any other commodity. Uh, economics make other is like any other commodity. Jesse, Aka, Gandume, Kela, demand supply. Uh, the demand of dollars in Pakistan is equivalent uh, is the equivalent to our imports jo hum imports karte hain wo dollar ki demand hai aur jo hum export karte hain wo dollar ki supply hai ab agar dollar ki supply jo hai wo 30 31 barab ki hai aur demand jo hai wo 80 arab pe ja rahi hai to naturally rupaya girega abhi aapne jo doston ka zikr kiya this is uh, a lot of this is uh, speculation aur uh, abhi humne dekha ke isi kism ki speculation jo bangladesh mein hui thi वहां पे सेंट्रल बैंक जो उनका सेंट्रल बैंक है उसने तीन चार बड़े-बड़े बैंक्स सीईओस को निकाल दिया उनके ऊपर उन्होंने पेनल्टीज लगाई हैं कि ये बैंक्स वाले ये काम कर रहे हैं तो दिस इज द स्टेट बैंक्स डोमेन टू एक्चुअली कंट्रोल इट लेकिन ये सोच लेना कि जब हमारी 30 अरब की एक्सपोर्ट फंसी रहेंगी और 80 अरब की इंपोर्ट करेंगे तो रुपया गिरता ही रहेगा uh dr asma would you like to add to it uh no thank you thank you okay last question yeah uh, dr rashad of strategic studies uh sir you rightly mentioned about uh, the true potential we have economically how the international environment players role like uh, uh, we have seen uh, in the post cold war era that uh, country like china india uh, they have transformed their policies and uh, more in line with the new uh, world economic order so what are the role of the international uh, economic environment or international environment play in order to achieve uh, or true potential or uh, what you have mentioned in your presentation. Uh, and the second question is you from, from you, sir. Uh, you talked about uh, the uh, geoeconomic. So we have the geostrategic compulsion, like we have issues with India, uh, then we have fragile Afghanistan, and then there is this uh, global rivalry between uh, United States. So in these geostrategic compulsion, how we can pursue uh, geo, uh, geoeconomic policy? सवाल पूरी तरह समझ नहीं पाया जियोस्ट्रेटेजी का शायद ज्यादा सवाल आई माय फीलिंग इज दैट व्हाट वी रिफर टू एज जियोस्ट्रेटेजिक रेंट्स हम पिछले 60 70 सालों से जियो जियोपॉलिटिकल जियोस्ट्रेटेजिक रेंट्स वसूल करते रहे हैं दुनिया से uh, अमेरिका से कभी चाइना से uh, अपनी इंपॉर्टेंस की वजह से कभी इस खत्ते में जंग हो जाती है uh, I think we would have to move ahead of those things now. Our uh, geo strategic rent shared future may have any number. Uh, jo reliable, the key is what the kitne mahino se mari IMF kesat negotiations shall ring a or what kitne her hafte dofte kebad, what goal post change karte rain. Nay se nay shrite samne ati rain. 
ये इस चीज की निशानदेही कर रहा है कि हमारी जो जो स्ट्रेटेजिक जो इम्पोर्टेंस हुआ करती थी वो शायद अब कम हो गई पहले उसके जोर के ऊपर मुझे याद है कोई पंद्रह साल पहले का जो प्रोग्राम था उसमें कोई बत्तीस के करीब वेवर्स लिए थे हमने आई से वेवर्स दिए थे कि आपकी कंडीशनैलिटी हम पूरी नहीं कर पाए बट बिकॉज ऑफ आर जियो स्ट्रेटेजिक स्ट्रेंथ हमें वो मिलते थे अब वो एक वेवर देने के लिए तैयार नहीं है ये सोच लेना कि आई के पैकेज का हिस्सा बन गए हैं या हम चाइना आके पाकिस्तान की इकोनॉमी को ठीक कर देगा या अमेरिका पाकिस्तान की इकोनॉमी को ठीक कर देगा किसी ने पाकिस्तान की इकोनॉमी आके ठीक नहीं करनी सवाए हमारी अपनी क्या तकनीक हर एक के अपने अपने जियो पोलिटिकल इंटरेस्ट हैं जियो स्ट्रेटेजिक इंटरेस्ट हैं चाइना हो जाए अमेरिका हो जाए दुनिया कोई भी मुल्क हो जाए ये काम हमने खुद करना है ये आईएमएफ की तो पिछले पचहत्तर साल की तारीख देख लें दे डोंट इवन हैव वन सक्सेसफुल एग्जांपल हम 22 प्रोग्राम उनके कर चुके हैं और 22 प्रोग्रामों के बाद अगर हमारी इकोनॉमी ठीक नहीं हुई तो तेईसवें प्रोग्राम के बाद तो तो रखना कि ठीक हो जाएगी ये काम हमने खुद करना देखिए अगर इफ देर इज अजियो स्ट्रेटिजिक इशू बिटवीन टू कंट्रीज वाई डज इट एक्सक्लूड अस फ्रॉम बोथ If there is a steel war between America and uh, China, America cut down. Do you remember the uh, trade war when they started the trade war? It was getting very serious. When America cut down the steel exports, China's growth started to get pulled down. Why not sell to both? I mean, we have to understand something. I mean, I I use the term strategic economics. that means you have to be strategic about how you're going to do something why do we uh, we are extremely extremely west focused all our trade only now have we started to look towards africa we have a very limited presence in south america our our products we have a negligible presence in southeast asia africa has a i'm, I'm not going to get into the numbers because it will take too long but uh if there is a problem between two countries in my assessment there's always a way to navigate we are too uh, in my uh, opinion we're too uh, mutually exclusive in our thoughts it's either this or it's this why not both um very quickly dr asma would you like to add to it uh, no thank you thank you i agree with my colleague okay um here uh, we uh, end this session um thank you very much uh, um, distinguished panelists um for educating us on the three very important topics um the three presentations uh, all of the three presentations um uh, covered the current economic situation of pakistan very comprehensively they not only explained the concepts uh, very comprehensively but also came up with the prescriptions for uh, stabilizing pakistan's economic uh, situation uh, thank you very much all the participants uh, for uh, your patience we can carry on the discussion on the lunch uh, the lunch is served uh, outside um uh, thank you so much dr asma for being with us
Uh, Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to every one of you. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is me, Larif Farhat. We're officially moving towards our last session for our two day national seminar on 75 years of Pakistan. The session, uh, our last session, is themed Media, the Fourth Pillar of the State. And today we're joined by an extremely uh, excellent panel. But that being said, I would now hand over the mic to our session chair, Dr. Mohit Pirzada. Over to you, sir, please. opportunity for all of you being present here uh, to offer my comments and to the panelists. I just want to basically set uh, initial comments and um, I'm not sure if the panelists would necessarily agree with me, but I just want to give you um, um, as a working professional uh, in media and someone who's also done civil services in this country, I want to basically give you a brief overview um, of what is the position of the media as a fourth pillar of the state has been in this country and why it appears so troubled. So when we say media is the fourth pillar of the state, what are the other three pillars? The other three pillars are the executive, which is actually the administration, uh, the judiciary, the Supreme Court, the courts, the session courts, um, uh, and the legislature, which is the National Assembly and the Senate. And when people worry about what's happening to the fourth pillar of the state, we have to see what has happened to the three other pillars of the state. And we have seen that in this country, um, the executive has dominated both the legislature um, and the judiciary, and for the greater period, for more than 50% uh, of the living history of this nation, it is the executive that has been directly running, either in the form of civil bureaucracy or the military bureaucracy of the country. And, and both the judiciary, um, judiciary were subordinated, um, and the legislature were either absent or were subordinated. So they didn't have any existence, so it's only uh, the executive that has been running the show. And, uh, and of course, the executive has been directly uh, pitched against the media. And the executive has displayed the capacity, the capability, and the will to penetrate the judiciary, to penetrate the legislature, and then, of course, to penetrate the media, to use it in its own advantage. So Pakistani power show is essentially a show of the executive authority and why it happened. Now, there is, in fact, a very interesting background um, to which many of you might not be familiar. Ambassador Saab is here and other people who have, you know, studied Pakistan's history. Uh, Hussain Nadeem is here. Uh, Patafi Saab is here. When Pakistan was created out of the British Empire, uh, British Indian Empire, in 1947-48, the, the political party, the Muslim League, didn't have any popular grassroots level roots uh, in the areas that constituted Pakistan at the time, especially the West Pakistan. And they had roots either in central provinces and united provinces in India, or they had roots in uh, the former East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh. And their political um, existence was mostly a reaction to the fear of the Hindu domination. So they didn't have any other political thought, philosophy, agenda, left, right, Marxist, socialist, improvement of the quality of life, thought of creating laws or something. Their only agenda was to fight a fear of the Hindu domination until the last end of 1946-47, they were trying to negotiate some sort of settlement for a, um, for a federal framework, for a loose federal confederal framework with Congress, which didn't work out. So these facts have been very cleverly hidden from the Pakistan study subject, that they were not necessarily thinking of a totally separate and sovereign state. Now, this is actually a bombshell, but if you look at the acceptance of the cabinet mission plan, it, it makes it very clear that till the very end, they were thinking in terms of a framework in which Muslims of India could, um, could have greater rights, freedom, local governments, and so on. So when, I'm, when Pakistan was created, this political party, the Muslim League, had no roots among the people in Punjab, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Balochistan, or Sindh, or anywhere. I mean, very limited roots, very insignificant. So very quickly, their authority was challenged. And so they didn't have any confidence to hold elections, to make constitutions, to go to the people. They didn't have any communication ability with the people. So the civil, powerful civil bureaucracy, which the English had left, which was called erstwhile Indian Civil Services, ICS, which became CSP at the time, Civil Services of Pakistan, very quickly started controlling the whole structure. So by 
within 12 months to 18 months, they were actually running the whole show. Uh, they started to displace the politicians. The 1955 Malvi Tamizuddin Khan case in which the uh, National Assembly or the Legislative Assembly was disbanded, dismissed, and then the Governor General was supported by bureaucracy and by the uh, Federal Court, uh, Munir, Justice Munir, uh, Muhammad Munir case, uh, is, a is a classic example of the fact that how the bureaucracy took the power away from the politicians. And then they felt so weak themselves because they also had no roots in the people that they brought in the military bureaucracy, so made the army chief as their defense minister by 1955. And then the military realized that if civil bureaucracy can run the show without any physical force, then we can very well run the show. So rest is history. So this is what happened in this country. So um, when you look at this deficit of political legitimacy in the Pakistani system, you can understand that media was either penetrated by the executive to be used against each other, which is still happening if you look at the current impasse, or the media has not been allowed to develop. So from the very beginning, uh, since English had left, in fact, a tradition, by the end of the British Empire, there was, in fact, a sort of a, uh, a tradition of some sort of expression. Uh, there were English newspapers, the other papers, they used to criticize the executive, they had left a tradition. So very quickly, the new state of Pakistan was loggerheads by 1950s, and by 1960s, there was a full-fledged uh, war uh, between whatever press Pakistan had um, uh, and the state of Pakistan, right? And which has never ended, which has continued to this day. The only attempt um, that has been made to um, give or to support the freedom of expression concept was made by a military dictator, General Musharraf, after he took over in 1999. That was also principally because of a man he was very close to. Uh, who, had, who was very powerful in ideas, and you, most of you are familiar with him. His name is Javed Jabba. He became a senator. He was an advertising agency executive, a media person, a writer, and an author. And he was a close friend of uh, uh, General Musharraf. So he impressed upon him the idea that you can create alternate political centers by encouraging uh, civil society or encouraging the media. So there appears a time period between 1999 and 2007 when the newly, um, uh, the, the newly created expanded media challenged the military establishment by other political interests penetrated into media, including the foreign interest, and they effectively challenged General Musharraf, and he also went on a crackdown against the media. And then the crackdown has never ended. So this is the, this is the kind of situation you face. So um, one last comment, and then I, because there is someone is also talking about social media. I think there is, can you hear me well? I think there's a lot of resonance here. Huh? Uh, Isko, I think, um, is it okay? Yes, I think it's it's better, perhaps. Um, one uh, last comment, because now everyone is thinking about social media. So if you look at the past six months or even before, the Pakistani state, uh, even the past four or five years, um, is, is referring to social media uh, as social media is an enemy, or social media has been used by the enemies of the state, by irresponsible people, and the whole focus is like, the fear of the social media, rather than looking at the opportunities which the social media uh, offers, um, um, uh, the the reality, the, the situation is very much mixed. If you look at others, yes, social media is seen as a challenge, but it has not been defined as the kind of challenge it has been defined in Pakistan. In Pakistan, it is actually being seen as a destabilizing factor, uh, and the opportunities. At the same time, the state managers have a very effectively. Uh, used social media, for instance, if you just look at the ISPR, they hire thousands of people directly and indirectly. They give them handsome salaries and they basically run their own and peddle the narrative um, uh, through, the, through the social media. But the state of Pakistan never developed. Um, I just have a meeting with Facebook afterwards, this, you know, and I had a meeting with Facebook last night as well. And I keep on meeting people from Twitter and others, like the, the, their managers. The state of Pakistan never developed, and Hussain, uh, one of your panelists, I mean, he knows this battle very well, that how Pakistani state never developed the, first of all, it never realized what social media is. So while it started developing in the past 20 years, they have never understood the challenge. They have never been able to develop a working relationship with the, these giants like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google, and whatever. They don't really have formal offices in this country. They don't really have a presence. They could not negotiate with them. Uh, all what to think is like 
they think that we are sovereign in this country, so we can switch off YouTube, we can switch off Facebook, we can bring these kind of orders. So con the, the result is this, that uh, these new giants, for instance, when you look, almost 3 billion people use Facebook. Um, I think 2 billion plus people use YouTube across the world. So these powerful platforms have developed their own laws, bylaws, system of thinking. Uh, I mean, Facebook is so complex. YouTube is so complex in terms of rules, regulations, and everything. And the state managers of Pakistan have been extremely incompetent. So they didn't understand what to do with it, except cracking down within Pakistan. So people from Facebook and Twitter tell me that 99.99% requests which they receive from uh, Pakistan is to block an account. They don't really have any other thinking except blocking an account or, or suspending somebody. So um, the opportunities of expressing the voice of the citizens of Pakistan, of empowering them rather than having a few newspapers and few platforms has been totally missed by the state of Pakistan. And state of Pakistan has not been able to uh, even present its point of view through the social media across the world. So it has also missed that opportunity. So I will look forward to, uh, to, the, to the, whatever the panelists have to say. Uh, and if there are any questions, I will also answer them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everybody. So, everybody. Good. Ek baja, jo se bhi I might actually sleep. Uh, ke baad bande ke hota hai. To isliye main khada raunga, to main jagta raunga. Lekin main chahunga ki aap log bhi jagte rahe. And let us have some exercise. Let me ask you a few questions. By the way, my name is Parof Pitafi. I'm a talk show host. I'm a journalist for 25 years, and I'm also a columnist. Uh, but uh, let me first of all ask you, how many of you have read a newspaper in past 24 hours? Raise your hands. How many of you have uh, seen a news channel in past 24 hours? Right. You don't have to include yourself. Exempted. No, no, forget. Um, uh, how many of you have opened a book in past 24 hours? How many of you has uh, have uh, actually con uh, concluded a, a book in past 24 hours? Okay. Uh, how many of you uh, have at least one news app in your telephone? Uh, that you use regularly. I will take YouTube as an option as well. Right. So that is uh, quite easy now. I know my audience and you can, again, I don't need to introduce myself in detail because they very kindly have actually flashed it there. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, title of the discussion or this session is fourth pillar of the state. We'll see by the time we are done with this discussion, whether it is a fourth pillar or not. But I was given uh, the uh, topic uh, that was uh, uh, contemporary media and challenges. From that, I'm going to actually conclude what is wrong with the media. On January 6, 2015, the Pakistan Broadcasters Association office in Karachi was raided by Competition Commission of Pakistan. Now, this is a very the Competition Commission is the entire monopoly organization. And Pakistan Broadcasters Association is the cartel of media owners. And they, they actually decide everything. The charges that actually led uh, to this uh, invasion were uh, that uh, the commission was setting, um, you know, rates for ad agencies and manipulating everything as well. So we are going to talk about this as well because this becomes a monopoly and an issue of monopoly. In order to qualify as the fourth pillar of the state, um, the media has to satisfy three basic categories. One, 
it has to function as a watchdog for transparency right acha jab aapke apne offices invade ho rahe hain aur uske andar se aapse document mange ja rahe hain to aap bataiye ki kitna zyada aap transparent honge the second thing is uh, it has to be an open forum for discussion and it uh, if you participate in it if you are a common man and you are participating in it then you can actually call uh, yourself a part of the media and then it becomes your uh, a forum for your voice the third one is act as a public educator now the question at this moment is when you look at the quality of discussion that is happening on television channels what kind of education are we being given i have done certain focus groups as well and in those focus groups what i have seen is amazing i have seen that in focus groups most of the people who have participated tell you that they have learned nothing main ye aap se puchu aaj ki aap mein se kitne log educate hue constitution ke bare mein aur sirf ye nahi hai ki wo char panch jo clauses hain unke bare mein baat ho सारे के सारे कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन के बारे में तो नन ऑफ यू विल बी एबल टू से दैट इट केम फ्रॉम और द एजुकेशन और इंफॉर्मेशन केम फ्रॉम द मीडिया वाइस सो यू नो बाय द वे दैट स्टोरी दैट आई ओपन विद दैट इन्वेजन और दैट ट्रेड ऑफ पाकिस्तान ब्रॉडकास्टर्स एसोसिएशन वॉज अमेजिंग बिकॉज द चार्जेस इंक्लूडेड दैट दे आर मैनिपुलेटिंग द रेटिंग एजेंसी एज वेल एंड दे आर ऑल्सो मैनिपुलेटिंग एडवर्टाइजमेंट Uh, but they have created an, a monopoly of uh, advertisement agency right amazingly seven years later we don't know what became of those charges all we know is that today uh, the competition commission of pakistan has become a schrodinger's cat it is alive and it is dead so maine aapko teen jo hai wo criterion bataye the educator ओपन फोरम फॉर पीपल्स वॉइस और तीसरा क्या था वॉच डॉग फॉर ट्रांसपेरेंसी वेन यू आर नॉट ट्रांसपेरेंट यू कैन नॉट बी अ वॉच डॉग तो जब ये सारी की सारी चीज आप देख लेते हैं तो फिर यू अंडरस्टैंड कि इफ इट इज अ पिलर ऑफ द स्टेट देन इट इज क्वाइट अ वॉबली यू नो पिलर ऑफ द स्टेट और मार्श मेलो का बना हुआ है और अगर किसी बिल्डिंग के अंदर एक ऐसा पिलर हो तो मैं उस बिल्डिंग के नीचे नहीं ठहरना चाहूंगा राइट सो वट एग्जैक्टली इज इट what exactly is the media is the media basically fourth pillar or then it is a business i think it is a business jab aap business kisi ki baat karte hain to uske andar do teen cheeze bahut important hai there are two angles two aspects one supply side the other uh, uh, demand side right there is a basic economy now the question at this moment is if everything is right why is it that uh, this country has no kids channel no children's channel it doesn't have any entertainment uh, in the sense ke filmo ka nahi hai koi documentary ka nahi hai bahut sare channels nahi hai but why is it that we have 50 odd new channels does it make sense does it acha ab uska business model kya hai wo bhi hum baat karenge but at this moment what uh, you have to look at at this moment is very simple that supply and demand are not proportionate here so there must be a third angle in it what is it distortion there are many distortions in the media industry and i'm going to actually one by one talk about those distortions as well because they are very important they tell you why do you have 50 channels they tell you why exactly is it that the quality of programming has gone down and at the cost of education of everybody right the first one and i am actually getting ahead of myself the first one is big money and i'm going to come back to that but before that let me also remind you why are we are here earlier dr mohit pirzada was actually talking about uh, you know uh, the whole thing that how the general musharraf actually decided that we are going to have channels uh, uh free media or independent channels at this moment when you talk about media you end up talking about only television channels akbaron ki baat nahi hoti baaki cheezon ki baat nahi hoti why exactly so general musharraf ke zamane mein do cheeze hui thi ek to kargal hua tha kargal mein indian media was killing us 
बिकॉज दे आर प्राइवेट चैनल बरखत दर्ज जाती थी जाके पहाड़ों के ऊपर खड़ी हो जाती थी और कहती थी कि हमने इसको रीटेक कर लिया दूसरी बात यह थी कि अगर आप डिक्टेटर हैं तो आपको अपनी सीवी भी बेहतर करनी है यू हैव टू शो टू द पीपल दैट यू आर एक्चुअली मोर डेमोक्रेटिक देन द डेमोक्रेट सो वट डू यू डू यू स्टार्टेड एक्चुअली ओपनिंग अप प्राइवेट मीडिया उसके अंदर दो तीन चीजें की उनमें से एक जो है वो गलती के तौर पर साबित हुई और वो था क्रॉस मीडिया ओनरशिप लेकिन उसके अलावा भी बहुत सारी चीजें हैं जो कि हम बात कर सकते हैं और फिर उसके साथ ये हुआ कि वॉर्न टेरर उस वक्त चल रही थी क्योंकि वॉर्न टेरर चल रही थी योर एंटरटेनमेंट इंडस्ट्री योर कल्चर इंडस्ट्री है टोटली कैप्साइज इट एक्चुअली सेट डाउन अब इस सारे के सारे सिचुएशन में वट इज हैपनिंग यू हैव मीडिया चैनल्स यू हैव न्यूज चैनल्स बट दे आर सपोज टू गिव यू एंटरटेनमेंट दे आर सपोज टू गिव यू न्यूज दे आर सपोज टू गिव यू ड्रामा they are supposed to give you humor as well comedy as well so an anchor's job becomes a mix of all these things right 50 channels just remember this thing because we are going to come back to this why 50 channels just keep on asking yourself the first distortion that i spoke about was uh, big money amazingly gold banane wale ghee banane wale bakery wale property wale and whatever exact does right they all actually jumped in why did they do it it can't be just for the sake of uh, uh, national service there has to be something more to it right what exactly was it there must be some angle to it there are so many people we keep on hearing that uh, in this country many people say instead of hiring a pr firm actually open a channel when you have a channel nobody is going to come and touch you because it is a power center right the second thing that is uh, important after this had happened was cartelization and monopolies i opened with uh, actually telling you about the cartelization of media uh, pba pba amazingly you have 50 channels but they have only one representative body that is uh, pakistan broadcasters association why so because then they can control the agenda right and that is not all there is another monopoly which is very crucial a uh, rating agency you have channels which are going to give you content but their content will be decided by the machines that are installed all over the country and those machines are called people meters those me uh, people meters are owned and operated by one company that is called media logic media logic jo hai वो हर घर के अंदर ये नोट करता है जिन घरों में ये लगा हुआ है कि कौन सा चैनल देखा जा रहा है कौन सा एज ग्रुप देख रहा है और क्या कर रहे हैं और उस सारे के सारे को लेके वो डेटा निकालते हैं वो डेटा आता है पीबीए के पास पीबीए वाले जो है उसको उठा के जो डेटिंग है उसको कंपाइल करते हैं और फिर उसके अकॉर्डिंगली आपको एड्स मिलते हैं यू कंट्रोल ऑल दी चैनल दे एजेंडा यू कंट्रोल ऑल दी यू नो एडवर्टीजमेंट एज वी हैव एस्टेब्लिश एट द स्टार्ट and you also control the ratings that is amazing and then these people meters they they are called people meter for a reason they have to be installed in most populous places right so where do they go most of them are concentrated in big cities for example karachi is the most populous city in the country so they have got the biggest number largest number of people meters what incidentally then what happens whenever you are going to actually talk about karachi you get a spike whenever you are going to talk about quetta nothing so why because hardly any people meet it there right so disparity is also there but manipulation is also there then after that prof- falling professional standards when you talk about media uh, when i started 25 years ago in a newsroom we used to have typewriters and we had to actually Uh, punch it through that the amazing thing was that at that time there used to be many layers of oversight people would be telling you ke kya karna hai aur kaise karna hai aur kya cheez galat hui hai aur usko theek karna hai ab wo nahi hota ab newsroom hai sare ke sare 50 channels mein lekin wo bahut chote se hain uske andar sirf sirf news ka content chalta hai uski jagah pe kya ho raha hai zyada tar channels zyada tar programs ke andar what you have is uh, what i call the infestation of talking heads 
एंटरटेनमेंट के सबसे आसान तरीका क्या है एक बंदा बिठा दे होस्ट के तौर पे उसको अच्छी तनख्वाह दे दें उसके साथ तीन गैस बिठा दें उन तीन लोगों को जज्बाती कर लें और उनको आपस में लड़ा दें जब आप लड़ाएंगे एक पूरा घंटा हो गया और उसके अंदर आपको एंटरटेनमेंट भी मिल गई उसके अंदर आपको अब सीनिटीज भी मिल गई उसके अंदर आपको डेटिंग स्पाइक्स भी मिल गई अगर किसी ने उठा के ग्लास मार दिया दूसरे को तो वाह हुई वो क्लिप आपने लूप पे चलाया खबरों में और देन योर डेटिंग शूटिंग थ्रू द रूफ अगर कुछ और हुआ तो फिर उसके अंदर जो है ना कोई गाली आ गई तो हमने कह रहा है वी कैन डैम इट वी कैन डैम इट बट वी कीप ऑन डनिंग इट सो दैट वी गेट एज मच आउटरेज एज पॉसिबल राइट दिस इज वट इज है मीडिया आई मीन दिस इज frankly the fact so this infestation of talking heads then uh, just let me count the people how many people then we are going to have on air uh, since we are talking about 50 channels 50 odd channels and they have uh, 8 o'clock 10 o'clock 11 o'clock that is your prime time at least these are the uh, you know time slots where you have an anchor a competent anchor right अभी आपने तीन से मल्टीप्लाई करें बल्कि आप सात बजे भी मिला लें तो चार हो गए दो सौ बंदे बैठे हुए डेली बात कर रहे एंड व्हाट एग्जैक्टली आप दे प्रोड्यूस इट आपने ये कहा था और आपने ये क्यों नहीं कहा राइट सो द इंटायरिटी ऑफ ए टाइम एंड योर टाइम इज मोनोप्लाइज बाय टू हंड्रेड ऑट पीपल फॉर एक्चुअली हुज जॉब एक्चुअली इज नॉट टू इन्फॉर्म यू दे जॉब इज नॉट इवन टू एक्सरसाइज पावर their uh, you know uh, utility is to actually draw attention away from uh, the real power that is the owner of the channel unka apna agenda chal raha hai na misal ke taur pe agar ghee ki kisi mill ka koi channel khul gaya hai to us ghee ki to jo hai na tareef hi hogi agar usne kitne bhi sub standard kaam kiye honge lekin uske to standard ko protection milegi na everybody will say ki yaar isko koi haath na lagaye kyunki iska channel aapke piche pad jayega similarly there is a property tycoon we all know about him i mean whenever there is any news report about the gentleman aapko koi channel nahi pick karta why because he actually doles out huge sums of advertising money and he has a investment in a couple of channels as well so this is the situation at this moment and then what happens because the quality of television is going down and because everything is becoming monopolistic uh, in the end when you hire people you have to actually hire a certain quota for example you have to have reporters you have to have os hires but they are hardly asked to do anything great what they are actually giving you giving you a substandard quality content now if you have employed so many people and if tomorrow because today Uh, as uh, our uh, colleague here will tell you about social media that social media is going to overtake uh, regular media and it is very quickly doing it remember i asked you ki aapke phone ke andar koi app maujood hai ya nahi zyada tar log jo hai 2 minute ka clip dekhte hain 2 ghante ka nahi dekhte aur wo sare ka sara aapke phone pe ho raha hoga aapke tiktok pe ho raha hoga aapke youtube pe ho raha hoga with all that in 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 your sight what exactly is happening then media has developed this glut which actually gives you this impression that everything is hunky dory but their ratings their revenue streams are actually diminishing what becomes of those hundreds of people that are hired by channels and <coughs> one by one all channels are closed down so that is also a big concern now what is the solution at this moment one you know uh, when you talk about media houses first of all we are a democracy we call ourselves a democracy the first thing is demand uh, transparency how do you demand transparency parliament ke andar standing committees hain wo kehti hain ki aap apne ratings apne revenues sare ke sare lekar aaye jab bhi hota hai standing committees ke andar koi na koi aur masla ho jata hai aur khatam kar diya jata hai so it is very important to keep on asking for transparency the second thing is technology aapko bahut sare log darayenge ki ji social media ke pata nahi society ko khatam kar dega aur sari cheeze kharab ho jayengi but that is not true they continuously keep on improving their algorithm at this moment you might be seeing a lot of people who are making fake news or fake accounts but they will gradually fade away <coughs> excuse me 
they will fade away because they are going to improve their uh, identity recognition software. With all that is, uh, that is going to happen in coming days, social media and technology is the best revenge possible because then it actually takes the, uh, the podium or the mic away from those who are manipulating you and it gives to you. I mean, uh, every program, every event, wherever I go, some young person actually comes over and talks to me that we want to be anchored. I say that you have to take your camera on your phone and start making your video on YouTube. That is the easiest thing possible, I know. Just uh, a minute or two. You can post your video and post it because that is the best way to actually monetize as well. Your followers are 10,000, so you get monetized. If you get monetized, you get money. And if you get money, that means that you cut out the bosses that might be there, right? So at this moment, it is important that you focus on technology. And there's a term called convergence media. Convergence media is the best thing possible. Audio, video, and text, all on one platform. That is your phone. That is happening all over the world. So if we have a regulation of the technology, so in the end, I assure you that all these manipulations, exploitations that are taking place, they will go away. So at this moment, the first thing, transparency, demand for transparency. Secondly, debate about media. The third thing that is very important is, uh, you know, allow technology to grow. And the fourth thing that one has to actually point out is that convince the state uh, against its own penchant to not become a target. Our state has the habit of actually dragging itself into controversies. Because of controversies, you know, these media houses actually divide themselves. They have this technique called newsjacking. They insert themselves as a party. And then what happens? One becomes a martyr, the other one becomes hero. And because of that, one channel might be blocked today, but tomorrow they return with more revenue streams. Right? So it is important for the state to understand that media cannot do much. All you have to do is tolerate and see them burn themselves down. That is the simple solution. Thank you very much. Hello and good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So. Actually, it's a lot of difficult to say something about this journalist. So just a clarification, I am not a journalist. Uh, my name is Bakhtavar Mahmood. I'm head of strategic communications at Pro Pakistani. Uh, so just so for people who do not uh, know, Pro Pakistani is Pakistan's largest independent digital publishers. We get a traffic of around like 18 to 20 million per month. And we try to create content that's uh, apolitical, but something that can improve uh, in making a greater understanding of the content and also in the consumption uh, of the knowledge for the general audience. Also, I am uh, I do create content. Um, I am an anchor person in the presenter but not a journalist <laughs> because it takes a lot of guts to become a journalist it's very difficult to speak the truth in this kind of an environment in, in a state like Pakistan where obviously you get uh, like uh, call off from your channel from your program within minutes and you literally cannot do anything um, starting off from my basic discussion um, why digital Google this word dealing with social media if you can just google it yourself you'll, you'll uh, get the first three contents dealing with social media anxiety, dealing with social media stress, how to uh, reduce your time on social media. These are the kind of words that you have to listen around when you like use this buzzword social media, because that's the kind of, um, that's the kind of contemporary thing that has been imposed in your minds that social media is something that's wrong, that's wrong to use, that's wrong to consume. And probably if I may just continue with the tradition, Mr. Patafi, then how many of you spend at least five, to six hours on social media daily how many of you you don't use social oh okay. so uh, whatsapp is included by the way because you're consuming a lot of information from these platforms uh first of all when we were saying that uh media is the fourth pillar of the state 
why aren't we talking about the fifth generation warfare? Why are we talking about the propaganda? Why are we talking about the other things that social media and media is doing at this point? Uh, conventional media, ki sari baate jo hai, me senior journalist ne kar di hai, I would want to your attention towards the things that we as uh, Pakistanis or pro-Pakistanis need to look around. We need to create content that, that is going to uh, represent us in, in the international world. Uh, I have been a member of the Kashmir Parliamentary Committee in their digital advisory board. I used to recommend Shariar with a lot of people over there uh, around the content that needs to be created around Kashmir and around Pakistan. So whenever we create anything around the sentiments that's going to favor Pakistan, we always got the shadow reach. Our content is not visible to anyone else. हम चाहते हैं कि हम मीडिया के अंदर रहते हुए सच की बात करें लेकिन सोशल मीडिया के ऊपर भी जो येलो जर्नलिज्म जिसको हम कह सकते हैं वो एग्जिस्ट करता है बिकॉज़ अगेन एज डॉक्टर मोहित मेंशन वी डू नॉट हैव एनी अथॉरिटी इन द ऑफिसेस ऑफ दीस बिग जायंट्स यूट्यूब फेसबुक एंड ट्विटर most of the owners and these platforms uh, in key offices jo hain they are they're obviously run by people jo ke apne aap ko multinational community kehte hain but obviously they are not they are run by people who do not like pakistan who do not like us to uh, to obviously excel in different fields um first of all i will say that uh, digital ka start kaise hua kaise kar sakte hain we call that digital is the future but mind you digital is the future but uh, the future is here already we are already very late we do not understand bahut se channels abhi bhi karte hain ki apna content jo hai 9 to 10 ka jo bhi show hoga 8 pm ka jo bhi ka show hota hai ek ghante ka program jo hai usko as it is social media ke upar dal dete hain and they perceive that probably it's going to work out no the consumption patterns in social media are completely different सर आपने मेंशन किया कि दो मिनट का क्लिप अगर देखना प्रेफर करेंगे इंस्टेड ऑफ टू आवर्स प्रोग्राम द अटेंशन स्पैन ऑफ एनी इंडिविजुअल हुज लाइक जस्ट स्क्रोलिंग द कॉन्टेंट लाइक दिस इज 13 सेकंड्स लेस देन 13 सेकंड्स सो 13 सेकंड्स के अंदर आपको कोई चीज अच्छी दिखी आप समझ सके उस चीज को तो यू आर गोइंग टू वॉच दैट इफ नॉट यू जस्ट गोइंग टू स्क्रॉल डाउन एंड दैट्स द रीजन के कॉन्टेंट नरेशन टेक्निक्स जो है वो टेलीविजन से एक घंटे के प्रोग्राम से 15 मिनट के प्रोग्राम से पांच मिनट के प्रोग्राम से अब टिक टॉक स्नैक वीडियो और वर्टिकल जितने भी प्लेटफॉर्म उस तक आ रही है बिकॉज दैट इज गोइंग टू बी द फ्यूचर जो भी आपकी कॉन्टेंट नरेशन टेक्निक्स है वो साथ साथ कंजम्पन पैटर्न के साथ जो है वो चेंज होते जा रहे हैं and it's just not ke ye general audience ke liye koi specific age bracket hai isme even i asked my father ke maine unke liye channel lagaya obviously ghar mein the news channel koi dikhta nahi it was for my father and he said i don't need to watch the television i have it all on my mobile phone so obviously um isko uh, is is pattern ko is technique ko samajhna bahut zaruri hai also uh, i i want to specifically talk about ke um jo content creation media ke hawale se ya political uh, stance ke hawale se is waqt pakistan mein ki ja rahi hai ये सिर्फ एक मजाक है इस वक्त कोई भी ऐसी चीज नहीं हो रही कि जिसमें हम कह सके नेशन बिल्डिंग या कंटेंट की कोई ऐसी चीज हो जो कि देखने के काबिल हो अगर आप लाइक आई हैव अ हैबिट ऑफ जस्ट वेकिंग अप टू माय फोन और मैं ट्विटर के टॉप ट्रेंड्स को फॉलो करती हूँ कि आज क्या बात हो रही है अगर वर्ल्ड ट्रेंड्स को आप देखें तो नई टेक्नोलॉजी की बात होती है नए रिजीम्स की बात होती है और पाकिस्तान के अंदर दो पॉलिटिकल पार्टीज हैं वो जस्ट क्रिएटिंग ट्रेंड्स अगेंस्ट ईच अदर वो कैप्शंस इतने शर्मनाक होते हैं वो ट्रेंड्स इतने शर्मनाक होते हैं कि प्रॉब्लम आई कैन नॉट टेक देयर नेम्स एंड दैट इज वॉट हैज बिन हैपनिंग इन द लास्ट टू ईयर्स जब से एक पार्टी जो है वो किसी के अगेंस्ट प्रॉब्लम को इनिशिएट करती है एंड दैट हैज बिन गोइंग ऑन फॉर लाइक गुड मेनी ईयर्स साथ में ये मैंशन करूँ कि जब हमारी पॉलिटिकल पार्टीज या हमारा पाकिस्तानी मीडिया जो है वो जेलो जर्नलिज्म से निकलता है हम ट्रांसपेरेंसी की तरफ जाते हैं तो सोशल मीडिया इज डेफिनेटली अ वेरी ट्रांसपेरेंट प्लेटफॉर्म आपके जो व्यूअरशिप है आपकी जो इंगेजमेंट है आपके जो इंस्टेंट रिएक्शन है बिकॉज वेन यू गो लाइव ऑन फेसबुक और एनी अदर प्लेटफॉर्म यू इंस्टेंटली गेट एवरी थिंग इन सेकेंड टाइम क्या the person or the, uh, the, uh, the audience what they are perceiving you get the instant responses unfortunately hum is cheez ko bhi sahi tarike se cater nahi kar sake eu disinfo lab ka ek ek propaganda expose hua tha last year most likely so our neighboring country india they were creating a lot of fake news they were creating a lot of content jahan pe pakistan ko as a terrorist nation declare kiya ja raha tha a lot of and jab sunishia fasad pakistan mein pichle 2 saalon mein kafi zyada hue 75% of the tweets which were against the shia community were uh, being generated from a city in india a lot of things 
that have been exposed and the world knows it and still they're not taking anything because we are not taking it seriously. Um, obviously, we, there, there's a lot of things that I would like to mention, but that the time is very limited. I would love to answer any questions as we conclude towards the end of our discussion. So can we have the next panelists? Thank you. I'm, I'm just going to sit here <clears throat> too late in the afternoon and I'm having a heavy lunch. Uh, the disadvantage of going in the last is already everything has been said. So, but there is also a benefit that you can tailor your conversation around something else. Uh, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to pull back a little bit and give you a more macro and meta view of how uh, my topic specifically fake news, disinformation, and narrative building. A lot of big words uh, sometimes mean very little. So let's start off with the story. I'm going to talk about two stories. One of the greatest ever narrative builder. And the second story is about the greatest ever narrative killer. So the first person, the narrative builder, was a guy born a long time back. And killed his father, most probably killed his father. We don't know that yet. Took over his government or an empire and decided that I'm going to literally throw everything under the ground that comes into front of me. Conquered half of the world, raised cities, prosperous empires, killed over a million people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet he's known as Alexander the Great. The question is, how did he get the name Alexander the Great? And why somebody like Adolf Hitler, Mussolini, A, B, C, D, E, F, G uh, are known for what they are right now? Why is Winston Churchill celebrated as the champion of freedom, etc.? While his counterparts, the people, the losing side, are considered the savages and the barbarians. So Alexander the Great, the narrative builder. Moid probably knows this better than I do. The reason why he got the name the Great from Alexander Philippe to Alexander the Great is because he called himself that. He had over a hundred historians with him traveling through his entire conquests and everything, filtering out everything that was wrong. That was for the locals to write about it. The winner was writing his own story, calling himself the Great. We don't know whether he won at Jhelum or not. Yet, even the people, the natives believe that Sikandre Azam was the one who defeated Horus. He's the hero, not Horus. So, narrative builder, he has been able over the thousands of years to tell you that he was better. And the modern Western civilization actually comes from Greece. And Alexander the Great and the Greek philosophy transformed into European and there on, there forward. The way we know about Alexander and the escapades is partly because of that. So, greatest narrative builder ever. I'll talk a little bit more about that. The second is the greatest ever narrative killer. Who is one person who has dismantled the biggest narrative of our human history with one telescope? Galileo Galilei. In 1633, the Catholic Church put him under a heresy trial for believing that Earth revolves around the sun. So for 1500 years, the Catholic Church believed, based on the scripture, that sun revolved around the earth and the earth was the center of the universe. This was the greatest ever. It was, it was like believing in God. And for by the way, 6,000 years, humans did worship sun as God, the sun God, etc., etc. This guy comes with his telescope, tells them, sorry, earth revolves around the sun. He's put under a trial. He loses a trial. And for the rest of his life, he is placed under house arrest where he dies. It took 300 more years in 1933 for the Catholic Church to accept that sun does not revolve around us, we revolve around sun. And his name was taken out of the heretics list. He killed the greatest ever narrative, which was there for thousands of years. What was the component? A telescope. Break it down, a technology. Break it down, evidence and data. What I'm basically trying to suggest is that when we look at the narratives, how they're shared, and we're living in very exciting times in Pakistan, by the way, so many narratives shaping, so many narratives dismantling. While a lot of it is political, a lot of it is charismatic personalities, et cetera, et cetera. 
much of it is actually to do when i was just on the other side at issi i was talking about entirely this subject from a tech perspective which is my other interest but over here because we talk about the narrative sciences at the core of it if you look at what has changed and what is happening right now it is the technology that is disrupting the core concepts and philosophies and the reference narratives of our lives what we were told for years and years and years is coming crashing down because of one thing there is a decentralization of information i remember in 1999 and 2000 when i was 12 years old i am born in 87 there was one state run broadcaster ptv raat ka 9 baje ka khabar nama 9:30 baje khatam uske baad raat ko military cool lag gaya to aapko subah se pehle nahi pata lag sakta tha impossible fast forward 2010 you have 150 private news channels saying everything and i remember back in the days in 2006 and 7 you still young uh, the politicians were panicking because those guys on motor bikes those silly ass reporters are now sitting on tv 24/7 defining the narratives and shaping human behavior usse pehle to narrative kaun shape karta tha press conference and press statement pe minister aake ab kya ho raha hai 2010 mein you have hamid meers you have mohit peer zada who have now shifted the power balance now these 150 channels are private run broadcasters setting the national narrative something worse happened or good happened fast forward 20, 10 years forward 200 2020 uh, from one state run broadcaster to 150 private broadcasters to 75 million individual broadcasters over social media a kid 16 years old waking up in the morning before he brushes his his teeth he wakes up and tweets and tells the prime minister and the chief of army staff how the country should be run there is nothing wrong with that the issue is he has a friends with all 50 60 70 followers supporting him in amplifying his tweet and that tweet is now a narrative the tweet directly goes to the top boss because there is no more file system back in the days the information would be passed on to the leadership military security political leadership vetted cleaned and only that was important the problem is the 16 year old kid is also on social media the chief of army staff is also on social media i'm not sure if he is but i'm just saying it out i'm pretty sure he has a fake account though <laughs> so he's also there now the consumer of information who should not be consuming every information is consuming every information an average and we did the data on this thing i think i already mentioned you an average minister right now as we speak is spending 4 hours on social media imagine 4 hours every day means that your input on consumer on your audience is coming from a very small echo chamber of who you follow and the people you follow are those that you actually resonate with so we're developing despite the fact that the social media and the digitalization has interconnected us within this connection and interconnection there is a big disconnect which has created and hence the issue of narratives arise so going back alexander the great as the greatest narrative builder and galileo as the greatest narrative killer four c's of narrative building one clarity clear comprehensible it has to be if you try to build any narrative it needs to be one liner beyond one life you can't build a narrative what do you stand for so clarity in narrative consistency whether there is a repetition constantly consistent narrative or not third thing is internal coherence whether the narrative you can't just say one thing on one side the other thing on the other side and here is where the social media has challenged back in the good old days of ptv and when the you know, there was print news a politician would say one thing at one end and few hours later he could be saying something else a month later he would be saying something else a year later he would be something else the issue now is you have video clips So, the current political mess that is there so when the charge allow me to quote the references from today's world when the charge is on pti that there are anti they are anti state their counter narrative strategy which is very effective is not that we are not they are pushing the clips of the p watch us of the pmln and saying look 
what is happening is that they are using the references the evidence the technology to actually crush those clips and presenting them and look so what do you want to do about these people who are not defending the other lot that they were criticizing before it's become a hot pot mess of narratives for every narrative there is a counter narrative for every counter narrative there is an alternate narrative and for every alternate narrative there is a new narrative it's a cycle it's a beautiful world it's a beautiful space reason why we are so scared of it because the traditional power structures are crumbling down we don't want to recognize it we don't want to accept it the existing power structures what we see the chaos that is right now in the country is not a result of because the power is failing and somebody is losing control they've already lost control the existing status quo has crashed what you see is the symptoms of that crash the inability and i'll give you one example i talked about how one state broadcaster to 150 and to 75 million just imagine you you the government and i've worked in the government i still work in the policy sector here is a simple problem you were trying to run as a government a nation a digital nation in the 21st century using the tools of the 17th century our bureaucracy with the mindset of the medieval age the tactics of it and you're expecting that somehow we're going to be able to win over the youth win over the women win over the nation and win over the world impossible you can try this for the next 1000 years it will not work you can tell who's actually on the winning side and the losing side by just looking at who has a better control over technology it does not matter what the narrative is and the last part of the four c's it was the uh, the starting was clarity coherence consistency and credibility how credible is your narrative and by the way of the four c's the least important is the credibility of the narrative and i'll give you one example what is the most famous postal code in our history it's 221 b baker street the b baker street the home of sherlock holmes now funny part is 221 b baker street in london is actually a museum where every year about 75000 to 100000 people visit pay 40 pound fees and generate over a million pounds to that museum the problem is there is no sherlock holmes character in real and yet people have an association the narrative is so powerful the story is so powerful it does not have to be credible so for the narrative to work it does not have to be credible it has to be the word is illuminating whether it makes you feel like wow regime change absolutely <laughs> yes so it has to be illuminating it has to like trigger some emotion inside of you credibility is actually gone i mean for 15 100 years and frankly the beliefs that we have right now are also pretty i mean you'll see in the next 10 15 years the technology is basically gonna ruin every single philosophical concept you had destroy and dismantle every single religious social cultural belief you had and by the time you there you probably realize that we we didn't realize that the world is a quantum world is already here the, the 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 evidence of what quantum is the evidence of human biology and very frankly speaking when you talk about genome editing and the abil- human's ability to create a life blue eyes 6 foot feet tall etc etc you practically become a sub creator if not a creator itself so technology is paving way for a future where things are going to be different why is narrative so very important and here is where i'm going to end it if you i mean you don't know alexander you don't know galileo the people who were there during their time didn't probably thought they were as great they became great over time it was a story it was a narrative if you remove the names and the physical bodies what is left are narratives at the empire state level at the level of uh, of nation and at the level of human each one of us the 60 people in the room myself my fellow colleagues we are all narratives in our physical form we'll be here for the 60 70 years what remains is the narrative and the story that is there a story of an empire a story of a nation a story of a human and those stories are built and the greeks were excellent when they understood the fact that narratives are the master so the whole greek mythology and the whole the tragic sensibilities of the greek 
that the biggest narrative to sell in history is a narrative two narratives the narrative of betrayal judas to jesus christ and brutus to julius caesar and the narrative of an underdog winning and there is no empire in the world other than the americans that have absolutely done the finest job in celebrating you look at the entire hollywood the movies and all of that they love the underdogs the underdog has to absolutely win in every movie because the narrative of an underdog winning and the narrative of betrayal because the underdog will always be betrayed by someone left and right it's the stories and the narratives that are at the end of the day the core fabric of your existence and we live in a world which is if you look at the meta narrative of the world it's an abrahamic world where for every nimrud there is ibrahim for every firaun there is a musa for every good there is an evil etc 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 that is the meta narrative that we have uh, david and goliath so the the binaries and we are so stuck in this narrative that for the foreseeable future and by the way this the technology the new tech development will break this entire glass ceiling as well and we'll have a narrative which will be so different that i can tell you one thing and i'll wrap it up from there we are living in one of the most exciting and beautiful times especially if you are reading stuff outside of our local newspapers a little bit of the... <laughs> they are making him an underdog so here is the thing and i'll end it at that we live in one of the most amazing times where the the reality of our tech r and d and i want you to listen to this carefully the reality of our tech research and development is more illuminating and stranger than the and then the fiction of our times you see what i mean our fiction is less illuminating than the actual tech r and d which is so far advanced that for us to even imagine because tech r&d has evolved so quickly that our human imagination has not been able to catch up which is why we live in a world which is not like it's so it's not a human led technology we're in a world where technology is leading the human and that itself and i learned it technology is the biggest narrative and the technology has developed its own ability to develop its own narrative its own story and its own reality so there is a physical world and there is a digital world and these two have become very distinct so narrative building and all of that i i think we're in a world where narrative building is not just an art or a science it is the merry existence your merry existence is a narrative and i'll just add one more thing because they asked me to on the fake news part look fake news was always there is here will always be here the issue is not really the fake news it is the absence of real authentic news which is the problem fake news is irrelevant will become irrelevant when the space is actually monopolized with the real news the issue is that the producers and manufacturers of real news the government itself when it becomes the largest manufacturer of fake news then you really have a problem so i don't mean blame the media houses and all the government has a huge apparatus if it is not transforming digitally if it is not producing the relevant data i mean you really can't blame the media houses for producing whatever they are producing they are very little in the larger narrative debate no social media actor no 16 year old kid can match the government separatists if the government actually knows their job better thank you so and <laughs> and for the job part i have a very funny incident on this so moib is recently hiring for its digital media wing general manager the requirements of that job digital media manager is a phd in digital media with a 25 years of experience elon musk does not fit on that mark zuckerberg does not fit on that i don't know who created 25 years back there was no digital media and they expecting somebody to do that job so you can imagine where the government stands on the digital media thank you <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much, Dr. Hossain Nadim, for such a brilliant uh, uh, overview of the power of the narrative shaping from the Greek era through the Churchill, through Alexander, and, and everything. Thank you so much. I met first 
Um, I met first uh, Hussain Nadim in Australia, where he had organized a conference in Pakistan. There was Sydney. There was Sydney. And I saw this huge talent. And I told him then that your place is Washington, not here. You should be representing Pakistan there in a think tank. You remember that? I've always yes, been. To... You went to Washington, <laughs> but then you came back here. And I told him that this place is far too, far too limited and restricted. It will restrict his intellect. And uh, I think you must have heard him. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I didn't interfere. I mean, a chair was supposed to comment on every, uh, every, um, uh, every talk. But I wanted to keep up the pace for the time. And this is a unique opportunity where we have been able to maintain the time. Uh, so very quickly, uh, thank you so much to Farooq Patafi for giving us an overview of the business model uh, and the industrial model and its deficits and weaknesses of the Pakistani media. That how the business groups that have no background and interest in the letters or the academics or the politics of this country they dominate the, um, I think there's something wrong with, them, uh, with the sound system is too large, right? But can you hear me at the, even if I speak from here at this distance? Okay. So, um, so he, he gave you, um, Patafi gave you uh, an understanding of how the industrial background of the businesses um, influences the direction they take and how these television channels are basically um, more economical PR firms for Pakistan's business groups that use these platforms for their own launching their own products and for maintaining a relationship of intimidation and fear with the executive in the country. So it's basically an engagement with the executive. And there is why, since they have no conviction at the end, the moment of crisis when the executive wants them, they all become puppies. They all become loyal. As you've seen right now, they don't report anything. Um, they just report what the executive wants them to report. And he also gave you the, how social media can help you to empower yourself and make money. Um, Ms. Maktawa uh, Mahmood was very, very brief, very specific, because she also mentioned that people do not have the attention time spent more than a few seconds or a few minutes. So she very quickly uh, gave you, and she also talked about the um, sensational captions that people use, horrible. But the problem is this, that unless you use the horrible captions, People, people do not click you. People do not want to read you. So um, I also welcome Ambassador um, uh, Eve Manuel, the Ambassador of France. His Excellency is here at just time. So thank you so much for joining us here. I'm sure that Ambassador Nadim Riaz persuaded him uh, to join us here. So I think we can open up for quickly for the session for the question answer and uh, introduce yourself and then really ask your question uh, and 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 address the question to whoever you want to address. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I am a research fellow at Institute of Policy Studies. My question is from Dr. Hussain. So I, it was a very well illuminated presentation. So my question is basically, uh, there are a number of factors in narrative building economy and your development and you know gdp and everything so what do you think what's missing in pakistan's narrative when we sell it when we try to sell it out to the world as you have worked on the carry logger and all of that uh, like in counter terrorism in other you know our national security issues what's the what's the uh, ticking point where we fail to sell our narrative to the uh, you know, the international community. Thank you. The real answer. The real answer for it. Real answer. I'm uh, on a notice period. I'm leaving every uh, end of next week. So I think I have the liberty to, <laughs> to give a little bit more unofficial answers. Uh, excellent question. The narrative of Pakistan. We have talked about narrative sciences, narrative in the last three, four years. The world has become so much that you talk to anyone, first of all, sharing bits and pieces of information and press releases is not sharing your narrative. That's a piece of information. The narrative requires an intention. It requires an intensity of certain feeling. It has to be coherent, like I mentioned, consistent. It has to present a particular story. So forget about the narrative, it is story. Let's talk about the story of Pakistan, which has been in the last couple of years, 
we've been blamed for playing a double game we've been playing blamed for being an extremist country terrorist country i was doing my undergrad in the us i was 17 when i first landed over there at the airport the immigration officer asked me whether i belong to a terrorist group or not i i mean i don't blame him he's probably watching the news and he has his own record coming up that somebody moving from pakistan between the ages of this and this is that the us drone strike and definitely the name hussain is also rings a bell the point i'm trying to make out of this is that forget blaming the west what they called us the new york times the guardian abcd whatever they call i really want to know what were we talking about ourselves during all those years did we have a narrative to tell did we have a story to tell unfortunately the power elite in this country repeated and in partly the, the the actually the thesis of my book which got published two weeks back is actually entirely about this that how a particular segment in pakistan continued to present the international community that pakistan was on a brink extremism people who are on the verge of extremism terrorism and all and if you don't support us these people are going to put on fire and remember tehran 1979 what happened over there that could happen in pakistan i'm sorry there is a disconnect the power elite the security the foreign policy elite has told a story of pakistan which serves their own purpose has served their own purpose which is not rooted in reality and i'll give you one more example of it for the last 10 15 years the same power elite the donor sector the development sector has been talking about one of the greatest assets pakistan has right now the youth how do they talk about it ticking time bomb youth bomb etc etc when it, when from the first instance when your framing of the youth is that it's a ticking time bomb you're looking at them as a ticking time bomb because you're not ready to invest and hence you're presenting the international community once again from islamist terrorist etc etc to now look so many youth jobless youth etc etc you don't help us we do the disconnect is in pakistan the reason why pakistan has not been able to tell its narrative and the reason why we are being blamed for whatever it is us is not because somehow american sort is that the french cs is that the, the german cs that it is because our narrative is not coherent every single foreigner that comes to pakistan realizes that oh you guys are normal and my response is what were you expecting i mean what are we supposed to be something because our national narrative is so divorced from our ground realities that a particular segment of the elite is talking about something else for its own foreign policy goals and advantages advantages than the reality and hence there is the issue of consistency the coherence and all of that which is why for the 20 years that we fought the war on terror we had no story to tell there is not a single narrative we have on the war on terror which was apart apart from the 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 narrative that uh we are the victim that we have been we've lost the 80000 lives we've lost 150 billion uh, dollars by the way 150 billion dollars even not a right assessment we lost upwards of a trillion dollars the whole miran shah mir ali have been raised to the ground still 6 6 million people are uh, internally displaced and the the psychological impact of the war that's not even let's not even count that so my problem is that that the, the problem lies over here in our inability uh, to to actually tell the story of what happened and why pakistan is a different country and all and i believe that the same thing is being continued to happen i mean you look at the titles of books published between 2001 to 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 this day pakistan a hard country pakistan on the brink uh, on the on the on the bridge of collapse this 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 sure that is a reality but that reality is only a very specific reality of a very specific segment that reality is not prevalent in the country i mean most of the people i know are very pro west pro 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 everything yes, sir. couple of lines here uh, but i don't care what exactly is their lead doing i've told you that they have vested interest and they'll keep on exploiting it right it is by the way called fota fear of the alternative if we fall but as T- tlp or ttp is going to take over and that's why i keep on supporting us keep on propping us up right but the biggest problem for me when i'm talking to you and i'm listening to the young people here 
is that somehow I feel this fatigue that you shouldn't have because you, your job, you're young, you don't have any baggage. So why would you think that the world is so wonky that you cannot even sell your narrative? I understand that when Kashmir, uh, you know, started, they started using pellet guns. There were pictures coming from Kashmir, right? And all of a sudden, people would actually post the pictures of those kids who were blinded and Indian uh, trolls would report them and block them immediately. What happened was that if you did exactly the same to an Indian troll, they would within five seconds come up with another account doing the same thing, right? We don't do it. We keep on convincing ourselves that the world is so broken that it cannot be fixed. And that's why it is a fate, fate company. If that becomes the norm, then we are all pretty gone because we have set and Otherwise, I mean, this age of technology gives you so many opportunities that you can conquer whenever you want. We are very capable people. We have survived despite all odds. And we continue to do that. I hope that all of you, the young people, realize this and they can become a force to reckon with. Thank you. Raise your hand, sir. Yes, over here on the right, and then we can come to this one. Thank you so much. Assalamualaikum, sir. My name is Osman Ali, and I'm from PIX uh, as an intern. So, my question is about social media harm. Sir, uh, a little while before this session, social media harms. Yes, a little while uh, before this session, I was watching the Twitter. There was a top trend that was against one of the journalists, Garida Proki, and G for something I can pron pronounce right here. That's typically disastrous for, the, for a nation. I know the people who run campaign for one party and the same bloggers run campaign for the other party as well. So these harms have been killing the inner self of the young people. So what are the take, uh, especially as to the Ma'am Bakhtawa, they have, uh, she, she has talked about uh, uh, the social media. It's, who is going to address these social, social media harms that has been killing the inner self of the people, for the young people, especially the students? Thank you. The question is that you're saying that you saw a trend being run against some journalists. Yes, sir. And you think that this is the social media harm, right? Is uh, this what you're saying? I was uh, I was witnessing this, these kind of trends uh, for the past many years. Uh, okay. You, you so can realize against the politicians, I, the, I, these I, things. Sure. You hear me now? Okay. So this is exactly what I mentioned in my talk that um, I see this every day and every second the trends are changing and one party is blaming the other party and the kind of trends and the names they are calling the other person is something very shameful that we cannot actually tell to the world. Of course, there are the problems that we need to solve at this point, but this is something that is not part of the social media. It could be on anything. If Pemra allows them to say these things on air, they're going to say. It. So social media is something that's just giving them the freedom to say whatever they can. And of course, there are a few people, um, as I said earlier, a journalism is a responsibility. It's, a, it's the biggest responsibility because you have to say, uh, to save the truth, of course, and then you have to face the consequences. But for the digital uh, content creators, I call them just content creators. They're not the journalists. They're, they're just people who have access to their mobile phones and then they can speak anything. Um, narrative is something different. Obviously, we cannot just conclude and say that this is being operated by one specific wing and they're trying to do this on purpose. It could be it could be that thing, but of course, um, it's just the mindset that's going to change over time. But uh, just try to ignore the noise because this is something that's not going to change over time, over years or even over decade. Okay.
recently said that Imran Khan, he tweeted that Imran Khan gave me 19 crore 57 lakh 27 thousand rupees for doing something or probably running some website. So if I send a notice to Raja Riyas, I would be wasting several months and years of my life paying the money to the lawyers. Nothing will happen. Hundreds of people have given notices to each other and the courts in Pakistan have not really done. If, if people make these defamatory false statements in the 20 leading Western democracies of the world, which I identify very clearly, there are only two North American, United States and Canada, 15 original members of the EEC, including UK, Australia, New Zealand and Israel. These are the only 20 in Israel. Remember this thing, Israel, Israel proper, minus the occupied territories. These are the only really functioning democracies in the world. Rest are all, including India and others, at various levels of semi-democracies and authoritarian regimes. But if in a genuine democracy, people do anything on social media like this defamatory, they will get a notice, they will be punished, they will be penalized, they will have to pay a certain kind of fine, and that is the end of it. So not to condemn the trends, the trends will keep on happening, as long as, as Hussain Nadim pointed out in his brilliant exposition on the issue, the problem lies with the failing institutions of the state of Pakistan. Look yesterday that two courts in this country have handed over a man on a political charge to police with massive evidence of brutality against a man who was asthmatic, and you've seen what happened afterwards, and two courts fumbled under executive pressure. So these are the failing institutions of the state of Pakistan that are responsible for 90% plus problems which you see in this country. It's not the youth, it's not the political parties, it's the institutions of Pakistan that are responsible for this failure. Yeah, yeah um, I understand that there are two parts uh, to the question that you have raised. One is, of course, uh, the anecdote that actually Dr. Sathya, uh, what covers it basically is libel laws and defamation laws, right? If you have institutions that are functioning properly, then you can, and the laws are properly, you can always go to a court and get some kind of relief. That is what happens. You know what happened in Fatahabad the other day, the girl? Had it happened in another if democracy? 50,000 rupees, the company gets a pay on 50,000 yeah, yeah, rupees. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the girl that, that actually, that episode that happened, right? You know, within days, that person would have gone bankrupt and the girl would have been really rich because she had a recourse, right? That, that is one aspect which is very important. The second one is the trends that you're talking about. How do they actually come into existence? You have to look at the nitty gritty, right? There are somewhere troll farms where people are sitting with fake accounts and they're repeatedly tweeting the same thing again and again. And that's why you get 30,000, 40,000 trends, you know, tweets that actually bring it to the main trend. That is today. It will change tomorrow. Two reasons. One, because most of these uh, organizations are based in the US and uh, there is a very vociferous debate going on about fake accounts and how it is damaging the whole system, right? Uh, and secondly, they're upgrading their algorithms as well, their AI system in Facebook and Twitter elsewhere. So within no time, it will disappear very quickly, right? So you don't have to actually worry about how it is going to impact the society in the longer run. Short run, I understand. You are insulting somebody, you are defaming them. But in the long run, this technology will take care of itself, right? So you don't have to worry about that at all. It is like water. Water comes, there's flooding, then it recedes. You don't have to worry about that at all. Thank you. So just one comment on this. If 10 people in this room start tweeting around one particular hashtag uh, and you just do this after a frequency of 30 seconds, you can start a trend on your own. So you can understand it's that simple. You just have to ignore the noise and work on whatever is good for you. Sir, a few years back, Pakistan was trying to uh, launch its uh, international channel with the help of Turkey and Malaysia. Uh, but uh, I don't know what happened to those efforts. So uh, why don't we like uh, to sell our own narrative? Why don't we establish our own international channel like CGTN? They are portraying internationally uh, to China, like China's good socialism. They're telling the benefits and fruits of socialism and BBC. CNN, like all those channels, they have 
they are selling their own narratives why don't we sell our own narratives through our own established international channel I had the pleasure to be part of the indus news network for some time uh, and this new whole setup that was being formed I mean, there are a lot of information that I probably shouldn't be delving, but I'll give a broad strokes of how we operate in any news channel or in any project in Pakistan. <clears throat> I'll give you one example of that. We're more than happy to spend about $5 million developing a infrastructure building and another $3 million on buying the equipment, but we don't want to pay producer more than 25,000 rupees because that is too much money to spend on a producer. Uh, in many cases, by the time you are done spending $5 million on the infrastructure, $3 million on the equipment, uh, there is a change in the political leadership, there is a change in the bureaucratic leadership, and you realize that it's probably not worth doing the project now because the board has shipped. Unless and until in the government sector, and having worked at the planning commission on projects, we don't get out of this contractor mentality of doing intellectual work. The, the media work is an intellectual work. You need creators, content creators, you need artists, you need developers, you need the talent. And put the talent under the open sky, give them a charpai and tell them to develop content from there. They will develop content from there like YouTubers have done. The problem is when the government goes for a project, like I said, they're trying to run a 21st century narrative with the 17th century tools and the medieval century mindset. It's not going to work. Not in the media industry, narrative industry, not in the development industry, not in security industry, in no industry. So you have to really upgrade how you want to do the project. So the failure is part and parcel the, 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 the project design. And I'm not sure how many of you interacted with the government, work with the government. The way our government undertakes project, there is no project feasibility in most of the cases. And the feasibilities that are there, the PC ones, they're checking boxes. They will put the copy paste materials that keep on coming from God knows how long. And then you start the project somewhere in the middle, you realize that, oh, we forgot to add an elevator in this 10 story building. And that was actually one of the cases in one of the buildings very close to this office that a whole sky ride was made without the elevators. And I was in the planning commission with Essenik Balsab then. We went for a review and we realized there was no elevator. And they said, oh, we must have forgotten. So they, this actually happened. This actually happened. You, you probably are also aware of it. They tore down the columns and added the elevator in it. It's the contractor mentality. Unless we don't get out of it, narrative producing and all of that is a long shot. But here is the thing. Like I said, we are living in a world where there is decentralized information. The government's nature, inherent design, inherent philosophy to centralize everything, the post-colonial state with the need to centralize everything, control the narrative, control is not going to happen. The government, the state cannot control the narrative, cannot control it. It can work in partnership on issues of relevant and importance, polio campaigns, the gender empowerment, uh, the minority rights. You have to work in partnership with the YouTubers, in partnership with the content creators, in partnership with the media houses. But the moment you get into that element that, oh, if just because I'm paying a content creator or a YouTuber some money, I own his life. And now he's going to say everything I want him to say. That's never going to happen in a decentralized information world. And for as long as the government is going to continue to try doing that, uh, it's going to continue to unravel itself, which I think it's doing very well by now. Uh, one of the communist party member is also uh, the head, one of the head of the media houses as well that controls the state media and that's how they are you know portraying themselves in which are established power china is a known country right a known yeah. power 
uh, similarly, I studied uh, RT in Washington, D.C., and they have their established channels there, right? Their offices, and they hired the local celebrity anchors to actually push their narrative. But they know their narrative. What exactly is our narrative? Who's going to come up with it? Our parliament, our executive, whosoever is, is not doing the job right now. I That's the problem. I can chip in through the What I'm struggling to understand, not on the domestic front, but on the external front. When I was living in the US, uh, in New York City, for six and a half years, I used to get New York Times every day. The rightmost column, the rightmost column front page was nearly every day dedicated to bringing something negative about China. Nothing changed. Kabi kabi column niche ajatata, but it was always there. Anti China sentiment. And it was being developed from 2000 to 2006. The same had happened to Russia in the US. So, Unone state and media and everybody projected these as their rivals and they thought, generally, they thought that the United States will have to face these threats from there. And therefore, there was not much difference between the state narrative and the narratives that media was projecting. Let me extrapolate that to Pakistan. Now in Pakistan, I think we have systematically uh, uh, been subjected to a narrative that Pakistan is not, is, is a double dealer in terrorism, in the war against terrorism, that Pakistan uh, runs with the hound and hunts with the hare and so on and so forth. And the idea stuck. Now, even if we do something good, there are always suspicions. No, no. Despite the fact that we suffered enormously from the war on terror, and yet this, you know, like the personal example you gave, it just doesn't go away. On the other hand, there is a success story too, where the media and the state work together. And that was that when the when the Chinese investment, foreign direct investment in CPAC and others was projected as a debt trap for Pakistan, I think by and large, by and large Pakistan fought it well. And their media and the state were together. And I think we were able to fairly and squarely dismiss that. In India, the state and media are, are in unison when it comes to Pakistan's policy, policy on Pakistan. And when the surgical strike actually did not happen, in September 2016, nobody criticized Mr. Modi that you are telling a lie. And they said that it has happened. So they could see very well, and you took all the journalists there, there was nothing there, but still they tend to believe them when it comes to Pakistan. So state and media have to work together in order to make it a complete success on issues on which there is a unit. Now, why it doesn't happen, I don't know. You guys tell me, but my sense is that the political divisiveness within the country actually does not let that happen. But you tell me and why isn't me, why is it that Pakistan's narratives, we are not able to mobilize the collective support of media and the state together?
Sunny's meeting in Colombo, sessions after session. And I and Ijaz Heather noticed this thing that when it comes to Kashmir and foreign policy, the Pakistanis were confused. They were not really speaking with one voice. They were split. But the Indians are speaking with one voice on foreign policy issues with when it comes to Pakistan. Pakistanis couldn't speak with one voice. So we went out for lunch and we discussed this, that why it happens. And we concluded in our analysis that since in Pakistan, the military becomes the, the government, right? Since military and civil services are actually the state, the judiciary. In India, the BJP fights the Congress. They don't attack India. Pakistan suffers from an autoimmune disorder. When state becomes the government, the opponents of the government start attacking the government and the state, right? So they lose the distinction between the state. So when you look at India, they have a very clear distinction of state versus the BJP, state versus the Congress or other parties. BJP is doing a mistake at the moment that they're aligning themselves and capturing too much space in the Indian bureaucracy, judiciary, uh, and the military, which actually will be problematic for India because it, it can create an autoimmune uh, disorder, which Pakistan has been suffering from 1950s onward. So, so that is why the Pakistan's leading publications, so they suspect everything that everything is being done by the executive and by the military. And if you look at the dawn, it has a very clear anti-establishment position for the past almost 15 years and same for the other thing. So anything that goes wrong in this country, the people from all sides think that somehow or the other, the state and the military has something to do with it. So Pakistanis cannot create a uniform, coherent, agreeable narrative, whether it's on Kashmir, China is only one thing. I mean, we, we don't have any agreement on Saudi Arabia. We don't have any agreement on anything. China is the only factor on which we have been able to maintain a consensus. If that television channel, which was suggested in Imran Khan, government, Malaysia, Turkey, and Pakistan, it couldn't go ahead because of differences and other issues and perhaps Saudi, Saudi fears as well. But had the project gone ahead, the Turks and Malaysians would have totally dominated the platform for the reason that they have been harnessing, especially the Turks in the last 20, 25 years, have harnessed tremendous media muscle and potential just like the Indians, you know, the Ak party was very clear that they need a narrative connected with the Ottoman glory, majesty, and you see every single soap opera that comes from it. I mean, all of this is focused on the majesty of the Turkish civilization and all that. And Indians are, have a far greater narrative shaping ability than China has. China has more financial muscle. It is 17, 18 trillion dollar economy. India is only $4 trillion economy. But look at the India's footprint. Um, uh, across the North Atlantic civilization and look at the power of the Bollywood and everything. So, so it is to do with the skill set. We don't have a community. We don't have the human resource potential. While our diasporas across North America and UK offer a lot of potential in international languages, we do not have any managerial ability to bring them on one platform. And then our state managers who are not very highly educated, they, they try to present themselves as very educated and intelligent, but they try to bring, as Patafi repeatedly asked the question, that what is your narrative? Our narrative is medieval. We are trying to basically sell a medieval narrative to 21st century uh, audiences, whether it's on Kashmir, whether it's on... Um, what does this TLP thing? Where does this TLP things come up again and again on our streets? I mean, we have been told 10 times that we have nothing to do with this TLP. And now we know that who has to who has to, to do everything with the TLP. Where this TLP comes up from every now and then. Here the acting French ambassador is sitting over here. He has been fooled many times by giving strange explanations of TLP. Where the TLP? Every one of you knows where TLP comes from, right? How can we sell TLP? I mean, this is what the problem is. Yeah, but, uh, he was talking about uh, division within the state. But I want to talk about the temporal, uh, you know, differences as well, because it is quite intriguing how our priorities keep on changing. Remember 90s, I'm giving you one example, domestic example, and then we can actually project it internationally as well. MKM was banned in 1990s, right? Then General Musharraf's time comes, and it is so dominant that if I sit on television, and offend their sensibilities, Pembera is sending me notices and fines without even hearing me, right? And then all of a sudden it has disappeared again. Now let us talk about international, right? 
Kashmir, that is one thing where uh, we very uh, proudly say that we have actually stuck to our guns. What was our narrative during General Parvez Musharraf's time on Kashmir? Independence of Kashmir, plebiscite, or you know all that making LOC irrelevant, right? Nawaz Sharif's time, other people's time. So you keep on changing or moving the goalpost so much that I cannot actually decide what narrative is and what to sell. Today I'm selling it. Tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to be embarrassed because then I have to eat my words, right? Uh, Ajmal Kasab. One day, this gentleman is uh, uh, Zaid Hamid is telling us and he's Hindu and all that, right? The next day, our interior minister actually stands on the podium and says he's ours. Yeah, a national security advisor, I'm sorry. Yeah, so if you keep on changing the goalpost, this is what is going to happen. How can you sell anything to anybody if we don't know what exactly our paradigm is, our map to the future is? One more element I want to add in this is the uh, information gap and the access to information. And I strictly come from the academic and research side on this. The, the foreign academic and the researcher has a lot easier time getting access to your top leadership in the national security side and the foreign policy side than the local researcher. What ends up happening is that over the last 20 years, much of what has been written about the Pakistan's foreign policy, security policy, war on terror, and the interviews is written by Cohen, Cole, Christian Fair, ABCD. How many writers actually from Pakistan have written in the international forum about this? And if they have, what level of access they had? I mean, most of us are from the system over here, and we know that the access to information, for instance, in Balochistan right now is struggling a lot. It's very interesting that anything that happens in Balochistan and attack right now, before it is reported in Pakistan's social media and media space, the news actually gets out from the Indian media. The reason because they have much deeper embedded narrative uh, uh, data points over there that provide them information way before us. Remember when the Jinnah's statue was uh, desecrated in Gawadar? The news was broken by an Indian account, not a Pakistani account, because we've censored our information in Balochistan. So no researcher, no media house has any information yet because India has developed over the years, very strong embedded ties within Balochistan, certain groups, they get information a lot quicker than us. So it's the information gap, the technical issue, why our narrative is not coming out because the people writing on us are not us. Somebody else is writing our history and our reality, and that is where the problem is. Take one more question. Uh, uh, then we can wind it up. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the discussion session. Very informative, especially the narrative building aspect and all that. The current onslaught on the media. Do you think the fourth pillar would survive or capitulate? The, on the current onslaught on the media, uh, the way we see it now, will the fourth pillar survive or capitulate in the near future? The media's fourth pillar, that's the topic of the today. Uh, um,
fully disagree with this point of view that there's going to going to be some kind of revolution that is imminent. Uh, you know, somebody, they, they say that somebody asked a poet, some say, Faz Ahmad Faz, Pakistan bachega ya nahi? Pakistan, will Pakistan survive? He, he said that I'm not afraid that this country will not survive. My concern is that this country might survive the way it has been surviving so far, right? And it may carry on in that way. Uh, this uh, onslaught on media that you talk about is not new. Uh, I, when I started media uh, journalism, uh, uh, they, they were, uh, you know, they were attacking the news at that time. And it had the paper that I used to work for, it had been reduced to four pages. And every time we had to actually prepare the paper, then we would receive a call that you have to come back because once again, they have taken the news patent and you have to produce a shorter version. Then Geo, now air wire. That is not new. It continues, right? So similarly, might... similarly, the state of Pakistan itself knows how to actually take care of these things. The only thing is that we get flooded a lot because this time it might be happening to me. It might not be happening to you, right? The only problem is why should we act? Why should it come to this? Why shouldn't we resolve our dis differences in a better way? So that there I agree with Dr. Saab. That so, could have actually, may, with, with my apologies to Ambassador Manuel, I have to speak in Urdu because my English is not understood. So the concept is far too difficult. My English is deficient to explain this. Pakistan's financial sovereignty is the IMF, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, has been going for many years. Now we see fully well that the IMF tells us what to do. We are also telling us how to handle bank accounts, 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 how to handle bank accounts. People do not understand, those who are not keen students of history and international relations, they do not understand several concepts that are running. So in the last 10, 15, 20 years, for instance, 9-11 ho gaya, Afghanistan ki jung thi, 1970, useless jung just now shamal ho gaya, against the Soviet Union from 79 and to 80. With every such blunder, we have lost our sovereignty and a foreign po policy person, like an ambassador, as Al Sayyid can understand this, ki jo sovereignty in 1950s mein thi, wo sovereignty is hamari 1965 ke baad 1971 ke baad hamari sovereignty shrink hogi to sovereignty transfer hoti chali gayi kahin aur 80s ki jo sectarian warfare humne paida ki shia sunni qadiani md isko maro usko maro so we lost more sovereignty 90s ki jo fragmented politics thi do do saal ki hukumatein chali we again lost sovereignty 911 forced us to make more adjustments we again lost sovereignty now our ability to negotiate in 1990s with india was far superior when nawaz tried negotiating uh, when I say this, I Nawaz ki tarif kar deta hon, to log itne shallow hain ki wo samjhte hain ki I've suddenly got a paycheck from Nawaz Sharif. So I ye kya? When Nawaz tried negotiating uh, before the Kargil, uh, investor would understand what I'm saying. Pakistan had a far greater, tremendous capacity to negotiate on self-respecting basis on Kashmir, and we would have found some sort of self-respecting solution for Kashmiris and for Pakistanis when Vajpayee Sahab, I, or unho ne pehli dafa being the Hindu Nationalist Party. Menare Pakistan pe khade hoke affirmed the integrity and the sovereignty of the state of Pakistan. So that was a huge moment. Lekin humne phir childe sharkat kar di and we, we lost that because we didn't understand the process of history. Lekin wo hum kehte wo yeh hai ki hume itna pata hai ki kisi ko nahi pata. Okay? Uske baad then 9-11 ho gaya, very troubling, huge subject. Musharraf agar kar leta wo four point pe successful India ke saath. So hum phir ek achhi deal hume mil jati. When, uh, when Moody came in 2015, uh, to, to Lahore. That was our last opportunity of getting something out of Indians on a sovereign basis. We again lost it. Patan Kot ho gaya. No one understands kya hua. We, we lost that opportunity. Ab hamari iswakil sovereignty jo hai wo shrink ho gaya baut sada. Ab hamari institutions jo hai they can become they, they're, they're becoming a police force upon us. Ham apni sovereignty ke liye awaz utha rahe hai. Hamare institutions dusro ke hath me jare hai. Kahi wo IMF ke hath me jare hai, kahi World Bank ke hath me jare hai, kahi wo United States ke hath me jare hai, kahi wo European Union ke hath me jare hai. Hum apne hi geographical territory ke andar gulam ban ke chale jare hai. This is what is the problem. And if you are a keen student of history of the 3000 years and in international relations, tab aapko is cheez ki samaj aayegi that how our sovereignty is shrunk. In 1950s, Pakistan ko kaha gaya, Korea ki war me, 
کہ آپ اپنا اپنا روپی ڈیپریشیٹ کر سر آپ کو یاد ہے ہم نے کہا نو نان سینس اینڈ وی گریو بائی ٹین پرسینٹ از دیٹ رائٹ سر کورین وار میں پاکستانی اکانمی واز دا فاسٹسٹ گروئنگ اکانمی ان دا ہول ورلڈ وی گریو بائی ٹین پرسینٹ ہم نے کہا ہم اپنا روپی ڈی ویلیو نہیں کریں گے یونائٹیڈ اسٹیٹس وانٹیڈ اس ٹو ڈی ویلیو اور روپی سو دیٹ کہ چیپر گڈ جو ہیں فورسز کو مل سکیں کورین تھیٹر وار میں ویئر یونائٹیڈ نیشن واز فائٹنگ دا چائنیز سو یہ کسی ایسے لوگوں نے آ کے سنبھال لیا ملک کا سارا نظام کے تام جن کو سمجھ ہی کچھ نہیں آ رہی وہ فارن آفس بھی رن کر رہے ہیں وہ میڈیا بھی رن کرنا چاہ رہے ہیں وہ گورنمنٹ بھی رن کر رہے ہیں دس از ویئر دا پرابلم ہے سر مجھے چلنا تھا everyone please settle down uh, we now move towards the end of the session i would like to invite mr arish khan for a concluding presentation and then miss uh, mr ambassador azaz choudhry for his concluding remarks thank you so much بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم سر انکلوڈنگ دس سیشن وی ہیو ہیڈ اے ٹوٹل آف ایٹ سیشنس ان دس سیمینار سنس یسٹر ڈے اینڈ دا ہیز بین لاٹ آف پروسیڈنگس گوئنگ آن سو وی تھاٹ اٹ وڈ بین دا فٹنس آف تھنگس ٹو گیو آل آف یو اسپیشلی یو سر چیئر آف دا کنکلوڈنگ سیشن سو دیٹ یو فار یور ریکارڈ opening session. uh let's flash the or can i can i do it from here okay so here are the key takeaways from the opening session uh which was chaired by uh senator mushahid hussain said pakistan has liberated us not only from colonialism but also from caste based social system of india qaidazam was aware of the role of youth and women in a society and mobilized them for pakistan movement Pakistan has played an important role in some key historic international developments such as Sino-US rapprochement and of Cold War global war on terror. Then we move on to the recommendations from the opening session. Uh, the recommendations are inculcate confidence among youth about Pakistan's future, prioritize quality universal education in Pakistan, promote a political culture of tolerance develop rule of law then we had the first uh, plenary session uh, of the two day seminar that uh, was titled historical perspectives uh, the key takeaways of the session are pakistan had to face multitude of challenges in its formative years such as kashmir dispute division of resources and assets refugees loss of founding leadership dealing with an oversized adversarial neighbor but pakistanis were able to tackle these effectively so here is oh sorry so here is a list of recommendations from session 1 pakistan has progressed despite adversity and we should be proud of our achievements 
strengthen democratic institutions, promote unity and diversity, educate the population, promote quality values, instill nationhood in our youth. Then, sir, we had the next session on non-traditional challenges to national security. The key takeaways of the second session are as follows. Climate change remains a formidable challenge. Although Pakistan has made significant strides in food production, yet population pressures, low yield per acre, and challenge, challenging um, are challenging its food security. Deforestation, greenhouse gas emissions, shortage of water, melting of glaciers, rise in temperatures is affecting agricultural productivity. Strength of monsoon is rising because of the increasing difference in temperatures of the ocean and the land. Climate change could force greater migration from rural to urban areas. 18th amendment has complicated coordination. Now move on. Now we move on to the recommendations derived from session two. Educate the masses and parliamentarians on climate change, ensure congruence of policies among provinces and between provinces and the center on climate change. Prioritize the establishment of climate change authority, formulate focused long-term and consistent climate policies, fully equip the Met offices at the central and provincial levels, promote regional cooperation on climate issues. Our third session yesterday was on Pakistan internal. Here are the key takeaways of session three. Pakistan has progressed despite some major internal challenges, including governance issues, low quality education, implementation of rules and uh, low quality education, implementation of rules and regulation and equitable speedy justice. Maintaining sustainable growth has remained a challenge. Democracy has progressed, but there is a need to resolve long, long festering political disputes. Terrorism remains a challenge. Poli police is the premier law enforcement agency and its responsibilities cannot be undertaken by any other institution. Coordination among provinces requires improvement. The society needs to be integrated where tolerance and non-discrimination are essential element of justice. Session, uh, and did I go back? Am I on the right slide? Session three. Yeah, session three. Uh, so here are the recommendations from session three, uh, which was uh, Pakistan internal. Uh, am I on the right slide? Yes. Uh, manage, manage the population of the country to be at peace with itself through education and responsible media. Allow and encourage critical dialogue with the society. Prioritize reforms of the criminal justice system. Empower the police to effectively undertake their responsibilities of law enforcement. Refrain from giving police authority to inst policing authority to institutions other than the police. Remove the hurdles in coordination between the federal, provincial, and local governments that obstruct their progress. Our fourth session, uh, which was this morning, was on foreign policy of Pakistan. Here are the key takeaways uh, of the fourth session. Pakistan is geostrategically important. Geoeconomics and geostrategy go together. Foreign policy challenges include balancing relations between US and China, improving relations with India, recalibrating relations with Russia, tackling Afghanistan, outreach to the Middle East, and terrorism external as well as internal. The recommendations that we derived from session four were as follows. Make foreign policy consistent and the process transparent. Follow national interest and refrain from becoming a part of block politics. Improve relations with China and the US, which remains a delicate balancing act. Evolve clarity and political consensus on relations with India. Expand relations with Afghanistan. Improve regional outreach and reinvigorate SARC recalibrate relations with the Middle East. Our fifth session of the seminar was on the economy of Pakistan. So here are the key takeaways of the fifth session. Pakistan's current GDP and exports are below its true potential. High fiscal deficit and trade deficit are leading to higher borrowing. 
The economy has funding and policy implementation gaps. There is a lack of consistency in policies because of interference of vested interests. The provinces are unable to utilize their development budgets because of capacity issues. So here are the recommendations that we derived from session five that was on economy of Pakistan. Implement a fiscal, co fiscal coordinate cons consolidation plan, develop an economic growth strategy, formulate stable and far-sighted policies, encourage public-private partnership and reduce government's footprint, improve legal and institutional frameworks, improve skill set and quality to enhance exports, improve the narrative of Pakistan to invite FDI. And it's the, the last uh, plenary session was media, the fourth pillar of the state, which just concluded. Okay, so here are the, uh, the key takeaways. Media in Pakistan has progressed over the years. Consumption patterns, that is demand, determine the media content, that is supply. Media houses are susceptible to malpractices and cartelization. Narrative building requires control of technologies and information dissemination. Effective narrative building requires clarity, consistency, coherence, and credibility. So the recommendations that we derived from the last session were bring about transparency in the media houses, develop and promote technology, make better use of social media to diminish manipulation by large media houses, build narratives in national interest, reach out to the youth for better projection and narrative building. We're done, right? I uh, thank you all for being here for the two days and uh, attending this two day seminar. Um, in the end, I would uh, conclude by saying that we might be having failings. Pakistan might not be perfect, but we have come a long way and all of us need to appreciate that a lot of progress has been made in the past 75 years. And that is what was captured uh, in yesterday and today in all these six sessions. Um, so we need to be mindful of this and we need to be thankful for having this country. Uh, may Allah bless Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arish Khan, uh, for a wonderful presentation. Now I would like to hand over the floor to Ambassador Azaz Ahmed Choudhury for his concluding remarks. Thank you. This uh, program uh, to mark 75 years of Pakistan's life as an independent country. Um, six working sessions. Thank you, uh, Arish, for uh, explaining to us the key narratives, key takeaways, and the recommendations that you gave. I'm especially impressed about the last session because you hardly any had any time to jot them down. Uh, but let me start my own uh, sharing my own thoughts by picking up from where you left. And I think uh, I agree with you that uh, uh, at a time when we are 75 years old as a country, um, we must remember that we had a very modest start in 1947. There was literally no government infrastructure at all. Uh, there, were, uh, there was hardly any industry, perhaps one textile mill in the whole country. And uh, we had no finances. We ran into trouble getting our shares of treasury from India. Uh, even the waters, canal waters uh, were blocked in April of 1948. And then of course, uh, the Kashmir dispute erupted and uh, spoiled relations with India uh, ever since. So, and with that preoccupation with security became the paramount concern for Pakistan. So people ask, why did we become a security state? Perhaps this, the, the answer is in the origins, in the circumstances in which this country was born. But in many ways, I agree with you, Arish, in many ways, we have progressed in almost every domain. Um, a fully developed government infrastructure is there, a robust armed forces are there, we have nuclear capability, 
reasonable levels of industry agriculture has kept pace with the uh, with the you know stupendous growth of population though we could have still uh, done better and uh, my sense is that we're also making reasonable progress in the it and other sectors um, yet during all these three years there were a score of missed opportunities for us uh, i remember and i'm sure you all do that in the 50s and 60s pakistan's development plans were cited as a role model for developing countries and uh, east asian nations uh, uh, owned those plans and then look where they have reached uh, but we have lagged behind so uh, we could have done better we didn't so let me recount some of our main shortcomings i'm sure many of these were also pointed out here the first and foremost that i rank i have a hierarchy of them the first and foremost is political instability and i think uh, we could not even if even forge a consensus on having a constitution for many many years after independence uh, and then our democratic process was repeatedly interrupted by uh, military interventions uh, and as a result uh, till today we are constantly in that vicious cycle of political instability our economy has also underperformed uh, because of mainly because of political instability but also weak institutions um, people mentioned judiciary even establishment's role and uh, and now media too um, our economic policies have been uh, discontinuing every few years and i think that has uh, had a uh, you know effect on the investors uh, moving away from pakistan both domestic and and foreign investors cartels emerged because they thought there is not much rule of law so we can get away with it look at the prices of ab maine ghar banana hai to wo cement ki prices hai to you know within two years they can quadruple excuse me is there some a state somewhere to do that so i think economic underperformance has been one big uh, you know uh, corollary of what has happened in the last 5 years 75 years then societal disharmony uh, be it ethnic or sectarian and political divides muhit pirza the sahab was even uh, cautioning about the ethnic divide that might be uh, uh, you know on the brink somewhere Uh, militancy and extremism and i have seen a very strange kind of phenomena sometimes there is a sympathy for militants and extremists look at the murder of uh, governor salman taseer so you know you have a, a a serious problem at hand and then we have untrained human resource it's a huge youth bulge youth bulge but we if we don't train them well it will be a liability if you train them well of course they will be an asset but uh, are we doing that and then of course unbridled population growth uh, i remember once i was giving an interview and uh, i was talking to somebody and that producer was sitting there and we i talked about population you know not control but you know managing our population and the and the gentleman was very upset that producer and he said that i don't agree with your philosophy every child brings his own risk and i said okay how many do you have I, he said eight and uh, i suppose eight and counting so, uh, so you can, i i asked him how would you okay you can feed them but how would you educate them and how would you clothe them and how would you send them to schools anyway this is going forward what is it that we can do our primary focus in my way in my opinion should be to find ways of political stability honestly and continuity of economic policies if it requires a grand national dialogue between all stakeholders so be it uh, second we should i think focus on our agriculture and agro based industry that's that's where our uh, comparative advantage is and our potential is grimly underutilized another area to focus on is it where there's huge potential and our youth can be engaged more optimally there Uh, i was just uh, there was somebody uh, who mentioned that uh, they are digitalizing the information for farmers 
on agriculture, you know, when to give uh, uh, fertilizers and, and things of this sort, something that India had done and which can actually increase your agriculture output many fold. And, and, and I invited him to give us a briefing because he says that 60% of the work has been done and they're reaching out to the, to the farmers now. Uh, and that I thought was a, a, was a way to go. Another area, industrialization, I think is important. And I, I have been saying this, that we should change our attitude towards industry. I remember when Ayub Khan, uh, and there was a protest by Bhutto against Ayub Khan, he would constantly say, uh, 22 families have robbed this country. As a result, all those industrialists ran away along with their money and you got nothing. And whatever was left, you Sulfakar uh, Bhutto nationalized the whole thing. So that mindset, that industrialist is always, uh, uh, you know, usurping your rights, is something we need to really get get out of. Um, I think in in China they made progress because they honored the industries. Because if an industrialist makes another industry, and he can make that because he has the money and he has the expertise, then he'll be feeding six hundred families. So what's the big deal? Because if you don't do that, in any case, he has the capacity to take that money to Dubai and, and buy half of real estate there. So I think that I think that aspect is also uh, important. And then non-traditional security threats, especially climate change and environmental degradation. I, I think it was very aptly covered uh, by one of your sessions. Today, all these change challenges are reinforcing each other. So we must find a way out. Uh, how do we do that? Internally, I believe, and Pitavi Sahab will probably, uh, he may even already have done a session on it. We should have a grand national dialogue. And that dialogue should not be only among the political parties. I think our institutions, our establishment, our bureaucracy, our judiciary, everybody has to sit in and, and formulate a political, economic, and social compact. Um, we have a we have talks of charter of democracy. We have a we have the talk of charter of economy. But I think you need a much bigger compact now, because otherwise there is so much distrust and gap between the state and the citizen, and that's what you were highlighting in the in the last session. And I think that is needed. externally. Um, we must monitor evolving geopolitics of the world. Major power competition between China and the U.S. is intensifying. And uh, Pakistan must not fall into the vortex of uh, another great power rivalry and clash, uh, nor should we box ourselves into any one camp. We should keep our options open. And I, I noticed that in your recommendations that also had come out uh, that we should take positions that advance our national, national interests. So once again, I congratulate IRS, your entire team. They worked too, worked too hard for two days and uh, and put up a very good program to mark 75 years of Pakistan's existence. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Hizaz Chaudhary, uh, participants, IRS research team and the support staff. It's been two remarkable days. And I think we have covered a lot of ground uh, on 75 years of Pakistan. We are a country which has many challenges, but at the same time, it has overcome a lot of these challenges. So what needs to be done for the future? We need to look on the last 75 years and learn from our mistakes. We need to analyze. We need to educate ourselves. We need to do the proper research because in all of it, you will find the path for the future. My generation, my seniors did what they could for the country. Now the country is yours. We will be handing over the mantle to you people, the youth of this country. And what Ambassador Azar said, it's great to have a youth population, but it needs to be educated. 
not only education of becoming doctors, engineers, civil servants, but we need vocational training. We need to train our farmers. We need to instill in the youth social values. We need moderation. We need toleration, tolerance. We need to respect our elders. We need role models. We need to pay homage and respect to the people who have sacrificed their lives, their families, spilled their blood for the motherland, which is Pakistan. Pakistan is us, Pakistan is you. It's with you now, you have, you have to look after it, you have to take it where it belongs. It has to be the pinnacle of success. Thank you very much. Thank you.